ABC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. October the 19th, 1965. In the Australian outback, many miles from the nearest town, stands the rocket ship that is about to carry Jet Morgan and his crew to the moon. Beside Jet, the captain, there are Stephen Mitchell, engineer, Lemmy Barnett, radio operator, and Doc Matthews. That's me. Already the scaffolding has been removed, and the ground crew have taken cover from the shattering rocket blast that is soon to send the moon ship on its way. Within the ship, outwardly calm and strapped to our couches, the four of us who are to make this momentous journey are anxiously waiting for our captain to launch us out into space. Zero minus 45 seconds. Hello, control. Stand by for firing. Standing by and good luck, Luna. Switch on recorder. Recorder on. Doc, gyros. Gyros. Okay, Mitch. Okay, Jet. Doc. Okay. Lemmy. Okay, I think. Stand by for count off. Don't anybody try to move. Don't even try to raise your head. Lemmy, lie down. Oh, I'm only getting count. Lie flat and stay flat. Oh. Firing in fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, contact! Jet, Jet, what's wrong? She's shaking like a leaf. Quiet, let me take your breath. She's shaking herself to pieces. I'm 6.8 miles, velocity 3,7. Oh, oh, what's happening? Jet, I, I can't move. Zero plus 20, height 12.1 miles, velocity. Oh, 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 I can't stand it. Hang on, Lemmy. It won't last long. Oh, oh, why did I ever come? Zero plus 30. Height 27.2. Velocity 11,000 miles per hour. The booster's paid out. Oh. oh. Stand by to jettison booster. Oh, I wouldn't go through that again for all the rice in China. You'll be going through it again in just a few moments. Oh, no. I'll, I'll be pushed right through this couch and out the other side. You all set, Mitch? Yes, Jet. Doc? Ready. Okay, Doc. Booster. Jettison switch. Stand by. Jettison switch. Contact. Now. Hello, Control. Booster stage jettisoned. Standing by to cut in atomic motor. Waiting for your signal. Over. Hello, Control. Booster now jettisoned. Waiting for your signal. Over. Hello, Control. Hello. What's up, Jet? They don't answer. Hello, Control. Hello. Lemme, any idea what's wrong? Well, according to the indicator, she's still working. But if you ask me, the shot when you blew the booster off, it must have smashed every valve in the ship. Radar's still working, Jet. Hello, Control. Hello. We can't wait much longer, Jet. We're losing momentum every second. We won't make it. I'll give them one more try. If they don't answer, we'll have to use our own judgment. Hello, Control. Hello. Hello. Let me switch yeah. on the televiewer, stern view. Televiewer, stern view, on. Stand by to cutting the motor, Mitch. We'll give her full power. Don't overdo it, Jet. We can't afford the fuel. Now watch the tank gauges. We'll cut out as soon as number one tank is empty. Are you ready? Ready. Then stand by. Everybody batten down. Okay, Jet. Atomic motor. Fire. Lie flat. This is going to be unpleasant. Very unpleasant. Oh. Yes. No! Uh, uh, 
can't. My arm. Oh, shit. I'll switch her up. Switch her up for Pete's sake. I'm trying. I... Oh. 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 Is, is it over? Yes, Doc. Oh. For the time being, anyway. You all right? Oh. Yeah, I think so. Oh, boy. We must have hit 15 Gs at least. Mitch? Okay, I think. I. Oh. What's up, Mitch? Oh, I don't know. I, I feel like death. Yeah, lie still. Yeah, don't move. Lemme? Okay, Jet. I'll think so anyway. We'd all better lie still for a few minutes. Well, let's hope we've hit the right speed. We certainly won't be under. You didn't switch off soon enough, and we used up a little of the reserve fuel. You think we might be going too fast, then? Well, maybe, but there's nothing we can do about it yet. Oh, I'm sorry, but the acceleration was so great, I thought I'd never press the switch. We must get through to control. Uh, Lemmy, if you feel yep. fit enough, get up and get to work on that radio. Yes, Jet. Oh, soon as you like. I'll get going. Oh! Oh! Here! Yeah. Oh, 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 oh! Lemmy! Oh. He's yeah. drifting up to the ceiling. Jet! Yeah. Get, get me down! Help! Serves you right for getting off your bed without your boots on. Well, all I did was bend down to pick them up, and I, I shot straight up here. You should have held onto your couch. Can't you throw them up to me? Pull yourself down by the rail, Lemmy. Oh, 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 just to move makes me feel worse. I, I feel just like a feather. Well, you certainly don't weigh anymore. Yeah, is it going to be like this all the way to the moon? I'm afraid so, but you'll get used to it. Now, pull yourself down. It's slowly... Like this? Yeah, that's it. Now put your magnetized boots on, Lenny. Yeah. In fact, I think we'd all better put them on. Okay, Jim. Okay, and them keep on. them on. Keep them on at all times while zero gravity conditions last. What, you, you mean we even wear them when we sleep? <laughs> no, you can take them off then, but keep a good hold in your bunk while you do it or you'll go drifting up to the roof again. Uh, <coughs> well, that's mine fixed. Yeah. Well, there's no trouble standing. What's it like to walk, Doc? Oh. Okay. Feel a bit, um, light-headed. Try walking up the wall. Hey, Yes, go on. Donk should be easy. <laughs> hey, hey, how's that? <laughs> if you could do that down on Earth, you'd earn a fortune in a circus. <laughs> well, come on. Come on, try it. Come on, Lemmy. We'll have a walk on the wall. Don't hang up there like that. I feel bad enough as it is. Hey, what about that radio? Yes, cut out the fun and games. Try and get that radio working. How are you feeling, Mitch? Not so good. The radar's still working. Well, that's something. At least we'll be able to calculate our height above Earth. Yes, but we can't depend on the radar, not for the whole trip. Well, we can depend on it for a few hours, yes. Well, for height, yes, but what about course? No, don't you worry, Mitch. Let me all get that radio going. You can bet on it. I hope so. going. Twenty hours he's been at it and not a peep out of the darn radio. Oh, take it easy, Mitch. He's doing his best. He's been working all this time with no sleep. We should never have brought him. He's psychologically unsuitable. That's a matter of opinion, but now he's here, the least we can do is let him get on with it. But why does he have to take so darn long? Doesn't he know every second is carrying us further and further away from the Earth, possibly to our deaths? Oh, it's not that bad, Mitch. We can figure our approximate speed and position if it comes to it. We'll give Lemmy a couple of hours more. Yeah, what if he still hasn't got through to control? Well, we'll wait until our velocity has dropped to minimum and then turn the ship over and go back. Go back? Go back? This ship's not turning back. It set out to land on the moon and it's going to do it. But if our speed is too high, we'll use up too much fuel during landing. We'll be on the moon, all right, but uh, how do we get off again? We've got to take a chance. Oh, no, not that kind of chance. I'm not taking any unnecessary risks with the lives of this crew. If the radio isn't working within 48 hours, we're turning back. We're not turning back. Am I the captain of the ship or are you? Sure you are. As long as you carry out the job I hired you for. This ship is mine. I designed her. I built her and she's going to the moon. One more word out of you, Mitch, and I'll put you under arrest. <laughs> oh, that's funny, that is. Go on, try it. Try it. Just try and lay a hand on all me. All right, all right, Mitch, Jet. Break it up. Come on, you're carrying on like a couple of screws. You stay kids. out of this, Doc. If I want your advice, I'll ask for now, it. Now, look, Jet. It seems we have a case of mutiny on our hands. Mutiny? Well, what else is it? Now, wait a minute, Jet. I didn't... All right. All right. We'll forget it. But if I decide to go back, we go back. Is that clear? How are you doing, Lemmy? Well, I'm... Uh... I'm putting it all together again now mm -hmm. and, and hoping. 
Can I be of any help? Oh, yes, Doc. He can pass us a few things as I ask for them. But be careful. One touch and they go shooting all over the place. <laughs> Talk about light and airy like a fairy. <laughs> okay, I'll be careful. Then uh, hand us that for a start. Yeah. So. Here, uh, how's the mutiny going? Well, they seem to have forgotten it for the moment. And they're trying to work out our position. You think they'll do it? Hmm, I guess so. But it'll take a long time. Yeah, our real hope is you, Lemmy. Yeah. You and that radio. What made Mitch flare up like that? I don't know. Maybe the thought that he wouldn't get to the moon at all. Or maybe the cramped conditions and lack of gravity had something to do with it. There must be some reason why two men perfectly stable on Earth should jump at each other's throat less than 24 hours after leaving it. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not jumping at anybody's throat. Neither are you. Uh, not yet you're not, but watch it. Do you think we should turn back, Doc? Yes, unless you can get that radio working. However much figuring we do up here, Lemmy, we may overlook something. We can't be sure our deductions are correct. Oh, I think so, too. Jet was right. Mitch ought to have known better. No, well, maybe. That still doesn't excuse Jet for losing his temper. No. Can they hear what we're saying? Mm, if they were listening, they might. Uh, now, we'll try again. What do you think the chances are, Lemmy? I don't know. Three times I've put this thing together. And each time she should have worked. Mm. And three times I've had to pull it to pieces again. Even the emergency cutting circuits don't work. I can't understand it. Makes me feel like I'm letting the ship down. Oh, don't go getting to feel that way, Lemmy. Uh, well, now, that's it. For the fourth time. Now, let's see if we get any current through her. Yes, it's there. Yes, we've made it. No, no, wait. Don't let's get too excited. We're not through to home yet. Oh, then give them a call, for goodness sake. Try to raise them, Lemmy. Hello, Control. Rocket ship Luna calling Control. If you love me and can hear me, let's hear from you. Over. Well, not a peep. They should be receiving us. There's bags of aerial current. Oodles of it. They could hear us on Mars with this equipment. Hey, listen. What's that? I don't know. Gives you the creeps, doesn't it? Haven't you any idea what it is? It sounds like music, but like music I've never heard before. Hey, can I hear a, a, a voice there? I don't know. I can't make it out. Uh, Jet, Mitch, come over here. Listen to this. Got the radio working? Well, kind of. Have you contacted Control? We tried to, but whether this is them or not, I, I don't know. Well, if it's not Control, then what is it? Search me. Are you sure she's on the right frequency, Lemmy? Yes, so far as I can tell. There's no reason why she should drift off. Not with them crystal stabilizers in there. Yeah, it's gone. Packed in again. Ah, uh, try once more, Lemmy. Call them again. Hello, Earth. Hello, Control. Rocket ship Luna calling. Trying to contact you. Can you hear us? Come in, please. Hello, Luna. Can hear you. Strength 4.5. Hey, it's them. It's them. We made it. Hello. Uh, hello, hello. This is Morgan. Can you still hear me? Hearing you loud and clear. Oh, thank goodness. We've been with you ever since the takeoff. I should think every amateur radio station on Earth has been listening to you. I? You mean you've been hearing us all the time? Except when Lemmy took the radio to pieces. Oh, thank goodness for that. Must be something wrong with your receiving circuit. Well, it beats me. I couldn't find nothing wrong. Nothing. Well, you certainly seem okay now. We can give you all the information you require. Want to take it? Try and stop us. Then here it comes. The time is now three hours, 11 minutes and 54 seconds, universal time. Time from takeoff is zero plus 27 hours, 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Your distance from Earth is 142,000 miles. Your speed is 4,200 miles per hour. Your position is as follows. Well, that's more like it. Now we know where we are and what we're doing. There's no question of turning back now. According to control, we're on course and our speed is very nearly correct. We should reach the neutral gravitational point between Earth and Moon three Earth days from now. The Moon will then be only 23,600 miles away. Our speed will be only a few miles an hour, but enough to overcome the pull of the Earth entirely. From then on, we'll be falling towards the Moon's surface.
If we were back on Earth, we'd drink to this. <laughs> Cold tea is all we have. <laughs> and how about a cigarette, Doc? Do you think the oxygen supply could stand it? Yes, I think it might. Shall I get them, Jen? Yes, Doc, one each. And after that, we'll organize the watches. Four hours apiece. Now, I'll take first watch. The rest of you can get some sleep. You'll need it. We all need it. The toughest part of this trip is yet to come. Doc? Yeah, Lemmy? Push us up a banana, will you? <laughs> Lemmy, must you always eat your meals upside down on the ceiling? <laughs> what difference does it make? Food goes down, or should I say up just the same? Well, it looks undignified. It's a great idea for part this. Think of the room it saves. Anything more to eat, Lemmy? No, thanks, sir. Okay, then push your empties down. I'll store them away. Here, how about a little after-dinner music? <laughs> oh, no, Lemmy, not that. Well, we've got to do something to pass the time. Why did I ever suggest that each member of the crew should be allowed to bring one small personal object with him? Well, I'm glad you did, Jet. Aren't you? Well, yes, but mouth organs should have been banned. Why couldn't he have brought a, a book or something? Every man to his taste. What was that? A meteor hit the ship. Emergency stations. Limey, emergency. An animal upside down on the ceiling. Let me get the spacesuits. Don't panic, Jet. I'm on the way. Air pressure constant. We don't seem to be losing any. The meteor bumper must have worked. Now that we'll find out. Meanwhile, get your spacesuits on just in case. Ah, here you are. Red for Doc. Yep. Blue for Jet. Yellow for Mitchin. Oh, I would be green. Now get into them. Don't fix your helmets yet, but carry them with you all the time. Air pressure still constant. I don't think the cabin could have been damaged. Oh, that's a relief. And what about the fuel tanks and the motor? I'll be checking up in just a minute. Right, that's me, Seth. Now get to the radio, Lemmy. Report this to control immediately. Yeah. Now, everybody else, check your indicator readings. See what damage there is. And somebody turn off that buzzer, will you? Well, Doc? Yeah, air supply okay, oxygen supply okay. Fuel tanks and motor seem to be intact. No damage there as far as I can see. Hello, control. Luna calling. Hello, Luna. A meteor just hit us. Emergency procedures now hit us take... somewhere. Yeah, but Stand we seem to be all right, Jim. Look, Doc, we've by. just been hit by a meteor. It must have done something to us. But what? Well, how should I know? Somebody will have to go out there and look. What? What, out there? O outside the ship? Into, into nothing? I'll go. No, Mitch. This is my job. Besides, right. you're more important to the crew than me. I'll go. What, you... You, you mean there's a uh, chance that... It'll uh... be the first time any man has ever been out there in space, and I designed the suit he'll wear. Well, you tested it, didn't you? As far as was possible on Earth, yes. But this is different. This is the real thing. Look, let's not start another argument. We'll draw for it. Well, fair enough. All agreed? Agreed. All right. uh, let me get one of the navigational tables. Yeah. Open it up, place it face down on the control table with your eyes shut. Right. Okay, here it goes. Uh, we'll guess the page number. Whoever gets nearest goes outside, okay? Uh, Mitch? 136. Doc? Uh, 127. Lemmy? 149. And I'll take, um, 155. Uh, what is it, Lemmy? 153. Then it's me. Stand by to open the airlock. Airlock. Contact. Full pressure. Open the hatch. Right. I'm going down. Fastening helmet. Over to intercom. Helmet fastened. Okay. I'm ready. Close the hatch and exhaust the airlock. Suit now inflating. Air pressure, zero. And open the main door, Doc. I'm going out. Good heavens. What is it, Jet? It's more beautiful than I ever dreamed. What, the door? No, no, the stars. Millions of them. Literally millions. Now, leaving door and walking upside of ship... I'll make a complete circuit. Uh, how's the suit, Jet? Okay? Fine. How are the boots? Perfect. And now hitching the safety lines. And 
walking towards nose. Any sign of where the meteor hit us? Not yet. Here, ask him if he can see the moon. One thing at a time, Lemmy. Finding where that meteor landed is more important. I found it. About 13 feet from the nose. Much damage, Jet? No, nothing to worry about. Must have been minute. Only a small area of the bumper has vaporized. Let's thank our lucky stars it wasn't a larger one. You must come out here, all of you. Come on. This is a sight you've got to see. We can't all go. Somebody must stay. Uh, look, I'll stay, Mitch. You and Lemmy go. You sure, Doc? Yeah, yeah. Um, by way of compensation, you can let me be the first to step on the moon. It's a deal, Doc. Now, if you wouldn't mind opening the airlock again, Lemmy and I will get started. What a sight. Did you ever see so many stars? So many different colors. Yeah, and they don't twinkle like they do on Earth. There's no atmosphere to make them twinkle. So small they look, and bright. Jet, how fast are we going? Uh, about uh, 2,000 miles an hour. But we don't seem to be moving. Oh, look at the moon, Lemmy. Even from here, you can begin to see the mountains and craters on her. How far off is she now? Uh, about 100,000 miles. Oh, no distance at all. Cut the bus ride. Hey. Here. Here, Jet. We must be off course. Off course? How do you mean? Well, the moon's not in front of us. It... It's to one side. She'll be there when we are. She's moving towards our rendezvous all the time. Hey, Jet, have you taken a look at the Earth yet? Huh? You can make out the African continent quite easily. And the southern ice cap, the, the reflection is brilliant. Did you ever see anything like it? Oh, Mitch, if we never get to the moon, the trip was worth it just for this. Jet, I'm going for a walk down under. See how things look from there. Now, be sure your safety line is secure. We don't want you drifting off. Don't worry, Jet boy. If only Becky could see me now. She wouldn't know if I was on my head or my heels. No more than I do. Oh, yeah, what's that? It's the funny music again. Hello. Hello. Jet. 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 Jet, can you hear me? Jet. Hello, Lemmy. Oh, Lemmy, what's wrong? Jet, that music. Didn't you hear it? Music? What music? Oh, you must have heard it. It was like it was right inside me. Well, let me pull yourself together. I heard no music. All I heard was you screaming. But I was calling you before that. Didn't you hear me? No. Jet, look, let's get back into the ship. I heard it, I'll tell you. I heard it. Uh, calm down, Lemmy. Stay where you are. Now, don't attempt to re-enter the ship until I'm alongside you. I heard it, I'll tell you. The same kind of music we heard when I, when I got the radio working. Only this time, it was much louder. Like it was right inside me helmet. Oh, it was uncanny. It scared the living daylights out of me. It scares me now just to think of it. Lemmy, if there had been any music, it must have been coming through your radio, and we'd have heard it too. But there was, I'll tell you. I was calling you when it first came on, but you didn't hear me till it stopped. Lemmy, lie on your bunk. Get some sleep. Well, I don't need sleep. Yeah, you don't believe me, do you? None of you believe me. Now, come and lie down. You believe me, don't you, Doc? You heard that music coming over the radio, didn't you? I wasn't out there, Lemmy. I was here in the ship. What's happening to him, Mitch? What do you think's happening to him? I told you. He's unstable. A psychological misfit. You have been listening to episode one of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by John Casabon. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna.
Jet Morgan, Steve Mitchell, Doc Matthews, and Lemmy Barnett are on their way to the moon. Shortly after takeoff, they lost contact with Earth and didn't regain it for 27 hours. Then, nearly two days later, a small meteor struck the ship and Jet Morgan, after putting on his spacesuit, went out through the airlock to inspect the damage. Fortunately, it was slight, but Jet was so awed by the sight of the universe around him that he asked Mitch and Lemmy to join him. Lemmy, impressed by the novelty of being able to walk right round the ship's exterior, wandered to the other side and out of sight of his companions. And then, strange sounds were heard over his radio. Immediately, Lemmy began to call to Jet and Mitch, but they didn't hear him. Then, as something like near panic took hold of Lemmy... Jet! Jet! The sound stopped, and Jet heard him. The three men then returned to the ship's cabin. What's happening to him, Mitch? What do you think's happening to him? I told you, he's unstable. A psychological misfit. Oh, you're not going to bring that up again. If Lemmy says he heard a strange noise, he heard it. Then why didn't I hear it? Why didn't you or Doc? Doc wasn't outside. How could he? Well, he was listening to us, wasn't he, on the ship's receiver? That and our personal radios all work on identical frequencies. If there'd been anything to hear, at least one of us would have heard it. He must have imagined it. And be careful what you're implying, Mitch. What other explanation is there? Anything could happen out here, anything. Radios could play tricks. The ships, Lemmy's, anybody's. Maybe there's some kind of radio wave we know nothing about that can only be heard out here in space. Ah, piffle. All right, now break it up, you two. Lemmy's upset enough without you discussing him like he was a mental case. Trouble with this ship is room's so limited you can hardly keep your thoughts to yourself. Next time I'll build separate cabins. Tourists, second and first class. No need to be flippant, Mitch. What do you think about this, Doc? I don't know what to think. At first, I was inclined to agree with Mitch. Say, Lemmy's imagining things. And who could blame a man for that out here? But <laughs> Lemmy's not that type. Besides, he says the sound was the same as we all heard just before we contacted base, remember? Atmospherics. <laughs> what, on this equipment? It wasn't atmospherics, Mitch. That radio picked up something, no doubt about that. You it... mean it might have been transmitted? It could have been. You'll be saying it came from the moon next... Well, why not? There's no life on the moon. How do you know? Have you been there? Oh, for heaven's sake, Jet, what's got into you? Any elementary textbook on astronomy will prove there's no life on the moon. Will it also tell you what lies on the other side of the moon? Well, of course not. No man has ever seen it. <laughs> but how can it be any different from this side? It must be much the same. But you can't prove it, Mitch. And you can't explain the behavior of the radio. Being out of action for so long, then picking up those weird sounds just before control came through. Are you two trying to say that there's life... Civilizations, maybe, on other planets? We're not saying there is or there isn't. But you can't rule out the possibility. I can. I'll believe it when and if I see it. Until then, I'll be guided by the known facts that life on any planet other than Earth is most unlikely. Why should the Earth be singled out? Why should such a, an infinitesimally small part of the universe be unique? For the same reason that you are unique. Yeah. You, everything about you, is a lucky combination of circumstances. No, I can't agree. Whether you agree or not is beside the point. But the question in hand at the moment is Lemmy. Oh, I can hear you. Well, for a start, we'll have to make a rule that he doesn't go outside the ship again. Well, there'll be no need for anyone to go outside again. The chances of another meteor hitting us are a million to one against. I don't mean while we're still coasting. I mean from now on, even after we've touched down on the moon. You, you mean you'd let him go all that way and then deny him the right even to step outside? Yes. Unless I can be 100% sure we won't get a repeat performance of what happened half an hour ago. I won't do it to him. Neither will I. But I tell you, Lemmy's unstable. I can still hear you. Look, Mitch, you're being unreasonable. More than unreasonable. I just want to be sure that nothing wrecks this project. That's more important to you than anything. Or anyone, isn't it? You're darn right it is. Sorry, Mitch, but Lemmy carries on as was arranged. What happened outside is going to make no difference. All right. I consider myself overruled. If I listen to you two much longer, I'll think you've all gone crazy. 22nd October, 1965. It is now three Earth days, seven hours, and six minutes since takeoff. The ship has now settled down to a regular routine. Lemmy seems to have fully recovered from whatever it was that scared him outside the ship, and now nobody even mentions it, though it's obviously preying on the minds of us all. Radio contact with Earth is clear and suffers from no interruption. There isn't much to do now. Every man takes his watch. Lemmy plays his mouth organ. Mitch studies his tables. Jet reads his book, and I keep this diary. Our speed is now very slow, not more than 50 miles an hour, and dropping every second. Soon the most exciting, the most dangerous part of our journey will be on us. Uh, 
Uh, Lemmy. Yes, Tep? Stop that racket and listen, will you? Yes, Tep. Uh, everybody listen. We've now passed neutral gravitational point. The Earth no longer affects us. The moon has taken over and is pulling us down towards its surface. It's only 23,000 miles away now, and yeah. the time has come to turn the ship over. Uh, switch on the stern televiewer, Lemmy. Televiewer. Stern view. On. Stand by. Okay, Mitch. Okay, Jet. Doc? Yeah, okay. Lemmy? Okay. Number one, gyro. Number one, contact. Watch the screen, Lemmy. Nothing happening yet. Oh, oh yes, now it is. One degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Any sign yet, Lemmy? Not yet. Oh, yes, yes, it comes. Limb of the moon, now visible. Getting bigger. Blimey, the mountains and craters are as clear as anything. Well, never mind that, keep your mind on the job. Plus one, 1. 1.5. Stand by, Doc. Two, yeah, whenever you like. 2.5, plus 3, 3.5, plus 4. Number one, gyros, 3. 5, cut. 5, plus 5, 5.5, plus 6. We're going to turn too far. 5. Stand by for counteraction. Plus 7. Number two, gyro. 5. Ready. Plus 8, 8.5. Plus nine, 9.5, plus ten. Number two, contact. 10.5, plus 11. Stabilizer, 11. stand by. Standing by. Stabilizer, now. 10.5, ten. Dead on. Number two, gyro, cut. Steady she goes. Okay, that's it. Now leave the stabilizer on for a while, let's be sure. Still steady, on course. Cut it, now, Doc. We're okay. Well, that's that. Easier than I thought. Let me call up base. Tell them the ship has been turned over and that we're now falling towards the moon. What? How far now, Jet? A thousand miles. Getting close? Yes, very close. Now, it's about time we began preparing for landing. Everybody onto your couches and strap yourselves yeah, in. Sure yeah. thing, Jet. Let's hope we don't hit her too hard. Yep, safety straps fastened. Me too. Safety straps okay. Then position your control panels. Number one panel in position. Number two. Number three. Four, okay. Mitch, stabilizer. Stabilizer, ready. Contact. Lemmy, course. Spot on. Dock height. 930 miles. Shock absorbers ready? Yes, Jet. Let's hope they stand the concussion. They will. Contact. 910 miles. Still some way to fall yet. Now, let's all relax. Gravity conditions will return as soon as the motor is cut in. Now, don't let the shock take you by surprise. 900. Blimey, and it check it. We could have landed on that lot. No, Lemmy, they're the mountains that surround the bay. Where we're landing is much smoother. Uh, better be. Height, 895. Landing area, still spot on. 890. Nearly there. Here, what's that? What's what? Quiet, Lemmy. 880. But, uh, how can... How what can is hear? it, Lemmy? 875. Nothing. Get, uh, it's the excitement. Lemmy, what's wrong? Uh, nothing. Nothing, I'll tell you. Take that note. 870. Stand by. I'm going to cut in the motor. Landing area spot on. Lemmy, pull yourself together. 865. 860. 855. 850. Contact. <laughs> Lemmy, watch the screen for heaven's sake. 845. Landing area. Okay. 840. 835. 830. 825. 820. 2.5. 2.25. Height, two miles. We're nearly there. Here she comes. This is it. Hold tight. Cut the motor. Gentlemen, we're on the moon. Didn't you hear what Jet said? 
We've just landed on the moon. Doc, Lemmy. Oh, I heard him. Yeah, so did I. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Well, the way you're carrying on, he might have just announced your death sentence. Maybe he has. What's up, Doc? And Lemmy, what's worrying you? Nothing. Now out with it, Lemmy. You didn't hear that music again, did you? Leave me alone. Would you keep getting at me all the time? You did hear it, or at least you think you did. Am I right? Am I? Leave him alone, Mitch. In a minute, you'll be saying you heard that darn music, too. I'm not so sure that I didn't. What? You, Doc? I can't explain it, but just before the motor was switched on, I began to feel very strange. A, a sense of foreboding. With landing only a few minutes away, how else would you feel? No, it wasn't that. I didn't exactly hear anything, but... Now you're both beginning to imagine things. Mitch, it was not imagination. Well, look, let's forget it for now. We've got work to do and little time in which to do it. Now, get up and we'll start. Right, yes, well, of course. Right. Yeah. we put our magnetized boots on? Uh, no, Lemmy, we won't need those till we return. Now, uh, switch on the main televiewer and we'll see what it looks like outside. Televiewer on? Can't see a thing. Rotate the camera, full circle. Camera rotating. Well, still nothing. If anything, that screen's getting darker. No sign of a picture. The camera's pointing towards the night side of the moon. The sun's hardly rising yet. We, we can't expect anything on the screen. Not even the stars? Oh, we, we should see those, I must admit. Let's wait a bit. Wait till she's turned 180 degrees and begins to pick up the day side. Now here she comes. We're getting brighter. But still no picture. It, it's like the lens is fogged over. <laughs> what are we worrying about? It's dust. What? Dust? Oh, of course! The moon surface is covered with it. Volcanic ash, meteoric dust. The blast from our motor when we landed must have caused a regular dust storm. <laughs> we came down right in the middle of it. We won't see a thing. Let's settle again. <laughs> oh, you, you know, for a minute it had me scared. I, I thought the televiewer had packed in like the radio did. Me too. Well, while we're waiting, we'll get ready to go outside. Yeah. And sure. not, not you, Lemmy. Hey? Somebody has to stay behind. Oh. We can't all go outside at once. Oh, for a minute, I thought... Oh, you'd... don't worry. Next time out, somebody else will take a turn of staying behind. Well, that's fair enough. Now, call up control. Yes, Jet. Mitch, Doc, get your suits on. Yeah, sure, Kitty. Right. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling control. Come in, please. Hello, Luna. Earth calling. Go ahead. Stand by. I've got him, Jet. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is Jet Morgan. You can tell the world that rocket ship Luna has landed. She touched down in the Bay of Rainbows less than five minutes ago. Oh, I mean, now be careful what you say, Jet. The whole world is listening. How was the landing? Fine. Came off beautifully. We hit the target area right smack in the middle. Was the trip a comfortable one? A bit cramped, but otherwise very comfortable. It's almost time for us to go outside. I'll arrange for our personal radios to be fed into the ship's transmitter so you'll be able to hear us talking. And now, if you'll excuse me... Oh, 
pole four times the size that the moon looks from the Earth. And like the moon, the Earth is passing through a phase. Less than half of it's illuminated. Can you make out the seas and the continents? Africa and Europe are facing us now. Most of northwest Europe appears to be covered in cloud. But the British Isles seems to be enjoying a spell of good weather. We can just make out the outline. The colors on the... Congratulations, Captain Morgan, to you and your crew on your wonderful achievement. Thank you. Hearing you talk to us and seeing the part of the world where you are situated looking so minute gives us a, a, a dreadful feeling of isolation, of utter loneliness. Then there is absolutely no life on the moon? Not that we've found as yet. How is London? You'd hardly recognize it. Traffic is virtually at a standstill. I never thought we'd stop the roar of London's traffic, not from a quarter of a million miles distance. Well, you have, Jet. The whole United Kingdom is with you up there. The telephone lines are jammed with callers trying to book seats for the next trip. What are the chances of that, Jet? How long before there'll be a regular passenger service to the moon? Well, Mitch is more qualified to answer that question than me. What do you think, Mitch? Oh, not for a long time. We'd have to make the moon habitable first, and it's anything but that right now. Is that the ultimate aim of this trip? To make the moon habitable for human beings? Well, in so much as a spaceway station on the moon will help us reach the other planets, yes. But it will be no more than a stepping-off point to Mars or Venus. Colonization of the moon will be the task of our children or, or our grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I hope anybody else who was thinking of telephoning us took that in. Well, before you leave us, would you mind telling us exactly what your work on the moon will entail? We'll be taking lots of photographs of the Earth, the sun, the sky, and the moon's surface. We'll also explore as much as possible of the terrain, at least to the limit of our visible horizon, which is about two miles. Even that is probably more than we can manage in one day. One day? Is that all the time you'll be spending up there? One lunar day. And that's equivalent to two weeks back home. We plan to return to Earth just before lunar nightfall. I see. Well, we have lots of messages here for you from all over the world. Can you take them? I'll take them, Jet, while I'm sitting in here. Might be one from Becky. All right, let me go ahead. Disconnect us from the main transmitter, but keep the intercom open. Intercom, over. Test, please. Hello, one, two, three, four... Okay. And if you see any dragons, give a yell. I'll hear you. I won't be able to help you, but I'll hear you. Hello, Earth. Ready to take your messages. Over. It is now three Earth days since we landed on the moon. Everything is going well. At the moment, Jet, Mitch, and Lemmy are digging out specimens of lunar soil to take back home with us. Up to now, we have found no evidence whatsoever that there is, or ever has been, any kind of life on the moon. It is a completely dead world. Time you went back, Mitch, and let Doc come out. Okay, Jet. Lemmy and I will wait here. When he gets out, we'll continue towards the little crater a couple of hundred yards ahead. Right. Periodically, the voices of Mitch, Lemmy, and Jet come over the intercom as they talk to each other through their personal radios. Every word they say is recorded, for the construction of the spacesuits does not permit the wearers to write their observations. Lemmy is in high spirits. A few hours ago, he discovered that the low gravitational pull on this dead world allows him to jump fantastic heights. He cleared over now. Thanks, Doc. Hatch opening. Oh, thank goodness for a breath of cool air. Anything to report? No. Nope. What have you been doing with yourself? Oh, keeping up my diary. Maybe you should put your mind on modifying these space suits. Huh? Find some way of getting rid of the moisture. I'm ankle deep in perspiration. <laughs> Nothing much I can do about it now, Mitch. It'll have to wait till we get back home. Well, get down into the torture chamber and I'll let you out. Yeah, okay. Jet and Lemmy are waiting for you 200 yards north of the crater. Here comes the dock now, Jet. Hello, Doc. Ready for another digging session? Oh, is that what it's going to be? We'll take a few photographs of the crater first. Uh -huh. And then if we can, climb down into it and see what the floor's made of. Right. Uh, Doc, can you manage the surveying tackle? Oh, I can up here. Back on Earth, it would take three men my size just to lift it. Well, let's get going. We'll spend a couple of hours there and then go back to the ship for a meal. Uh, hey! Hey, listen! Wait a minute! What is it, Lemmy? The music! It's here again! Get steady, Lemmy! Good gracious! What is it, Jet? I don't know. S stand still, listen! You can hear it? I'm not sure. It... 
I, I can't exactly hear it. it. It was like, well, I don't know how to explain it. Wasn't exactly like last time. Not so loud, but just as creepy. It scares me stiff. Did you hear it, Doc? Yes, Lemmy, I did, and it... Jet, the crater. Look oh, quick. What is it, Doc? Something moved in there, I swear it did. Something moved? Yes. Oh, impossible. I only caught a glimpse of it, but it was there, I tell you. You wait here. I'll go and look. No, Jet. Jet. There is nothing on the moon that can move of its own free will. Then why can't we all go? No, Lemmy. You and Doc wait here. If it's all right, I'll tell you. Then you can come on. Hello. Hello. What's the trouble? I wish we knew, Mitch. We heard that noise again. Not just Lemmy this time. All three of us. Did you hear it? Are you sure you did? Of course I'm sure. And on top of that, I saw something move in the crater. Ridiculous. I tell you, I saw it. Jet's hey, hey, gone. Hey, with Doc. You. What? Where's Jet? What? Not a second ago, he was standing on that crater's rim. Now he's not. He must have fallen in. Hello, what? Jet. Jet, Doc calling. Can you hear me? Jet. Here. He doesn't answer. Let's get over there. He must have hurt himself. Quick. If he's punctured his suit, he's as good as done for. Now, can you see him, Lemmy? He must be lying somewhere on the crater floor. No, Doc. There's no sign of him. The crater's empty. <laughs> You have been listening to episode two of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by John Casabon and Alan Keith. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. After a thrilling trip lasting nearly five days, Jet Morgan and his crew in the rocket ship Luna touched down on the surface of the moon. After contacting the Earth and receiving messages of congratulations from all parts of the terrestrial globe, they set about their tasks of taking photographs, collecting specimens of moon rock and soil, and exploring the area in which they landed. Then, while Jet, Doc and Lemmy were making their way towards their next objective, the strange sounds which they, and particularly Lemmy, had heard on their journey from Earth, were heard again. And then Doc thought he saw something move in the crater ahead of them. Hello? Hello? What's the trouble? We heard that noise again. Not just Lemmy this time, but all three of us. Did you hear it? Are you sure you did? Of course I'm sure. And on top of that, I saw something move in the crater. Ah, uh, ridiculous. I tell you, I saw it. Did you, Doc? We'll see in just a minute. I'm almost at the crater now. If there's anything to see, I shall see it. There. Not a thing. Not... Good Lord. I could swear I've been through all this before. Hey, Doc, huh? I've seen this very crater before. Recognize every detail. Where's Jet? What? If I go down into it, the floor will be soft and powdery like a fresh fall of snow. Not a second ago, he was standing on its rim. Now he is. Every feature is as familiar as my own backyard. He must have fallen in. I have been here before. I've seen it all many years ago. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Duck calling. Can you hear me? He don't answer. Let's get over there. Hello, Jeff. Jeff, hello. He must be in there somewhere. Look for him, let me. Look for him. Look and keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking. And look hard. Concentrate. Observe the mountains that border the bay. Observe the smooth floor of the bay itself. Well, do you see it? Yes, Uncle. The bay is full of craters. Aye, it probably is, but you can't see them. Uh, with a big telescope at Blackford Hill, you might make out some. Wee craters. Lots of wee craters. And, and one is wide and shallow like a dish. What are you talking about, boy? Which one? The one near the ship. 
What ship? A spaceship. I stood on the crater's rim and made my way down into it. What nonsense is this? I was there, on the moon. Young man, when I sit up half the night with you in this observatory, it's to further your education, not for you to utter such drivel. But you know, but your head's full of rubbish. You're reading those stupid books and hearing the radio. Spaceship. Ah. It's not rubbish, Uncle. Lots of people think it is, but it isn't. It's a scientific possibility. Is it a scientific possibility that you might try paying strict attention to what I'm telling you? Yes, Uncle. Space travel. When they can't even get the earthbound trains to run to time. Now, look again. Make a sketch of what you see and only what you see. I want no imaginative drawing, just the plain facts. Yes, sir. Then get on with it, boy. Don't stare at me. Look into the eyepiece. Look. Take a good look. Look hard and long and keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking, Lenny. Keep at it. I am looking, Doc. No sign of him anywhere. Perhaps we'd better go down on, onto the floor. Lemmy, you better come into the ship. Well, four. So I can go out and help Doc look for Jet. That's what for. There's two of us looking already. Lemmy, come in. If you're so keen to come out, come out. I'm not stopping you. You know darn well I can't get out. Somebody has to be inside to work the airlock. Look, Mitch, why not use the televiewer? From up there in the nose, you'll be able to see further than we can. All right, Doc, but televiewers are Lemmy's province. He should be in here working it. All you have to do is to switch it on. Nothing complicated about that. All right, that. calm down, Lemmy. Mitch is just as worried as you are. Oh, I'm sorry, Doc. But something awful must have happened to Jet. Hey, Doc. Yes? Is this a game? There's Jet in the crater, large as life. What? Jet! Jet! What are you doing here? I told you to wait until I called you to come on. Jet, boy! Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. If Doc did see anything in this crater, it's certainly not here now. I... Nearly three hours ago. Three? What are you talking about? Can't be more than five minutes since I left you. Chet, what's happening to you? What's happening to me? What's happening to you? Look, come back to the ship, all of you. We'll try and straighten this out. What is happening? Somebody had better tell me. We better go back. Something very strange is taking hold of us all. Yes, Chet, you'll be safer in there. Well, if you say so. I don't know what all this is about, but maybe when we do get inside, you'll give me some rational explanation. Well, now we're all here. What's up? What's up, he says. Jet, when you left us and walked towards that crater, Mitch called us up. That's right, I heard him. Well, both Lemmy and I instinctively turned towards the ship when we heard Mitch's voice. And when we turned back, you'd gone. Of course, by then I was making my way down to the crater floor. Yeah, that's what we thought. But you'd gone so quickly, we thought you must have fallen in. So we came running over. But when we got there, all we saw were your footprints in the dust. There was no sign of you. Is this a joke? Jet, what time did Doc come out to you? As far as I can remember, about 1,600 hours. And how much time do you think has passed since then? Not more than 10 minutes, I'd say. The time is now 18 hours, 47 minutes. I tell you, picture's clear. Every detail of the surface outside is hard and sharp. Nothing out of the ordinary. Not a thing. No sign of movement anywhere. It's as still as a graveyard. October 30th, 1965. It is now 13 Earth days since takeoff and 8 days since we landed on the moon. Since Jet's strange disappearance, nothing else unexpected has happened. While three of us are working outside, the fourth watches our every move on the televiewer screen. We never wander away from each other, at least not more than a few feet. And Jet has given strict orders that we keep the ship within sight at all times. This has limited the area we can explore and means we stay out of most crater floors entirely. But there's still plenty of work to be done on the elevated surface. Spirits rise as the time for going home draws closer. For although there has been nothing to alarm us for some time, there's a strange feeling of apprehension that we all feel but never mention. All but Lemmy, that is who seems to have forgotten that anything strange has ever happened to him or to any of us. He's in here with me now, while Jet and Mitch are outside making their period... Boom! But no, it it covers nothing. the whole crater. Well, the one Jet got lost in. It's as though a spherical roof had been placed over it. 
You're going crack if this screen's blank. No, it's there. Plain as plain. Surely you can see it. No, Doc, I can't. Call up Jet and Mitch and tell them. Tell them to look towards the crater. Quick. Hello. Hello, Jet. Mitch. Hello. Hello, hello, Jet. Oh, they don't answer. They can't hear us. It's that perishing music. Whenever that's on, nobody can hear a darn thing. Take hold of yourself, Lemmy. Try again. Hello, Jet. Let me call in. Can you hear me, Jet? Hello, Jet. Jet! Oh, it's gone. Yes. The dome is gone. Hello? Hello, Doc. Lemmy. Hello, Jet. You can hear us. What's the idea? We've been calling you for a couple of minutes. Calling us? What's wrong? Were you asleep? No, Jet. We weren't asleep. You saw, with as much detail as you can remember, but okay. only what you remember. Okay. We don't want an imaginative drawing, just the plain facts. Now, while you're doing it, Mitch and I will watch the teleview screen, see if anything else turns up. Come on, Mitch. Hey, Doc, did you switch the televiewer off? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't remember. Well, it is off. I suppose it was on when you saw this, uh, dome. What do you take me for, a practical joker? Turn it on, Mitch. He probably switched it off unconsciously. Well, there's the picture. Hey, what's this? Huh? Oh, it's Doc's diary. What the devil's he putting in it? It's a private diary, Mitch. None of our business. Well, isn't it? Not even this? Huh? Look at it. Read it. My whole enthusiasm and interest in the trip is gone. We should never have come. Man has no right here. No right to carry the secrets of this planet back to Earth. Back to terrestrial beings who can neither understand them nor appreciate them and in consequence will only attempt to destroy them. Rip them to pieces. Tear them apart. As they have already begun to destroy their own planet. Did the doc write that? Well, it's his handwriting, isn't it? Yes, but... We'll tackle him with it later. What does he think he's doing? Does he want to demoralize all of us? I don't know, Mitch. I don't know anything anymore. Now, Doc, have you finished that drawing? Yeah, I finished it some time ago. Here, it's as accurate as my memory will allow me to make it. Hmm. Uh, the dome seemed to be made of some transparent material, and the low circular wall that supports the dome seems to have been erected on the crater's rim. It fits the rim exactly. What did the wall seem to be made of, Doc? Um... Uh, I don't know. Some kind of metal, maybe. Well, it's a curious object, all right, but it doesn't tell us much. Nothing like so much as Doc's diary tells us. What do you mean? This is what I mean. What you wrote here today and then left lying around for all of us to read. What are you trying to do? Demoralize all of us? I don't know what you're talking about. You made it plain enough in here. You want us to know you've lost all enthusiasm for this trip. That we should stay up here. Die up here. Have you gone crazy? No, but maybe you have. What, with domes over craters and, and then this? Let me see it. Well? Hmm? I didn't write this. It's your handwriting, isn't it? Yes, but I... I... Then, then w what did you write? Show me. Go on. What I wrote isn't here. Ah! I merely recorded the normal events of the day. I give you my word, Mitch. I don't want it. Are you saying I'm a liar? Well... If that's how you want to put it, yes, I am. Now, hold on there, Mitch. You hold on yourself. Shut up. What else is he? There's the book. Shut up. Blimey. Nobody's calling anybody anything. We're going to get to the bottom of this calmly and without insulting each other. Now, Doc, did you write this or, or didn't you? Well, if I did, this is the first time I realized it. Then what did you write? I just told you that normal... Doc... Ev were any of the thoughts expressed on that page in your mind while you were writing? Yes, I suppose they were, but they weren't important. Ideas like that must have passed through the minds of all of us. It happens to everybody. You think of things you have no intention of doing, would hate to do, in fact. Like when you're in a car and the sudden fear of a possible accident strikes you, or when you make an air trip. But you don't have the accident. No. Oh. That's what those thoughts were like. But I had no idea I put them down. I would have sworn on my life that I just wrote about the work. How many days we'd been here, the, the date, the time. Nothing like that on this page. There is on yesterday's page, I grant you that. Give him back the book, Mitch. Hey? Give it to him. To go on writing this drivel? I said give it to him. Huh. Thanks, Mitch. And Doc? Yes? 
Whatever anybody else thinks, I believe you. Thanks. You believe him? And why not? The things that have been happening to us since we've landed here, I'd believe anything. You would, eh? Well, I don't. Nothing's happened to me. It's you that's crazy, all of you. Cut it out, Mitch. That's it. You're all going crackers. Oh, but you. You're the only one still in step. We're all crazy, but you. Ah, I get it now. The whole thing's a conspiracy. Something the three of you have cooked up to try and send me crazy. So when I get back to Earth, I'll be considered unfit to make any further trips. Oh, Mitch. Then the field is clear for you. The exploration of space, the, the glory of it is all yours. While I, who designed this ship and built her, kicked my heels back on the deck there, watching you going and coming. <laughs> but you won't do it. Mitch, don't talk I'll such nonsense. I'll see you don't. You can stay here, all of you. Die here, like Doc says. Mitch. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, help me get him onto his bunk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell him you're clear, nothing to report. <laughs> Mitch. You all right? Uh, I... Uh, what happened? I hit you, Mitch. I had to. You, you were raving like a lunatic. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Jet. I, if I do that again, you hit me again. What are we going to do, Jet? Exactly what we came up here to do. But what's the explanation of all this? I don't know. The only thing I can think of is that somebody, something is getting at us. What? Getting at our minds in different ways. Lemmy hears music and it scares him, makes him feel he wants to go back home. You see things, unexplainable things, and write things in your diary you, you don't intend. Mm. And Mitch? Oh, he seems immune to the whole business, except when we talk about it and then look what happens to him. That crater out there seems to be connected in some way. Mm. We'll examine it thoroughly by every means we have. What, all of us? No, Mitch and I will go out. You stay with the televiewer. Okay. Keep us on the screen all the time. Watch every move. And let me will stay by the radio and record every word we say. You agree to that, Mitch? Yes, Jet. Yeah, I can hear it. Quite strong, too. Would it be the dust or the floor underneath? Can't tell. Maybe over to later. Jed and Mitch now on crater floor, approaching each other. Getting stronger. Hey, Mitch. Hear anything? Getting stronger still. Mitch, do you hear anything besides the counter? Coming up fast. Needle's going like mad. Hello, Earth. What was that? Hello, Earth. Spaceship X. Yes. Lemmy, is that you? Hello, spaceship. X-4372, receiving you. Over. What on earth? Hello? Take off satisfactory. Position and velocity as per schedule. Over. Hello? Thank you, Venus. Next call will be at one Earth hour. That is all. Hello, Mitch. Lemmy, Doc, can you hear me? Hello, Jet. What's the trouble? Hello, Jet. Hello. Hello, Doc. Oh, watch where you're going. You're walking at right angles to the correct line. You've gone out of camera range. Uh, sorry, Doc. I, uh, I'll put it right. What's up, Jet? Lost your sense of direction? Yes, Mitch. But not in the way you mean. And then I heard a spaceship that just left Venus call up Earth and give his position. What? That's not likely to happen for years. Fifty, a hundred, maybe two hundred. I heard it. And at the same time, the whole bay seemed to be full of structures. Radio masts, rocket platforms, and vehicles like tanks which were speeding along well-made roads. The bay was full of movement, as though a lunar base was already built and in full working order. It was... Well, it, it was like a, a glimpse into the future. Yes! That was what it must have been. Just as a few hours ago, I must have had a glimpse into the past. Let's go home. We're not going home. None of us has been hurt, not physically. These moments are rare, only just a few seconds. We can't leave the job half done. No, Mitch, we can't. We'll carry on. Whatever it is that's got hold of us, whatever it's trying to do, it won't stop us. 
It won't drive us off, not until we're good and ready to go. Is that agreed? Agreed. Sure, agreed. Lemmy? Agreed. We'll leave that crater alone. From now on, nobody's to go within a hundred yards of it. That clear? It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> well, let's get started. Back to normal routine. Everything aboard, I hope. How about it, Doc? All complete. I don't think we left anything behind. Murder, Mitch? All set. Well, get onto your couches. Strap yourselves in. Oh, boy. Oh, there we go. Well, it wasn't so bad after all, was it? Yeah, Rick, they must have heard us say nothing would stop us. They gave up trying. They, it, or whatever it was. <laughs> I'm beginning to think we must have dreamt the whole business. Yeah. Dome, music, everything. A whole week, undisturbed. And now we're going home to <laughs> dear old Mother Earth from Becky. Switch on the television, Lemmy. Let's take a last look round before we leave. Tell you, Gurum. Goodbye, Moon. Thanks for the use of the bait. Yeah, shadow's creeping up fast. Moon must look almost a crescent to the folks back home. Ah, look. There's the flag we raised the day we landed. Yeah. Looks lonely, doesn't it? Yeah, lonely's right. Especially without the tiniest breath of wind to disturb her. No, she just hangs limp against a pole. Doesn't move. Switch her off, Lemmy. Switch on stern view. Stern view up. All set? All set, set. yeah. Doc, gyro. Gyro. Stand by for count-off. We're going home. <laughs> but we'll be back. Firing in 15 seconds. Piccadilly, here I come. Ten. Nine. Five, four, three, two, one. Contact! Well, press it. Press the switch. I did it. It didn't work. What? Press it again. Still nothing. Not a flicker. But on final check, the motor was okay. There can't be anything wrong. Hey, Jet, the radio's cut. And the radar. Oh, now the televiewer's going. Listen. The gyro. It stopped. Everything stopped. There's not a thing in the ship that works. You've been listening to Episode 3 of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs and Duncan McIntyre. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Morgan and his crew have been on the moon for 13 days. During that time, they've carried on their work of exploring the moon's surface and photographing the heavens. Twice since landing on the moon, strange sounds have been heard, and besides Doc seeing the image of a dome-like structure on the televiewer screen, Jet had the uncanny experience of slipping, as he thought, backwards and forwards in time. But during the last six days of their stay on the Earth satellite, nothing bothered them and it was with light hearts and feelings of relief that the four men climbed into the ship for the last time and prepared to take off for the long journey back to Earth and home. Ten. Five. Four. Three. Two.
two, one. Contact! Well, press it. Press the switch. I, I did it. It didn't work. What? Press it again. Still nothing. Not a flicker. But on final check, the motor was okay. There can't be anything wrong. Hey, Chet, the radio's cut. And the radar. Now the televiewer's going. Listen, the gyro. It stopped. Everything stopped. There's not a thing in the ship that works. Oh, the lights are still on. <laughs> oh, why can't I keep my big mouth shut? What's happened to the emergency lights? They should have come on automatically. Lemmy. Yes, Jim? The flashlight hanging behind you, can yeah. you find it? I think so. Then switch it on. Yes. Hurry, switch it on. Wait a minute, I haven't found it yet. Oh, yes, I've got it now. There. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, yes. To have to lie in the dark as well would be the last straw. Now, what's happened, Mitch? Main power supply must have failed. We can thank our lucky stars. It didn't happen while we were actually taking off. Well, didn't you check the power pack? Well, of course I did. Well, we'd better get down the hole and check it again. Let me get the tool pack out the locker, will you? Yeah. And, Doc, go around to every control and switch it off. Break every circuit and keep it open till we get back. Right. Come on, Mitch. Open up the hatch and let's go down. Well, Jeff? Nothing wrong, so far as we can tell. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. Shall I start switching on again? Nothing wrong, but she doesn't work. Hey? She's as dead as a doornail. Is that right, Mitch? Yes, Doc. Beats me. I, I can't understand it at all. Oh, fault must be somewhere else. Up here in the cabin. Uh, the main distributor board, maybe. Maybe. We'd better look at that next. Uh, while we're about it, you and Lemmy had better start checking the equipment you're responsible for. Okay. Uh, See if you can find any trouble there. Sorry, Jet. Just like it was before. As far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with a radio, radar, or televiewer. The lighting circuit is intact and all. Doc? Uh, same in my department. Air conditioner and automatic oxygen supply are both packed in. Only the pressure indicators are working. They're not on the circuit. If the oxygen supply doesn't work, how do we breathe? Oh, we can regulate it by hand. Well, at least we won't suffocate. No. You checked the main fuses, didn't you, Lemmy? Yes, Jet. All intact. Well, gentlemen... Until we trace the trouble, we're stuck. Stranded. We can't take off. We can't even go outside. The airlock doesn't work either. Blimey. What do we do now? Well, we'll look again. Go over every inch of the ship with a fine tooth comb. Unless we find what's wrong and put it right, we'll be here for good. Look, Jet. For nearly 48 hours we've been at it. We've got to take a rest. How can we rest? But we've taken some of the equipment to pieces a dozen times. At least let two of us sleep. Let's work out a shift system or something. Oh, all right. You and Mitch. Lemmy and I will carry on. We'll wake you up in four hours. Let Lemmy sleep, Jet. I can keep going. Oh, thanks. I can hardly keep my eyes open. No, no, Mitch. One of us, either you or me, must be awake while the other sleeps. Oh. Well, if you say so. Now, come on, Lemmy. Let's try the distributor board again. Well, if there is any traceable fault, it's eluded us. I don't think there's any point in going all over it again. We'll wear out the equipment just by constantly taking it to pieces. And what do we do? Sit and twiddle our thumbs? For a while, yes. A rest will do us all good. Give us time to think. Coming back fresh to the job might help solve it. Well, in any case, we can't go on sweating our insides out. The more physical energy we use up, the quicker the store of oxygen goes down. How much oxygen have we got? Oh, at a guess, I'd say enough for 15 more days. Is that all? Well, it seemed enough when we left home. We didn't expect to spend extra time here. Well, that means unless we take off within ten days, we won't have enough left to last the journey back to Earth. And how about food? Well, normal rations would last about as long as the oxygen. But both can be eked out over a slightly longer period, if we're careful. Doc, I'll make it your responsibility to ration both the food and the oxygen. Uh -huh. We'll organize periodic checks of the ship's installations. Now, uh, one flashlight will remain on the control table. But it'll be turned on only when necessary for the checks. And for Doctor Wright's diary. Is that so important that we have to waste valuable light on it? One flashlight lasts quite a time, Mitch. Besides, now the recorder's out of action, Doc's notes will have to serve as the log. 
Uh, hunt your bunks and let's get the rotor worked out for a start. Yeah, and we were all so pleased, laughing and joking, because we was going home. Get onto your bunk, Lemmy, and save your breath. November 12th, 1965. It is now 23 days since takeoff from Earth, 19 days since we landed on the moon's surface, and five days since we tried to get off again. By now, everybody, including Mitch, has resigned himself to waiting and hoping. Every few hours, the radio, radar, televiewer, and other installations are switched on in the hope that power has returned to the ship. The only illumination is the one flash lamp which burns over the control table. It doesn't throw much light around the cabin, most of which is in deep shadow. Only the blank, expressionless faces of the dials and gauges staring dimly at us from the darkness that is the wall. The dull gleam of the metal that goes to make up the concave roof reflects what light reaches it, enabling us to make out very faintly the door that leads to the little pilot's cabin in the ship's nose, the cabin which Jet would have entered to pilot the ship through the Earth's atmosphere on the return journey. The time drags. Talking would make it slip by quickly, but the quicker it passes, the sooner the end, whatever it may be, will be reached. Jet. Yes, Lenny? How can you read a book at a time like this? What else is there to do? While well, the light's on, I might as well take advantage of it. It's getting perishing hot, isn't it? Oh, but it's cool outside. Minus 270 degrees centigrade, if you call that cool. You'd freeze solid the moment you put your foot outside the door. Oh, I wonder what the boys back in Australia are thinking. If things had gone all right, it would be only a few hours before we'd be home. They'll be looking out for us. Wondering why we didn't call them again after we said we were about to take off. Oh, shut up, Lemmy. What a way to end up in a rocket ship that's supposed to reach 29,000 miles an hour and can't even raise itself a foot above the ground. Oh, shut up, do you hear? Well, Lemmy. Yes, Doc. It's your turn to check the oxygen and give out the food. Oh, yes, Doc. Here's the light. You sure you don't want to go on writing for a bit? No, thank you. How about you, Jet? You won't be able to see to read. I can wait. Oxygen pressure, 29.5. 29.5. Two tanks still full. Two tanks. Temperature, 92 degrees. 92. All right, now the food, Lemmy. <coughs> Rations. Four flasks of fruit juice. And four airtight sandwich packs. Give them out, Lemmy. All right. Then go back to your bunk and uh, try not to talk so much. Yes, Jack. November 13th. Six days. We are now really beginning to miss the air conditioner. The heat is almost unbearable, the thermometer standing just over 100 degrees. We have now removed most of our clothes and live in our underwear, and we can expect it to get hotter as each hour goes by. Nobody talks very much. Each man gets up, adjusts the oxygen supply, and distributes the rations as his turn comes round. Almost the only words we've heard these last two hours were Jet's orders when we carried out the last tests on the equipment, with the usual result. Nothing. Jet reads constantly. Mitch lies in his bunk, gazing at the ceiling, while Lemmy, who has the bunk above mine, treats us to a musical recital on his harmonica. Lemmy, cut out that row, will you? Blimey. What's up, Mitch? Haven't we got enough trouble without having that awful noise going on all the time? Who says it's a noise? Why can't you play something else for a change? I don't know nothing else. Well, shut up. Put the thing away. Now, hold on, Mitch. Yesterday you were only too glad to hear him play it. Well, I'm fed up with it now. Put it away, Lemmy. Well, I've got to do something to pass the time, Jet. Just lying here, hour after hour, sweating and thinking. It's enough to give you the pip. Isn't there something we can do? Test the equipment again or something? It's not above an hour since we finished a check. Lemmy's right. Lying here in silence is bad. We ought to, ought to try to do something collective for short periods. At least keep our minds off things for a bit. How about a nice stroll outside? In the earth light? Seven days. Heat gets worse. 
temperature is now way above the hundred mark. None of us has hardly a stitch of clothing on, and our bunks are soaked with perspiration. Monotonously, time drags by. Equipment check, oxygen supply, rations. And in between, Jet doing his utmost to keep our spirits up. We must have played every parlor game that was ever invented. We lie in the dark and fire questions at each other on general knowledge. We no longer know or care whether the answers are right. We take turns reciting verses. It gives us something to do and takes our minds off the inevitable climax which slowly but relentlessly approaches. For, unless life returns to the ship within the next six days, it must be the end of us all. The Tower of London. That's 14 points to you. Uh, right, Lemmy, your turn. Uh, animal. Uh, four legs? No. Uh, two legs. No legs. No legs. No legs. And it's mineral. You just said it was animal. It's mineral. Uh, manufactured? And big, like a huge donut. Is it manufactured? Made of metal, with a dome where the hole should be. Lemmy. And windows, and a blue light flashing on and off underneath. And it's coming here. Lemmy. It's coming, I'll tell you. It's right on the strip. What? It's glowing. It must be working. No, hold on, I'm coming. Oh. Ah. No, Jed, no. There, there's something on it. See? See it? Yes. Jed. Good Lord, what on earth is it? Jed. It's like a floating... And the light, the flashing light. Jed. It's gone. Whatever it was, it's gone. But the screen's still alive. You can see the stars. Oh. You could see the stars. Yeah, it's dead again. Lemmy. Lemmy, you all right? Well, what's happened to him? I don't know. Uh, try to find the flashlight. I knocked it off the table in my um, hurry to get over here. Yes, I've got it, Jed. Does it work? No. Oh. Lemmy, can you hear me? Well, the main lights, if the power's on, they should come on too. Lemmy, what's the matter? Answer me. Doc, the light switch just above the control table. Huh? Can you find it? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Ah, nothing. Stay where you are. I'll get another lamp out of the locker. Lemmy. Leave me alone. Lemmy, the power was on. Do you hear? It came on again. Oh. Lemmy, what's happened to you? What is it? I heard it. That music, I heard it again. You did? It was going to be a horse. The one that won last year's derby. What was? My object. But when I started to answer the questions, it, it all got mixed up. And, and then that music came and all I could think of was a, a... Well, I don't know what it is now. A kind of... You don't have to describe it, Lemmy. We saw it. Hey? Eh? We all saw it. What? On the televiewer with a flashing blue light under it. It seemed to be flying. And for a moment it filled the whole screen and then moved out of range, almost as though it might have passed right over us. And then we saw nothing but the stars, just for a few seconds before the screen went dead again. Then it wasn't just me. No, Lemmy. It affected all of us this time. Ah, that's better. What a difference just a little light makes. The other one out of action, Mitch? Yeah. You hit the floor pretty hard. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I expect we can put it right. Well, give it to Lemmy. Let him try. The rest of us will go around the ship, carry out another full inspection, just in case things are about to start working again. It is now three days since the televiewer suddenly burst into life and the picture of the... whatever it was, appeared on it. Since then, the ship has been as dead as it ever was. The heat is now beyond description... We are using up the oxygen supply rapidly. I estimate we have barely enough to last nine days more. And we need five of those days for the return journey back to Earth. So we have now only four days left. Four days. If we haven't taken off by then... Jet. Yes, Lemmy? The light's on. Why aren't you reading? I've read this book four times now. I practically know it by heart. Is it any good? Oh, yes. I first read it as a child. It's always been a favourite of mine. Well, don't keep it all to yourself. Read us a bit. Yeah. It'd be better than just lying here, staring at the ceiling and thinking. Well, uh, I don't think you'd like it all that much. How do we know? Until we've heard it. Here, yeah, go on, read it. Or well, some of it anyway. We can have another instalment next time the light's on. Go on. Oh, all right. If you really want me to. What's it called? And who's it by? It's by H.G. Wells. Oh, yeah? And, uh... It's called The First Man in the Moon. Oh. You still want to hear it? Yes, yet. Go ahead. What difference can it make? Yeah, it might tell us how to get out of this mess we're in. <laughs> Go on, Jet. Give it a try. Chapter the First. I 
as far as we can go for now. It's time for the light to be put out for one hour. <clears throat> Turn it off, will you, Doc? Yeah. Blimey, that Bedford fella certainly ran into a lot of trouble, didn't he? <sighs> Ingenious idea, those selenites. Yeah, thank goodness we didn't meet up with any. If there's one thing we have proved by coming up here, it's that there's no life on the moon. None of... What in heaven's name is that? Mice. Seems to be coming from down in the hold. Or from outside, down near the stern. There it goes again. On the other side this time. It's as though somebody were walking around the ship and tapping it to see what it was made of. Or trying to find a way in. What kind of a noise is that? Now they're on the tap again. Going all the way round the ship. Still. Uh, Mitch, turn on the light. Yes, Jim. Well, it must be an hour at least since it stopped. And whatever it was, it, it must have gone away. Thirteen days. The strange tapping sounds we heard three days ago have not been heard since. We have no idea what they were. Now there is only one day left. Unless we take off tomorrow, we cannot hope to reach the Earth alive. Soon, in just an hour or two, the sun will be rising over the bay and we will have been here 28 Earth days. From the Earth, the moon will be rapidly approaching full. Hundreds of astronomers all over the world will be looking for us. We are too small to be seen, but with luck, while the sun is still low on the lunar horizon, somebody might see our ship's long shadow and recognize it. That will tell them that we are still here. They won't be able to help us, but at least they'll know we haven't wandered off into space. Perhaps to spend eternity as a tiny, artificial asteroid in an orbit round the sun. Hey, Jet, the televiewer! What? The televiewer, it's come on! It's working! What's that? The air conditioner. The power must be back. The ship's alive again! The lights! Try the lights! That's just what I am doing. Oh. Oh. That's oh, better. Uh, come on. The lights have come on again. Let me get to the radio. See if that's working. Well, the rest of you, got your own control. Yeah, sure. Check everything. Right. Yep. Yes. Automatic oxygen supply is going as well as the air conditioner. We should start cooling off soon. Motor gauges are alive. Tank full. Everything okay. Oh, thank heavens. And not a day too soon. Radio's going. Transmitter registers full aerial current. See if you can contact Earth, Lemmy. What do you think I'm doing? Come on, Mitch. Let's make one thorough check. See if we're fit for takeoff. And see why not. All we needed was power... And we got it. We're going home. <laughs> We're going home. Hello, hello. Rocket ship Luna calling. Rocket ship Luna calling rocket launching ground. Wonga Walla, Australia. Can you hear me? Come in, please. Over. Any luck, Lemmy? No, Jet, not a peep. Uh, transmitter okay? So far as I can tell, but they can't be listening. Well, you can't blame them. We're more than a week overdue. Well, somebody must be hearing us somewhere. Maybe trying to contact us, too. Shall I search around a bit? They won't necessarily be dead on frequency. Well, you think it best? Yes, I do. I can't do worse than I am now. This band seems pretty full. Anybody listening to any of this should hear us. Always supposing they can understand what I'm talking about. Hey, Jet! Yes, Mitch? Motor's okay. No reason why we shouldn't take off just as soon as you're ready. Well, we haven't contacted base yet. Oh. How long do you intend to give them? Until the last minute. We can't risk approaching Earth without their help and information. And if we don't get them? Then we'll have to take off and take the chance. Don't leave it too long, Jet. I don't think I could stand it if the power cut out again. Oh, we can stay here another 12 hours. We'll make that the deadline, unless we hear from base first and it's okay to take off sooner. Right. Keep at that radio, Lemmy. Uh. The sooner you contact Earth, the sooner we get away. I'll do my best. Nothing I've heard yet is trying to get us, and that's for certain. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is Rocket Ship Luna trying to contact Earth. Rocket Ship Luna calling from the moon. Come in, please. We need to hear from you urgently. Now, we'll try again. I know somewhere out in the world there is a gal for me. I'd like to find and make you mine. How happy we would be. 
Music, music, nothing but music. I? We would have our honeymoon on the rocket ship. We would fly from star to star on our wedding trip. You can make your wedding gown out of a big moon theme. Spring will start us in your hair. You'd be a perfect dream. What do they think they're doing down there playing that stuff? This is London calling in the overseas service of the BBC. Hey, Chip, London! Here is the news. It was announced from Canberra today that little hope can now be entertained for the crew of the experimental spaceship that landed on the moon a month ago. Oh, thanks very much. The rocket ship Luna took off from the Bay of Rainbows on the 27th of October. In the last radio message received from the ship, they said they would be calling again within six minutes, but nothing was heard. A statement from the launching ground at Wanga Walla says that the ship must have either crashed back onto the moon or missed the Earth entirely. In that case, it must be somewhere out in space and lost forever. Aboard the ship were pilot Andrew Morgan, popularly known as Jet. Turn it off. Turn it off. Yes, turn it off. Fools. You're not kidding. We didn't say we had taken off. We said we were about to take off. Get back to the transmitter, Lemmy. Keep calling. Try to raise somebody. Okay. Hey, Jet. What is it, Doc? Come over here, quick. What? What's the trouble? The screen. Look at the screen. The crater. Blimey. Good heavens. Is that the thing Lemmy saw uh, during the guessing game? Is it Lemmy? You should know. You said you saw it yourself. You all did. Yes, but not like this. With the rising sun lighting up every detail, we only caught a glimpse of it. Oh, that's when it must have arrived. And it's been sitting out there ever since. You mean it landed here? Well, what else are we to think? Then who is it? What is it? Must be H.G. Wells's lot. There's only one way to find out. We'll go out there. Hey, but we can't. It's time for us to leave. We can't spare the oxygen. We've got a couple of hours yet. But you don't know what that thing is or what it can do to us. The very reason I want to go. This is the biggest thing we've seen since we landed here. We can't pull out on it now. Yeah, but Jet... You willing to come with me, Mitch? Yes, Jet. I'm all for it. Then get the suits, Lemmy. We're going out. <laughs> You've been listening to episode four of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. After spending one lunar day on the moon, Jet Morgan and his crew prepared to make their long journey back to Earth. But when the time came to take off, nothing in the ship would function. All efforts to find the reason for the ship's failure were fruitless, and the four men spent the lunar night, equivalent to 14 Earth days, within the ship, waiting and hoping. On the tenth day, strange tapping sounds were heard outside the ship as though somebody or something were inspecting it. Then... Just as the sun was rising on the lunar horizon, the power unaccountably returned and the ship sprang to life. Once more, preparations for takeoff were made and radio contact with the Earth was attempted. Then, in the televiewer screen, appeared the image of a strange object. Good heavens! Is that the thing Lemmy saw during the guessing game? Is it Lemmy? Oh, you should know. You said you saw it yourself. You all did. That's when it arrived. It, it's been sitting out there ever since. You mean it landed here? Then who is it? What is it? Must be H.G. Wells' lot. There's only one way to find out. 
We'll go out there. Hi? No, but we can't. It's time for us to leave. We've got a couple of hours yet. But you don't know what that thing is or what it can do to us. That's the very reason I want to go. But, Jet, you... You willing to come with me, Mitch? Yes, Jet. I'm all for it. Then get the suits, Lemmy. We're going out. It's too risky. We ought to take off while we've got the chance. If you get stuck out there or get lost or something, it might be ours before we find you again. We have no intention of getting lost. But if you should, for any reason, it'll ruin any chance we've got of getting back to Earth before our oxygen supply runs out. We have more than 12 hours before we need worry about that. Meanwhile, that thing's sitting out there. We can't pass up a chance like this. Look. Oh, all right. You're quite sure you know what you're doing. Get your suits on. I'll open the hatch. Thanks. Uh, Lemmy. Yeah? Keep working on that radio. Try to raise Earth if you can. Tell them what we've seen and what we're doing. Right. Now, keep us on the televiewer, Doc. And keep the recorder going. Right. And don't worry. We'll keep our distance. We'll just take a few pictures and be right back. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling Earth. Calling Wongawalla, Australia. Rocket ship Luna calling from the moon. If you can hear me, come in, please. Okay, Doc. Close the hatch. Hatch closing. Not a peep. Oh, I suppose they still use radio back on Earth. Fastening helmets. Over to intercom. Stand by to exhaust airlock. Standing by. Helmet fastened. Helmet fastened. Okay. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is rocket ship Luna calling Earth. Suit now inflating. Calling Wongawala, Australia. Emergency. Matter of life and death. Oh, uh, emergency. Now listening out. Air pressure you zero. Me, come in, please. Hello, Luna. Hello, Luna. Receiving you loud and clear. Hey, Doc, listen. We got something. Hello. Hello. Rocket ship Luna calling. Receiving you. Very faint, but receiving you. Oh, <laughs> Rocket ship Luna, commanded by Dick Wilson. Crater and, um, object in full view. Can you see it, Jet? It appears to be circular. About 40 feet in diameter and 10 feet high. The general shape is rather like a donut, but with a, a dome-like roof. Mitch is now taking pictures of it. You getting this, Doc? Yeah, every word. Sounds just like the thing I saw. It appears to be made of metal. The sides are very smooth with no visible seams or doors, but something like portholes or windows are at the base of the dome. It lies at the bottom of the crater... There's no sign of movement either near it or within it that we can tell from here. Jack? We're now going out, Doc, for a closer look. Watch your step. We will. Jet, this is the biggest thing that could have happened to us. This must mean that there is life in other parts of the universe. Now, don't let's go jumping to any hasty conclusion. How else could a thing like that appear from nowhere? Shall I go first? Yes, but wait at the bottom of the ladder. Now, don't attempt to approach the thing alone. Hello? Hello, rocket ship Luna. Weather station XLG calling rocket ship Luna. Over. Hello, XLG. Luna calling. Have passed your message to London, who are now contacting Wonga Walla. Keep listening out. You can expect to hear from them very shortly. I suppose you'll be taking off any minute. Well, yes, except that Jet and Mitch have left the ship. We can't take off till they get back. Left the ship? What for? Well, there's a thing out there. They've got to look at it and take a picture of it. What sort of a thing? Looks like another spaceship. It landed here during the night. Another spaceship? Hey, where, where from? You sure it's not the man in the moon dropping in for a cup of tea? Don't you believe me? Well, at least you're in good spirits up there. Joking at a time like this. Oh, I'm not joking. Well, if you say so. Now, you better listen out for Wonga Walla. We should be calling you soon. And good luck. 
Hello, Doc. Jet calling. Receiving you. Go ahead. We've touched down on the moon's surface and we're walking towards the crater. Let us know when we're in camera range. Okay. Doc, did you hear that? Them fellas down in Greenland don't believe us. I can hardly believe it myself. Hello, Jet. Seeing you now. Hello, Luna. Hello, rocket ship Luna. Control calling. Calling from Wonga Walla launching ground. Can you hear me? Come in, please. Control. It's Control. Did you hear that, Doc? We got them. Hello, Control. Hello, let me call him. Let me Barnet call him from the moon. Where you been all this time? Where have you been? What happened? Why didn't you take off? We couldn't. The old ship packed in. We've been stuck up here ever since. But we're all right now. You're more than a week overdue. We've given you up as lost. Well, we're not. We're all here. How soon do you expect to take off? Just as soon as Jet and Mitch get back. Where are they? They're outside. Outside, looking at the, uh, 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 oh, oh, blimey. Hello, Earth, hello, hello, Earth. Lemmy, the ship, the thing. Hello, Earth, come in, please. I've lost contact. Hurry, for Pete's sake, come over here. Look, Doc, Doc, I'm here. Doc, that noise. Look at the screen. Look at the Look. dome on that thing. It's moving. Hey? It's opening. The top is opening. Can Jet see it? Jet! Hello, Jet, hello, can you hear me? Jet, Mitch, this is Doc, can you hear me? Don't move. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. Hello, Doc. Come in, please. Hello, Jet. Hearing you. We've been calling you. Didn't you hear us? It was that music. Came on again and we couldn't hear anything as usual. I lost contact with home, too. Doc, the dome of the ship or whatever it is has slid back. It's open. Yeah, we know. We saw it. Come back into the ship, Jet. Come back. What do you think, Mitch? You can go back if you want to. I'm not going. Mitch, where's your common sense? Come on. Mitch. I'm not going back. But, Mitch, you're not afraid, are you? No, I'm not. But if there is anything in there, something hostile, how do we defend ourselves? We've no weapons, nothing. You're just scared. Uh, you have no right to say that, Mitch. I've got every right to say what I darn well please. Mitch, if anything should happen to us, what about Lemmy and Doc? How do they get home? I'm going on. I'm going right up to that thing. If nothing comes out, I'm going to take a look inside. Oh, no, you're not. It's too risky. Who's going to stop me? I am. I'd like to see you try. Go on. Mitch, pull yourself together. I'm going. Mitch, come here. Leave me alone. Jet, Jet, don't fight. The suits, you'll damage them. You hear that, Jet? If you use force, you might kill us both. <laughs> That's better. Fighting won't get anybody anywhere. What's got into you? For years, I've worked on our ship, sweating my inside out, designing her and building her. And then, when we get here, here's another one, completely different in design. Probably holding a whole lot of secrets about long-distance space travel. And you want me to bypass it. We've photographed it, haven't we? Photographs? What can they tell us? might just as well have photographed the image on the televiewer screen. What exactly do you want to do? I want to go up to that thing, touch it, walk all around it, examine it. But the top has just opened. Something must have opened it, and that something may come out. I'm prepared to risk it. Do you want to come with me? Uh, yes, I do. Jet, wait. Jet, do as Doc says, please. Mitch, I'll come as far as the crater's rim. If you want to go down it, you go, but don't get out of my sight. All right. If that's what you want, it'll be better than nothing. Did you hear that, Doc? Yes. Then we'll start walking towards it. Uh, slowly, Mitch, take your time. Hello, Luna. Hello, Control calling. Have lost contacts. If you can hear me, come in, please. Hello, Control. Luna calling. Sorry for the interruption, but that music came on again. Music? What music? Well, the... Oh, well, the fact is Jet and Mitch are still outside the ship and we can't get them back in. That they know you must take off as soon as possible? Yes, they know, but there's something out there. What is it? It's, um... Well, we're not sure. Now on, Crater's Rim. Let me shut up. I can't hear what Jet's saying. And come over here and handle the recorder. I can't watch it and the televiewer. Hello, Earth. Look, there's a bit of a panic on up here. I'll call you again in a few minutes. All right, but don't leave it too long. Blimey, Doc. Why can't they leave that thing out there alone and let us get home? Shh, Lemmy. Hello, Jet. I everything all right? Up to now it is. How about you, Mitch? Just walking across the crater floor. Nothing's come out of that thing. I suppose there is somebody or something in it. Keep your mind on that recorder. He's getting close, Doc. Yeah, I can see him. All right, Mitch? Of course I'm all right. Now only a few yards off. Hmm. I'm right up to her. Seems to be made of metal, all right. A kind of aluminium, at a rough guess. <laughs> Down solid, too. Hey, Mitch, do that again. Do what? Kick it. Like that? Yes, I heard it. What? I heard it. I heard your kick. Impossible. 
Oh, I didn't hear it direct. I heard it through my radio. What? Do it again, Mitch. I heard it myself that time. It definitely came through the radio. But how could it? Either that thing itself or something inside it is a radio, a transmitter. It transmitted Mitch's kicks and our sets picked them up. Hey, Ken, I, I want to walk around this thing. No, Mitch. It'll take you out of range of the televiewer and out of my sight. It won't take a couple of minutes. Do you hear me, Mitch? No. And here I go, walking around. Will you listen to me? No on western side. No different here. And no way in from this side that I can see. The fool. He's out of sight now, Jet. Keep quiet, Doc. Listen for him. Now on southern side. Hey. What is it? Uh, well, there's one thing about this ship that's the same as ours. What's that? A retractable ladder. And right now the rungs are extended. It's almost like an invitation to go in. For heaven's sake, be careful. Uh, can you see him? I can see him now. Well, I'll be... Hey, Jet. Yes? I can see right down into it, into the cabin. What's in there? Nothing. There's a circular cabin, flat floor, plain walls, and a ladder leading out of it. I'm going in. Oh, no. Well, I made it. I'm in. The walls seem to be made of octagonal-shaped panels. And there are two rows of buttons at the top of each panel. Leave them alone. Don't touch them. You don't think I'm that crazy, do you? Beats me where the crew can be, if it ever had one. How else could it get here? Could be remote controlled. But who by and where from? Search me. Maybe this is just the airlock. The actual living quarters are further inside. Oh, Oh, no. Doc, listen. It's here. Jet. Jet. What is it? The noise. It's here again. We can both hear it this time. So can I. Something's going to happen. It always does. What about Mitch? Hello. Hello, Mitch. Mitch, can you hear us? Mitch. He doesn't answer. Doc, you try to raise him. Hello, Mitch. Can you hear me? This is Doc calling. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mitch. Call him again. Hello, Mitch. Can you hear us? Uh, Jet's already calling him. Oh, why did he have to go in that thing? And why doesn't he come out? Hello, Mitch. Hello. Hello, Jet. What's the panic? Didn't you hear us calling you? And didn't you hear the music? It's nothing to be scared of. Hey? None of us is going to be hurt. This ship is just different from ours, that's all. Run on an entirely different principle. Its magnetic field upsets the working parts of our ship. Mitch, what on earth are you talking about? It's all so simple. Look, either come out of there or I'll come over myself. That would be asking for trouble. What do you mean? Stay where you are. Don't attempt to move any closer. What's got into him, Jet? This ship is from another world. Millions of miles away. It's from the other side of the universe. That's impossible. For anything to travel that far would take thousands of years. Television would seem impossible to an ancient Egyptian. I don't happen to be an ancient Egyptian. You're right. A prehistoric man would be a better description. What's the matter with you, Mitch? Time. That's the secret. Journeys through time. Leave here. Whoosh. Next moment you pop up a thousand years from now. Or back a couple of thousand. Will you please explain what all this is about? Can you explain a geometrical problem to a monkey? What? His crackers. Whatever happened to him in there sent him clean off his rocker. Mitch, listen to me. No. You listen to me. What are you doing here? Where are you from? Doc, what can we do? Talk to him. Keep talking to him. Well, we're from the Earth, but you know that. We decided you must be from some other planet. Eh? Is that a surprise? That there are other people in the universe besides yourself? Well, I suppose it's possible, but Possible? It... Life is universal. It crops up wherever it is given the slightest chance. There are millions of stars with planetary systems. Millions of planets teeming with life. He must be crackers. You all find this hard to believe, don't you? Well, it's not that, Mitch, but this is so unlike you. Why do you interrupt the peace of your sister planet? What is your business here? Surveying, photographing, the establishment of a lunar base... Already you are tearing your own planet to pieces, destroying it. And now you mean to do the same here. Isn't that your intention? If there are minerals here of use to us, we'll dig them out. It is your intention. But if our civilization is to carry on to progress, we need fuel, metal, radioactive materials. The moon appears to have great stores of them. Supplies on Earth can't last forever. Watch your step, 
Earth men. There are things out here, even on the fringe of space, you don't comprehend. You don't understand. Can't understand. That no beings in a three-dimensional world can ever hope to understand. Three dimensions? You mean there is another dimension? Hello? Hello, Mitch, can you hear me? Mitch, hello? Hello? I can't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Hello, Mitch! It's no good, it's beyond me. What is? Don't seem to be any doors, nothing. If there is a way further into this ship, it's absolutely undetectable. Mitch, come out of there. Come out? But I've only just this moment got in. Come out, do you hear? I can't leave it now. I... Oh. What's the matter? I don't know. I'm getting out and quick. He jumped. Mitch, be careful. Don't run. A lot of notice he's taken of that. Good Lord, Jed. That thing's alive. Alive? Well, it... I don't know. It began to vibrate. Is that all? It's enough, isn't it? Jed, look. The dome. It's closing. What? Yes, it is. I got out just in time. Let's get back into the ship quick, before we all go crazy. I've been there above a minute. I hardly said a word to you, and then I felt the thing come to life, and that's when I jumped and came running back to you. Doc, you recorded everything, didn't you? Everything. Play it back. Let Mitch hear it. There's nothing I'd like more. You've got me worried. What's the panic? Didn't you hear us calling you? And didn't you hear the music? It's nothing to be scared of. Hey? Truth, is that me? It's your it's voice, isn't it? To be scared of. That's what I thought you said. None of us is going to be hurt. This ship is just different from ours, that's all. Run on an entirely different principle. But I, I never said any of those things. I wasn't in that ship long enough to say half that. But you were, and the recorder's proof of it. Listen, let's listen to it. Let, let me hear it. Mitch, what on earth are you talking about? It's all so simple. Mitch, either come out of there or I come over. There are things out here, even on the fringe of space, you don't comprehend, you don't understand, can't understand, that no beings in a three-dimensional world can ever hope to understand. Three dimension? You mean there is another dimension? Well, Mitch? It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's unbelievable. This is Doc's diary all over again. And you, Jet, slipping backwards in time. You know... It all ties up in a peculiar way. Well, how? You go in there and time seems to stand still. We hear your voice over our radio and record it. But so far as you're concerned, you were in and out of that ship in less than a minute. Well, when I went into the crater, the same sort of thing happened to me. I was unaware of time passing. But according to you three, I had disappeared. And I was gone for more than two hours. You know, the whole business does seem to be connected with time in some way. Maybe, but the music Lemmy's been hearing, the stuff I wrote in my diary, how do you tie that up? I don't know, unless they were trying to contact us in some way. If so, they finally succeeded through Mitch. But who are they? What are they? Where did they come from? The other side of the universe, according to you. Or should I say, your voice. Of course, that's it. They're time travellers. Yeah. Tra time travellers? Yes. It's been known for years that the only way to get to the really distant stars is to travel through time. And that's just what that ship must do. Then why couldn't it have arrived a hundred years from now? Or a hundred years ago? Why do they have to pick on the very time when we landed here? Well, they must have been just as surprised to see us as we were to meet up with them. Well, that's why they tried to scare us off, frighten us, put the ship out of action. Well, why should they want to do that? Because they're afraid of us. Hey? What, them? Afraid of us? Well, why not? But they seem to have so much more knowledge, more intelligence, if you like. Well, have they? Or is it just a different kind of knowledge? But if they can travel through time, or whatever that means, they must be vastly superior to us in every way. Lemmy, can you fly and find your way instinctively like a homing pigeon? Do I look as though I can? Do you consider the homing pigeon superior to you, then? More intelligent? Just because he can do something you can't do? No, I don't. Well, that's how it might be. Whoever made that ship out there can travel in time. They probably couldn't travel through space if they tried. Oh, if only we had their secret. Think of the things we could do. If only we had the oxygen. Think of the time we could stay here. Are we ever going back? No, uh, he's right, Jeff. Maybe we've bumped into something that's going to rock modern thought to its foundations. But unless we get word of it back to Earth and quick, it's going to be lost forever. Yes. <clears throat> Lemmy, open up that radio. Call Earth. Tell them we'll be leaving in a few minutes. Tell them we're going back. That's the best bit of news I've heard up to now. Doc, Mitch, start getting ready. Take off in 30 minutes. That's well, what I like to hear.
Well, Doc? Uh, I've rotated the camera three times. There's no sign of it. It must have taken off. Or done whatever it does to get from one place to another. All set? Okay. Okay. Yeah, ready. Gyro. Gyro. We'll keep the motor going until we reach 3,700 miles an hour. Then we'll cut her. Cut her? But escape velocity is 5,300. We don't need escape velocity. Not to go into an orbit around the moon. Hey, who said anything about an orbit around the moon? I thought we were going straight back. When we started out on this trip, it was definitely arranged we should circle the moon at least once to see what the other side looked like. It's something scientists have wondered about for centuries. But, Jet, that was if everything was normal. Everything is normal now. The ship's working, isn't she? But for how long? We're going to circle the moon as arranged. Now, stand by for firing. As soon as the correct speed is reached, we'll turn the ship through 90 degrees, increase velocity, and get as close to the surface as we can. Standing by. Okay. Okay. Firing in ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Contact! Well, it doesn't look any different from the other side, does it? Hey, Jet, come over here. Look at this. What? Biggest crater I've ever seen, about twice the size of Copernicus. Yeah, it's crammed full of little craters, tiny ones in regular lines. Yes, there's a tendency for craters on the Earth side to form lines of a sort, but this just can't be natural. I'll say they can't. Those craters are moving. What? Yes, they're yeah. leaving the ground. They're they... not craters at all, they're ships. Dozens of them. And they're coming up here. They're coming up after us. <laughs> You've been listening to Episode 5 of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. After being stranded on the moon for 14 Earth days due to a power failure, the rocket ship Luna was at last ready to make her return journey back to Earth. Then a strange object which looked like another spaceship was seen on the televiewer screen and Jet Morgan and Mitch went out to investigate it. Mitch entered the craft and, according to him, left almost immediately when he felt the ship begin to vibrate. But when he returned to his own ship... Mitch found that he'd been in the strange spacecraft for longer than he thought, and that during that time, his voice had been heard explaining that the spaceship was actually from another part of the universe and had reached our solar system by travelling through time. The rocket ship Luna took off, but before setting her nose towards the Earth and home, went into a circular orbit round the moon so that the far side could be photographed. Hey, Jet, come over here. Look at this. What? Biggest crater I've ever seen. It's about twice the size of Copernicus. It's crammed full of little craters. Tiny ones in regular lines. Yes, there's a tendency for craters on the Earth side to form lines of a sort, but this just can't be natural. I'll say they can't. Those craters are moving. Yes, they're leaving the ground. They're not craters at all. They're ships. Dozens of them. And they're coming up here. They're coming up after us. Good heavens, I think they are too. Isn't there something we can do to get away from them? Turn on the motor or something? Not while we're on this side of the moon. Not until our nose is pointed towards the Earth again. Blimey! Look at them weaving about like aircraft. How can they do it? Well, search me. And I'd give five years of my life to know. Hey, they're getting into some kind of formation. 
Maybe they're going to attack us. If they are, there's nothing we can do about it. We've no weapons, nothing. We can't even take evasive action. Well, we'd have as much chance as an old-fashioned airship against a guided missile. Well, maybe this is just their way of giving us a send-off, a kind of farewell party. I don't like that farewell bit. We better call up control and tell them about this. You shall loaf, Mitch. We can't be heard with the moon between the earth and us. No, still directly below us. Same height, same speed. And in a circular formation, like a, a ring of toadstools. We've nearly completed the circuit. With luck, we'll get away from them. Oh. Strap yourselves in. Okay. Let me know when you're all set. All set. Okay. Okay. Then cut in the stern televiewer, Lemmy, and switch in forward view. Televiewer, forward view, on. There it is. There's the earth. Almost directly ahead. And very welcome she looks, too. Position, Lemmy. Coming into center, five degrees. Dock stabilizer. Stabilizer. Four degrees. Mitch, motor. Standing by. Three degrees. Stand by for firing. Two. Firing imminent. One. Contact. center. Course correct. Cut the stabilizer, Doc. Stabilizer cut. Well, that's that. On course, correct velocity, and we're heading for home. We'll see just what our escort made of that little maneuver. Stone televiewer on. Are they still there, Mitch? You can't see them. <laughs> Good. We must have left them miles behind. Wait a minute. I can see them. There. Those tiny black dots against the bright moon surface. Mitch, you haven't checked the motor or the fuel supply. Sorry, Jet. I'll do it right away. Now, Doc, where are they? Uh, there. See them? They must be following us. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling home. Over. And they're gaining on us, too. Motor and fuel tanks, okay? Plenty of reserve fuel left. Hoodles of it. Mitch, they're following us. What? They're getting closer all the time. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling control. Calling control. Come in, please. What are they up to? What's the idea? Well... Maybe they're just curious. Either that or they are planning an attack. Demi, have you got control yet? No, give us a chance. Hello, Earth. Oh. Rocket what good will contacting base do? Well, for us, Come in, probably please. very little. Hello, but at Earth. least we ought to tell Earth to Rocket warn them. Luna let future crews control. know what to expect out here. Come in, hey, please. listen. Huh? Well, can't you hear it? Jet, that noise. It's here again. Yes. Jet, can't you hear it? Yes, Lemmy, I can, but get control for heaven's sake. I can't. It's that flicking music. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is rocket ship Luna calling control. It's getting louder. They're still coming, getting closer. That's why it gets louder. That noise must come from them. Hello, Earth. Hello. Good grief. What is it, Doc? They must be going to ram us. The whole lot of them. What? Yes, they must be. They haven't changed their line of flight one iota. They're coming straight at us. But they wouldn't dare. They'd do as much harm to themselves as they would to us. Even if they're remote controlled? Uh, that is a point. Well, they're getting pretty close. Jet. Huh? Do you feel anything? Feel anything? What? Gravity's returning to the ship. Oh, it's impossible. It is, I tell you. They're almost on us. Control, this is Luna. Come in, please. Emergency. I can feel the gravity pull. So can I, it's, now. It's beginning to get difficult to stand up. Shit, what's happening? The ships, they must be all around us. Get onto your bunks. Lie flat. Lie flat. I, I can't. I, I can't make it. Lie where you are, on the floor. Hello, Earth. Hello. Jerry, get Earth. down. Everybody... Lie down. Something deep is what is going on. The television. There's a ship right up close behind us. It fills the whole screen. It... Doc, Mitch, let me, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can, Jet. What happened to us, Mitch? I don't know. Oh, how do you feel? Oh, crook. Real crook. Yeah, me too. I blacked out. Yes, yeah, so did I. Doc, let me. Well, you're out, Jet, flat out, unconscious. Hey, can you get up? I think so. Oh, 
There. Oh. Now, Lemmy's waking up. Lemmy. Oh. Are you oh. hurt? Oh, Jet, leave me alone. Oh, I feel shocking. Oh, we all do. The ship must have accelerated. I don't know how, but that's all I can think of. Doc's coming around. Doc, you all right? Look, we'd better get him onto his bunk. Oh, right. I feel like I don't care if I die. Get onto your bunk too, Lemmy. Don't oh. lie there on the floor. If you're feeling up to it, Lemmy, you might give us a hand with Doc. Yes, Mitch. You feeling better, Lemmy? Yes, a bit. Then stay with him. As soon as you can, try to raise control. Right. Come on, Mitch. We'll take a look at the televiewer first. See if those things are still out there. It's true. What's the matter with it? It's gone crazy. Why don't we get a clear picture? It is a clear picture. Those points of light traveling from the top of the frame to the bottom are stars. Stars? The ship is spinning, turning head over heels. But we've got to steady her, get her back onto an even keel. We'll never find our position or anything else unless we do. We can use the flywheels as counteraction. But they're so small, it'll take a long time before we're steady again. What do we care, so long as we can stop her turning over like this? Well, put in number one for a start. Yes, Jack. Then switch her on. Number one. Still turning, but she should settle down soon. I think we might start taking a look at things now. Rotate the televiewer camera, Mitch, and see if those ships are still following us. Well, certainly not on the port side or directly behind us. Try the starboard side. I'm turning. Well, either they've gone or they must be directly in front of us. I'll switch on the forward view. No, we better take a fix on the moon. Check our course. Yeah. No. Wait a minute. Eh? Did you see the moon just now? No, I didn't. Rotate the camera. Let's look again. There's no sign of it. Either the Earth or the moon. Hello. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship lunar calling. Lunar calling control. Come in, please. Stars. Nothing but stars. They must be there. The Earth and moon can't both disappear. Hello. Hmm? Hello. Lunar calling Earth. Rocket ship lunar calling Wongawala. Come in, please. Come in. It's, it's no good yet. They're not there. Hello. Hello. Are you receiving us? Wonga Walla, come in, please. We need your help. Hey, Jet. Jet, I can't raise a sausage. Absolutely nothing. Not on any frequency. It's like every transmitter back on Earth has packed in. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Keep trying. Well, if you say so. Any sign yet, Mitch? No, and I've gone almost right round. There you are. A full turn. Nothing. We couldn't possibly miss objects the size of the Earth and the moon. The moon's image alone should more than fill the whole screen. We can't be that far away from it. We've got to face it, Jet. If they're there, we can't pick them up. If they're there. Something must be wrong with the televiewer. Then why did we see the stars? It's no good, Jet. I can't raise a thing. Not a single living soul. Jet? Yes, Doc? What's the trouble? No, we don't know. Lemmy says the radio's working, but he can't pick up anybody. To all appearances, the televiewer's working, but we can't pick up the moon or the earth. And we've searched every possible direction. We see nothing but stars. Uh, no sign of the ships? No, not a sign. Well, that's something. But we must be way off course. Oh, that's putting it mildly. We'd have to be thousands of miles off course for this to happen. The televiewer must have gone wrong. Well, there's only one way to be sure of that. Go out there and look with our own eyes. That's all we can do. Then let's get our suits on and go. This has got to be solved and quick. We've got no time to waste. Look, I'll, I'll work the airlock for you. Yeah, not if you don't feel up to it, Doc. No. Lemmy can do it. No, I'll do it. It's more important that he stays with the radio. Oh, very well. Give us a couple of minutes to get the suits on. Hello. Hello. Rocket ship Luna calling. Rocket ship Luna calling control. Wongawala, Australia. Rocket... Now leaving ship. Jack. Fastening safety line. Now walking upside of ship. Now fastening safety line. Walking upside a ship behind Jet. Can you see the Earth or the moon? Not yet. Haven't got high enough to get a good view, but I'm nearly there. Now. Well? Not a sign. They're not there. Then they must be underneath the ship. You can't see them because the ship's in the way. No, Doc. Not a hope, I'm afraid. Well, then what's the explanation? I don't know. It's as though we'd left the solar system altogether. Left it behind and got completely out of sight of it in a few minutes. Jet. Look at the stars. Line them up with a part of the ship. Well? Don't you see? They're slowly, very slowly moving past. What? Yes, they are. Very, very slowly, but they're moving. We must be traveling at a tremendous speed. A fantastic speed. That's why there's no sign of the Earth or Moon. We, we left them way behind. Oh, it's too incredible to grasp. Uh, well, let's get back into the ship. This whole thing might be a hallucination. Hallucination? 
Look, there. See that? Oh, a yellow star. Near enough to show up as a disc. Did you see anything like that on the way out from Earth? Well, we couldn't expect to. We can't get anywhere near that close to a star, even the nearest star. Can't we? Well, that darn thing's close enough, isn't it? it... Good heavens! The sun! The sun? Of course! And we're travelling away from it. That's why Lemmy can't pick up anything on the radio. We're out of range. Take it easy, Cheddar. It might not be the sun. We don't know. Hello, Doc. Yes. We're coming back into the ship. It must be a dream. All a dream. We'll wake up soon. We've got to. That's the position. There's no sign of the moon, the earth, the sun, Mars, no sign of the solar system at all. But unless we find it and get back to it, we're done for. One of those stars out there must be the sun. And how do we find out which? Whoa, by the constellations. Yes, that's it. If we could recognize a few star groups, we might deduce our position from them, and that would oh, give not us... not a hope, Lemmy. Look at the what? screen. Look at the stars drifting by. Thousands of them. Can you pick any given constellation out of that lot? Well, I can't, no, but I'm only the radio operator. I'm afraid I can't either, Lemmy. Huh? We'll never do it that way. Mm. And constellations as seen from here, right in among them, as it were, look very different from what they do on Earth. Virtually unrecognizable. Look, even if we did get our bearings, how do we take the ship out of the course she's in now and put her in the right one? With a motor and the gyros. Rotate the ship until the nose is pointing in the right direction and then turn on the power. Look at the speed we're travelling. I don't think cutting in the motor would make any noticeable difference. Even if we used all the fuel in one burst. What, you mean we haven't a chance? No uh, no hope at all? Not of getting back home. Not not even to the moon? Oh, I didn't much like it, but it would be better than nothing. We could at least see the Earth from there. Not even to the moon. Well, how did this happen? What caused it? Less than an hour ago, we were quietly coasting above the moon's surface, minding our own business, and now look at the mess we're in. Let me... None of us know how this happened. All we do know is that those ships had something to do with it. Somehow, they've managed to increase our speed, carry us faster and further than man has ever dreamed he could go. Then where are those perishing ships? Where are they taking us? We don't know that they're taking us anywhere. Seems that in, in one go, they swept us right out of our little solar system and smack into the middle of eternity. Yeah, but where is eternity? We must be going somewhere. Lemmy, the universe is vast. You know that. It's on the cards that we'll never land up anywhere. I? I mean it. Ah, but that's impossible. Just take a look at those stars out there. Even if we just go drifting hopelessly on, we're, we're bound to meet up with one of them in the end. Every one of those stars is a million times bigger than this ship. They've been drifting out here in space for millions and millions of years. And in all that time, only an infinitesimal number, if that, have ever actually collided. So what are our chances, Lemmy? Millions of years, you say? Yes. How much oxygen we got? Enough for four and a half days. Uh, silly, isn't it? <laughs> You could look at it that way. But them things, them ships or whatever they were, they told us through Mitch that there was thousands of planetary systems in the universe all teeming with life. There probably are. Well, if we can leave our own in such a hurry, and it likely we're liable to meet up with another just as quick. Maybe the very one those ships come from themselves. We might do anything. All we do know is that we're somewhere out in space. Probably zooming through the Milky Way at a speed something approaching that of light. Well, look, even if we did come across another solar system, what are the chances of its planets being suitable for us to land on? And, assuming they are, what are the chances of our being able to survive on them? Well, not much. Aye? Well, take our own planetary system. Of the nine known planets, not counting the asteroids, the, the only one, so far as we know, supporting any life is our Earth. Well, what about the others? Well, Mercury's so near the sun, the temperature is high enough to keep lead in a molten state. Could anything live in that? Oh, I shouldn't think so. Venus, whose surface no man has ever glimpsed, is so hot that even if her atmosphere contained enough oxygen, which it doesn't, life would be virtually impossible. Oh. Mars, with its thin atmosphere, may support some kind of plant life. 
But life in Jupiter, Saturn, or any of the other planets would be frozen solid. It just couldn't exist. So what are our chances of finding just one planet in thousands, presumably millions, out here that could support life? Always supposing we're alive when we reach it. Well, if you ask me, this trip has turned out to be a dead loss all round. But other planets in other planetary systems don't have to be like ours, do they? No, they could be of many kinds. What, for instance? Well, some might well still be in a molten state in the first stage of their development. Others could have long since gone right through their life cycle and now be dead, barren, lifeless, like the moon. Yes. Some might well be enclosed in in poisonous atmosphere. Others have no atmosphere at all. Or be so large and the gravity pull so strong, we couldn't even stand up. Some so small, we could jump 50 feet in the air at every step. You know, others might be much like the Earth, but have no water, and there can't be any life without water. Some might have their surfaces entirely covered in water. A planet entirely covered with water. It's not impossible, Mitch. Well, anyway, there'd be no point in landing there. I can't swim. On top of that, you must remember that we are equipped only for moon or Earth landings. Landing anywhere else might need a completely different approach, different methods, different kinds of equipment. Not very encouraging, is it? I'm afraid we've all got to face up to it. We're helpless. Absolutely helpless. No idea where we are, what direction we're travelling in, and even if we knew, powerless to exert any kind of control, whatever, over the ship. I'd sit down and make me will, but there'd be nobody to read it. To think that our attempt to conquer such a small part of the universe should have resulted in this. An endless journey through eternity. Yeah, this is what comes of meddling with things we don't understand. We should have stayed home where life was worth living. Well, there's no use in crying over it now. We have to do something, if only to keep our reason. You're the captain of the ship, Jet. Anything you say? Well, for a start, we'll carry out normal routine. Check the equipment, call up base on the radio. What good will that do? According to you, there's no radio wave could leave Earth fast enough to catch us up. There's no sense in sitting back and brooding over the position. The only things we can do are those we've been doing in connection with the ship's routine. And we'll carry on that way until we... Let me get to the radio. Yes, Jet. Mitch, check the motor, fuel gauges. Yes, right, Jet. I'll check the radar and keep telling your watch for the next hour. Doc? Yeah? You'll keep a log, just as you did during the long wait on the moon. Yeah, sure. Uh, get started. And let's have no more talk about solar systems, planets, or anything else unless it's going to help the situation. <laughs> November the 21st, 1965, Earth time. It is now more than two hours since we found ourselves in these new and frightening circumstances. How we got here, what really caused it, we shall probably never know. We are like a ship at sea, drifting. Only our chance of ever making land must be negligible. For we are adrift in space, maybe destined to wander around the universe forever, helplessly. Hopelessly. A tiny speck of humanity lost in a vast nothingness. Everybody goes about his normal duties as though we were coasting back to Earth from the moon. As indeed, but for this fantastic, stupendous trick of fate, we would be. Mitch periodically checks the motor, fuel tanks, oxygen supply, and air conditioner. Lemmy stays... There it is. But it's the solid body we're heading for. Are we going to hit it? I don't know. We're approaching it pretty fast. We must be. I thought you said we'd slow down. Oh, we have, but only by comparison. Doc, get to the radar. As we get nearer to it, we might get some idea of our true speed. Right. Oh, look at it. It goes off the screen now. It has an atmosphere, no doubt about that. Yeah, but what's it composed of? Methane? Ammonia? The chances of it being air are a million to one against. Still, it's a planet, an island in a limitless ocean. And we're heading straight for it at a speed at which we might be able to control the ship. It's a chance in a million, our only hope. You mean you're going to attempt landing on it? Why not? If we're going to die anyway, it might as well be on that, whatever it is, as out here in in nothing. But it's so far away from home. No further than we'll ever be. This is our one chance of survival. But we've no idea what's on it, who's on it. We might even be wrecked and 
end up as a sort of a space family Robinson. Think what you're doing. We haven't much time to think. An hour or so and we'll either have crashed into it or passed it by. It'll be too late to make any decision then. I'm all for taking the chance. Let's try to land. Doc? Me too. I suppose if I say I'm not, I'll be considered overruled? Yes. I'm overruled. All right. The landing procedure will be the same as it would have been for landing on Earth. With the aid of the atmosphere? How else? But it may not be dense enough to afford the necessary braking power. That we'll find out. Open up the pilot's cabin, Doc. I'm going in. You've been listening to episode six of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan and the crew of rocket ship Luna took off from the moon, intending to return to the Earth. But on the far side of the moon, which they were photographing prior to heading for home, they saw a number of strange spacecraft which took off and pursued them. Then Jet and his crew lost consciousness to awake and find that they'd left the solar system entirely and were hurtling through space at an unimaginable speed. After a little while, they noticed that the ship had slowed down. And then there appeared on the televiewer screen an image of a planet which they were rapidly approaching. You mean you're going to attempt a landing on it? Why not? If we're going to die anyway, it might as well be on that whatever it is, is out here in nothing. Landing procedure will be the same as it would have been for landing on Earth. With the aid of the atmosphere? How else? But it may not be dense enough to afford the necessary braking power. But we'll try it just the same. Open up the pilot's cabin, Doc. I'm going in. Okay. Mitch, get to the radar. And let me stay with the televiewer. Pilot cabin door. Contact. Hey, Jet. Yes, Lemmy? Look at this. What? Oh, see it? Sort of brilliant reflection at the top, like custard over a Christmas pudding. Ice. Hey? Eh? An ice cap. Like the north and south poles on the Earth, but bigger, much bigger. Seem to be a lot of cloud areas. Thick, too. Yes, all to the good. At least that indicates that there's moisture down there. Water? I hope so. Well, that's peculiar. But uh, most fortunate. So far as I can calculate, we're about 17,000 miles above the surface of that planet. Uh Uh-huh. And our speed is approaching 10,000 miles per hour. And that's exactly what our height and speed would have been now if we were approaching the Earth after taking off from the moon. Except that it would have taken us more than four days to get this far instead of just an hour or so. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Mitch? Yes. Estimated distance of surface is 17,000 miles. Speed, 10,000 miles per hour. What? That's just what it would be if... If we were approaching Earth, I know. I just explained that to Doc. Yeah, I suppose this couldn't be the Earth, could it? How could it? Well, it seems to have land and water and clouds and ice caps. But the ice caps on Earth are nothing like the size of that one. Get to your posts and stand by for landing procedure. Yeah, okay, Okay, Jeff. Right, I'll try to estimate our acceleration rate and... Hey, listen. Huh? Oh, it's here again. That music... Those ships must be around somewhere. Yeah, I can hear it too. Yes, so can I. Jet, do you hear it? Yes, Doc. Can you see them? Are they out there? No, I can't, but my view's limited. I can't see behind. Stern view. Switch on the stern view. Stern view? On? There they are. Are they going to try and turn us away from here too? Ruin our only chance? Can you see them? Yes, Jet. They're directly behind us. Why don't they leave us alone? Jet, you better come out of that cabin quick. If we're going to accelerate again, the pressure could break your neck. I'm on my way out. Doc, let me get to your bunks. Lie down. Yeah, they ain't catching me this time. Are they still there? Yeah, look. Well, get onto your bunk, Mitch. Yep. If nothing has happened by the time we're close enough to that planet to go into orbit, we'll go. Ships uh, or no ships. Yeah, well, I'll keep checking our speed. Let you know when we have to take action. Well, they're still there. Hey, what the... 
Mm. Our speed, it, it's just the same. It isn't increasing at all. But it must do. The gravity pull of that planet must be drawing us down towards it. The speed must increase. I tell you, it's not yet. It's still 10,000. It hasn't changed since the last check. What is going on? And how can they do it? Beats me. They must have control over powers we don't even know exist. They're coming in closer now, and fast, too. Eh? Yeah, look at them. Just like before, as though they were going to attack us. And why don't they get it over with? Hey, something's happened. Gravity's returning. Can you feel it? I don't know. It's not quite like that. It's a, a kind of... Well, the pressure seems to be outward towards the wall. Yes, and getting stronger. Hang on. Get your backs to the wall if you can. Oh, I'm trying. I, oh, I can hardly move. Oh, oh. Everybody all right? Anybody black out? Uh, not me. No. Not me. Hey. Hey, they've gone. There's no sign of them. What? Look for yourself, Jet. I can't see... Yeah, wait a minute. What's that? At the bottom of the screen. It's a light. Some kind of light. Look, it's rising higher. It's the planet. We've already broken through its atmosphere and we're traveling parallel to its surface. But if we're that close, we must be falling towards it as well. We're likely to crash. Get to the radar, Mitch. See if you can estimate our height. And, Doc, uh, open up the cabin again. Right. We'll probably hit the ground so hard it'll take a month to dig us out. As soon as Mitch has got the facts and figures, let me have them over the intercom. You bet. Good heavens. What is it, Jeff? The wings, they're red hot. The whole ship must be glowing. We must have entered the atmosphere at about 15,000 miles an hour. And we can't be doing much less than that now. Hello, Jet. Estimated height, 50 miles. Speed, 14,500. Right, I'll hold it at 50 miles high. The atmosphere's resistance will keep slowing us down, and at least with a right way up and on a steady course. Where are we now? Just over the ice cap. Let's hope we don't have to land on the ice. We'll be well on our way towards the equator before we're anywhere near slow enough. Meanwhile, you'd better convert the couches to sitting position. As soon as you've done that, train the televiewer on the surface directly below us. Between us, we can select a good landing place, if there is one. Estimated height, 15 miles. Speed, 750. Check. Well, we seem to have left the ice behind. Passing over water now. Can you see any land yet? No, I can't. Well, there is plenty. There's plenty of sea, too. Hey, I can see land now. I think slightly to port. I'm going to turn, head towards it. What's it look like? Flat or what? I can't tell from here, but you'll soon be able to see for yourselves. Height, 30,000. Speed, 180. Check. Oh, blimey. Don't look very friendly, does it? About as good a spot for landing as the Himalayas. Well, what if it's all like this? The planet of mountains. They stretch clear to the horizon. Oh, meanwhile, we're losing speed and height with every second. And nothing but rocks, not even a tree. Probably don't even grow here. Perhaps nothing grows here. We're losing height rapidly, Jet. And speed, too. We can't keep going much longer. Then we'll cut in the motor. I lift our nose and gain height. Right, Jet. Look, just a short burst on low power. Let me know when you're ready. We'll get it up to 500. Stand by. Standing by. Contact. Contact. Speed 120. 130. 140. Yes. Then take a look at the country below us. Tell me what you think. There certainly seems to be the, some kind of green substance on the valley floor. Is that good? Well, it shows that there's some kind of life can exist down there. Yeah, but it may be the only kind of life. Oh? These mountains are high, Doc. That's about the only kind of life that could survive on them. Maybe there are more advanced forms lower down. If you ask me, this planet is nothing but mountains and sea. Hey, there's a great stretch of flat country ahead. Is there anything growing on it? Well, I can only see it in little patches. There's lots of cloud. If there's anywhere we can land, I think it's there. What? With the clouds obscuring the view? What if it stretches right down to the surface? It doesn't. I can see the ground, I tell you. If we point the nose down, we could get under that cloud and see what lies below. How about it, shall we try? Oh, why not? If there's any chance of landing, so far as I'm concerned, the sooner the better. Right, here we go. Oh, it's flat, all right. 
Oh, fairly flat. We could make a landing here, couldn't we? Sure we could, if it weren't for that forest. We can't land on treetops. Oh, no sign of any clearing. Not even way ahead? No, but visibility isn't all that good. The cloud's thicker and lower than I thought. Can you keep under it without hitting the deck? I mean, I think so, for some miles anyway. Well, then keep going. We might spot something. Mitch, check the height and speed, will you? Yeah, height, 2,000 feet. Speed, 90. Good. Nothing but trees. We we'll have to rise again. Get above this cloud. Find somewhere else. There's a gap. As if a great area of the forest has been cleared and cultivated. What? And there's a river in front of us, running at right angles to our line of flight. Can you see a place to land? It's raining, absolutely teeming down. Oh, blimey. Can you see a place to land? There are plenty of places, but we're going too fast at the moment. I'll have to circle and keep circling until we've slowed down. We'll be careful. Don't put us down in the river, please. Turning. going to straighten up for the run-in. Is it still raining? Oh, raining buckets full. Visibility's about down to zero. Well, then take it easy. We don't want to hit anything, not at this stage. Coming in now. Right, 1,000 feet. Straight run. 900 feet. Let's hope the ground's firm. 800. You better brace yourselves. Get into your chairs. 700. Come on, Lemmy. It might be quite a shock. <laughs> don't you think I'd know it? Strap yourself 500, in. 500. Doing it. 400. 300. Nearly there. 200. Stand by. 100. Here it comes. Oh, blimey, Jet. Sorry, she bounced. Here we go again. Touching down. Now. What's happening? We're going to crash. I know it. Shut up, Lemmy. Just hold on. Oh, 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 oh. oh. We're down. And all in one piece. We're here. Yes, Lemmy. Heaven knows where we are, but we're here. You all right back there? We're fine, Jed. How about you? Hold on, I'm coming up to the cabin to take a look out. Uh, me too. And me. Come on, then. Not that you can see much with this rain falling. Blimey. I'll say it's raining. Do you suppose it's always like this here? Rains all the time? Well, it just goes to prove that life on other planets must be fundamentally much the same as on Earth. Green vegetation, a river, clouds, rain. Just like home, only much wetter. I wonder if there's any kind of animal life. It must be. Hey. Eh? How else could those plots of vegetation grow like that? What, you mean some kind of animal planted them? Why not? Who ever heard of such a thing? No animal would know how to begin. Wouldn't have a clue. Well, what's your theory? Humans. Only human beings would know how to cultivate. The only type of human beings we can imagine are like ourselves, and we came from the Earth. Ah, yes, but just... According to your theory, there must be human beings here. Oh, well, well if there are, or animals for that matter, with a similar type of intelligence, surely they must live somewhere. Where are their houses? Their cities, even. There's no sign of them. Then what's the answer? Well, maybe their homes are miles from here, and they travel by boat along the river. Do you think that stuff down there is good to eat? Huh? Well, our food isn't going to last forever, Jet. And drink. Can we drink that water? Or will it poison us? Can we breathe the air? Is it air? It may not even be safe to step outside the ship. Gentlemen... I don't know where we are. What planet this is we've landed on or in... Let's get back to the main cabin. We'll draw lots and then one of us will go out and make the test. Hat closing. Let us know when your helmet is fixed and we'll exhaust the airlock, Lenny. Helmet fastened. Over to intercom. Airlock. Exhaust. Suit now inflating. Air pressure zero. All right, Doc. Uh, open the door. Let's get out there. Look, Lemmy, wait a minute. Why not let me go out? No oh, fair. I won the draw, didn't I? Open her up. I'm going out. Take it easy. Just ease the door enough to break the vacuum. Yeah. Let that air, or whatever it is out there, come in as slowly as possible. Right. Main door. 
Stand by. How's that, Lemmy? I don't know yet. She's filling up. You all right, Lemmy? Yes, Jet. How do you feel, mate? Lonely. Pressure nearing maximum? Yeah, the suit, it's gone all flabby. Oh, it will. As the air, or whatever it is, comes in from outside, it'll equalize the pressure. Oh, well, but it'll be a lot easier to move anyway. Maximum pressure. She must be full now. And open the door properly. Let's get out and get this over with. Main door, contact. Put out the ladder, Doc. Ladder, contact. Well, here I go. I'll go round to the ship's nose so you can all see me through the pilot's window. How is it to walk, Lemmy? It's not walking that worries me. It's how long I'm going to be able to. I'm now going round. All right, Lemmy. We'll be watching for you. And good luck. Thanks, Jeff. There he is. He's coming into view. Talk to him, Jeff. Hello, Lemmy. We can see you. Are you all right? I'll tell you in just a few minutes. I'll know one thing. What? I should have brought an umbrella. I'm going to get the air wet when I take the helmet off. Oh, never mind that. Remember what we told you. Loosen your helmet first. If you feel no ill effects, lift it slightly. Take a shallow breath, and if that's okay, take a bigger one. And if it isn't? Then fasten up your helmet, increase your oxygen supply, and breathe deeply. Right. Now, here I go. I'm fastening helmet. Helmet loose. Well, Lemmy, can you breathe all right? Oh, sorry, Jet. I wasn't trying. I, I was holding my breath, but... Oh, I'll do it this time. Remove it helmet slightly. Now. Now, lower your helmet, quick. Too late, it's lowered. How do you feel? Well, it's, it's all right, up to now, anyway. You sure? No, I ain't. It's air, it must be air. The effects might be delayed. Well, I'll have another go now. Take a deeper breath this time. Remove it helmet. Feels all right. Thank goodness for that. No peculiar sensations? No. You're sure, Lemmy? Sure, I'm sure. In fact, I, I think I'll take the helmet right off. No, no wait. Too late. He's done it. <sighs> I, I, I can breathe. Without the helmet, I can breathe. The first good, clean breath of fresh air for nearly a month. Oh, <laughs> air, air, beautiful air. Right, what's come over him? He's dancing. The oxygen content must be too high. It's making him too lively. Or else it's poisonous. Lemmy, put your helmet on, do you hear? <laughs> He's taking his suit off now. Lemmy, what on earth are you doing? I'm going to take a shower. A shower? In the rain. Don't you realize it? It's nearly a month since any of us have had any kind of a bath. But isn't it cold out there, Lemmy? I wouldn't know. To me, it feels oh, like a warm spring day on earth. And now that I'm here, I'm going to make the best of it. Here. Why don't you come in? The water's lovely. Well, why don't we, Jeff? In fact, the idea appeals to me very much. Yeah, let's get out there. We're probably going to be here the rest of our lives. We might as well get used to it. All right, open the hatch, Doc, and let's get out there. Do we take the suits? Suits? What do we need suits for? There's life on this planet. Life very much as we know it. So let's go out and say hello to it just as we are. It is now nearly a week since we landed on this planet and Lemmy left the ship and found the atmosphere breathable. Since then, we have discovered many other things. That the water is drinkable, the temperature is mild, and the rain unceasing. The cultivated area along the riverbanks contains a variety of crops. So far as we can tell, principally a kind of wheat or barley. But whatever it is, it's in the early stages of its growth, which leads us to believe we've arrived during the late spring or early summer. Who or what it is that has cultivated the soil, we have no idea, for with the exception of flights of birds across the dark, cloudy sky, we've seen no living creature since we arrived here. The rations we brought with us from Earth have now almost gone, and Jet, Mitch, and Lemmy, armed with homemade nets and fish hooks, have gone down to the river, hoping to catch some edible fish. Perhaps there is further food to be had in the forest, but until we can be sure what kind of animals live there, we daren't risk entering it. 
Would have been better with some potatoes and peas, but at least we need and starve. Well, not while the weather remains as mild as this. What, do you think it's going to change then? Who knows? This might be just the warm season. If it is, what's the cold season like? How severe and how long? We've got to explore a wider area, find out much more about this place. Yeah, what happens if we meet up with uh, whoever planted those fields outside? I hate to think. I'd feel a lot easier if we had at least one gun between us. Look, can't we make some spears or, or bows and arrows? At least they'd be better than nothing. Have you ever used a spear, Doc? Or a bow and arrow? Well, no, I haven't. I wouldn't know how to begin. Oh, it's marvellous, isn't it? Here we are in a rocket ship, the wonder of our age. Stranded on some unknown planet in the depths of the universe. And when it comes to making a couple of simple weapons to enable us to keep alive, not one of us knows how. Hey, weren't you ever a Boy Scout, Lemmy? No, Jewish lads brigade me. Didn't teach us nothing about bows and arrows. Well, I think it's a problem we're going to be able to solve. We've got good tools. We could use odd bits of the ship to manufacture a few knives, arrowheads or spearheads. We'll soon learn how to use them. We'll have to. Yeah, meanwhile, we can live on fish. At least it's a change from airtight sandwich packs. It's getting dark, Jet. Maybe we'd better close the hatch. Yeah. I'll do it. That's another thing. What is? We're using what power we have left to keep the lights going at night. What do we do when the juice gives out? There are a great many problems we'll have to solve before long. A great many. And one of them is some kind of shelter outside. What for? For cooking, that's what. Having the fire under the ship is all very well, but... I well, keep getting soaked just the same. Well, maybe the rain won't last much longer. Well, I don't see why not. It hasn't stopped since we got there. Well, it's time for me to go into the pilot's cabin and take the watch. <sighs> Who follows me? I do, gent. Well, I'll give you a yell in a couple of hours. Oh, thanks. Oh, I think I'll turn in. Don't suppose I'll sleep, but there's nothing else to do. How about you, Mitch? Yes, yeah, sure, might as well. Me too. At least until I have to turn out again. Hey, Mitch. Mitch, wake up, hmm? Huh? Oh, it's you, Jeff. I was just dozing off. What's wrong? Is there a red princess knocking at the door? The rain, it's stopped. Oh, blimey, didn't wake us up just to tell us that, did you? The sky's cleared, and I can see the stars. Well, what did you expect? But the constellations... Well, what about them? Well, they're the same as we could see from Earth. They can't be. They are, I tell you. Come and take a look for yourselves. You bet we will. Well? Yes, you're right. I can recognise them. Lyra, Cygnus, and the dolphin. There, see... Just the same. In fact, we might as well be on Earth. Not quite the same. Well, how do you mean? Well, look at Vega. Well? I've been watching it for more than an hour, and she hasn't moved from that position. Well, hardly. But the other stars have. Moved quite a distance. They're, they're circling round her. So? But isn't it Polaris, the pole star, that stands still? Yes, it should be. And when we left Earth, Polaris marked the celestial pole. Now, now wait a minute. I, I don't understand. Well, I do. At least, I think I do. Well, what does it mean? Just this. Vega has been the pole star before, and will be again. Every 26,000 years or so, it occupies the place we normally see occupied by Polaris. Yes, but apart from Vega, the constellations are the same as seen from Earth. Yes, and don't you see, only from the Earth, or maybe from some other part of the solar system, would they assume the shapes they do. It means that we must be somewhere within the solar system. Well, that's a comfort. And that's not all. We know that within the solar system, there's only one planet with air, trees, water, rain, and clouds, and the Earth... This can only be the Earth. It is the Earth. <laughs> what? Oh, blimey. And I went through all that performance, testing the air. But if that's true, Jet, how do you account for the constellations being out of position? Why is Vega now the pole star? There's only one possible explanation. We must have travelled here through time. We've landed on the Earth, all right, but at a different time from when we left it. How different? Heaven knows. But my guess is at least 13,000 years. Oh, which way? Forward or, or back? I don't know, Lemmy. I don't know. You've been listening to episode seven of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch, and with David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton.
Journey into space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan and his crew took off from the moon, but instead of returning to Earth as they'd intended, found themselves travelling at an unimaginable speed into the depths of the universe. Then a planet was sighted on the televiewer screen, and a landing was made in a forest clearing. The atmosphere was found to be breathable and the climate bearable, so Jet and his crew, believing they were stranded on the new planet for the remainder of their days, set about making their lives as comfortable as the circumstances would allow. Then, one night, while the rest of the crew slept and Jet kept watch, the sky, which till then had been clouded over, cleared suddenly, and for the first time since landing, Jet caught a glimpse of the stars. Before long, he made a startling discovery. It means that we must be somewhere within the solar system. Well, that's a comfort. And that's not all. We know that within the solar system there's only one planet with air, trees, water, rain and clouds. The Earth. This can only be the Earth. It is the Earth. What? Oh, blimey. And I went through all that performance, testing the air. We must have travelled here through time. We've landed on the Earth, all right, but at a different time from when we left it. How different? Oh, heaven knows. But my guess is at least 13,000 years. Which way? Forward or, or back? I don't know, Lemmy. I don't know. But haven't you any idea? Lemmy, the stars are constantly shifting. And the pole of the heavens is continually moving. Oh, we hardly notice any difference in a lifetime because the movement is so slow. But over a thousand years, the change is quite considerable. Yeah? Five thousand years ago, from 1965, that is, the pole star was Theuban in Draco, as it was when the Egyptians built their pyramids. Well, five thousand years on... The pole star will be a star in the constellation Cepheus. Well, how many thousand years from 1965 before it would be Vega? I've already told you, about 13,000. Wow, that's it then. We've landed back here on Earth either 13,000 years before or after we left it. Well, not necessarily. Hey? It takes 26,000 years for the star that marks the pole to make its complete circuit. 26,000 years between the time it is the pole star and the time it returns to that position. I don't see what you're driving at. How do we know how many times Vega has been the pole star since we left Earth? Blimey, you mean we might have to add 26,000 years to the 13,000 we already got? Depends on how many times the cycle has been completed. But if this is the Earth, it should have a moon revolving round it. Yes, of course. Then where is it? Well, probably it hasn't risen yet. Or else it's already set. Yeah, maybe. Well, perhaps there isn't one. Yeah, maybe we've gone so far back in time, we've arrived here before the moon existed. If this is the Earth, it's a million to one that the moon is still circling round it. We haven't seen it because of the cloud, but we haven't seen the sun either for the same reason. It may yet rise before dawn. If it doesn't, then we're bound to see it one evening soon, just after sunset. If the sky remains clear and we don't see it within a week or so, then we'll know there is no moon and that this is almost certainly not the Earth. How many hours to go till daylight? Uh, four. Well, if you three like to go back to sleep, I'll keep lookout. I still have nearly an hour of my watch left. Not me. I'm not going back to sleep. If that moon's going to rise, I want to see it. Yeah, me too. And me. Arguing only takes us round in circles. Whatever age it is and wherever we are, we have to live. Of course we do. We must make definite plans for finding out the things we need to know. Well, fortunately, we're fairly well equipped for that. We have the ship's instruments, the telescope, navigational books, a clock, and we can read, write, and figure. First thing in the morning, we'll hold a council and work something out. Agreed? Yeah, right. agreed. Okay, Jack. Then, Mitch, continue the watch, will you? The rest of us will get some sleep. We have now been on this planet, which can only be the Earth, for two weeks. By now, we've gotten used to the idea. Our life is a peculiar mixture of the primitive and the scientific. Mitch spends most of his time observing the heavens... He hopes before long to at least deduce our position. Hey, Jet. Yes, Mitch? Look, I've arrived at something. 
Only I can't believe we can be where my calculations say we are. Well, where, Mitch? In the Mediterranean, right smack in the middle of it. You quite sure, Mitch? Well, it doesn't follow that what was or will be water in 1965 is water now. Well, was the Mediterranean ever known to be dry land? Oh, yes, Lemmy. Well, parts of it anyway. How long ago? Oh, 50,000 years, maybe less, 30 or even 25,000. Oh, well, however you add it up for me, the answer's always near enough to say. That would line up with the ice, too. The fourth ice age was receding then. And what kind of animals were there? Many of the animals that we knew in our age were in existence then. And some, like the mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger, were rapidly dying out. Were there any men? Like us, I mean? Well, it's been estimated that men, not very different from us, have inhabited some parts of the earth for something like 200,000 years. Well, could they have planted those crops? I doubt it very much. Man didn't become an agricultural animal until the dawn of history. Then who did plant them? And where are they? And when they do turn up, what will they do to us? Well, that's something we'll only find out when it happens. Hey, listen. Th that noise again. Yeah. Right? It must be those ships. They must be about somewhere. Let's get to the pilot's cabin quick. Yeah. Yes, see if we on. can see them. Yeah. There they are. Look, miles up. Caught in the sunlight. Where? I can't see them. Where? There, look. In a circular formation. I'm going to the telescope. See if I can get a closer You'll view. You'll have to hurry. Be gone any minute. I got them now. Some of them. They're hovering above us. Yes, but these are bell-shaped. The others were more like donuts. They must be observing us. Well, let them take a good look. And then maybe they'll do something about us. <laughs> what? How should I know? But they've never been short of ideas before, have they? There. I oh, know. They're waiting for us. They're inviting us to join them. What on earth do you mean? Well, when we took off from the moon, they followed. They knocked us right out of 1965 into whoever knows where, didn't they? Well... Well, now maybe they're sorry. Realise they've put us down in quite the wrong place. And they're now willing to take us back again. Ah, but how can they? Why, by the same methods they got us here, I suppose. We take off and they surround us. And bash, we're back where we started on our way home from the moon. Back... In 1965. Yeah, there might be something in that, too. And what are we waiting for? Come and let's get the ship ready. It's not as easy as that. Why not? She can take off, can't she? She might, but I wouldn't like to risk it. Hey? Eh? Every day the undercarriage of this ship sinks a little further into the ground. If we tried to take off under these conditions, we'd just tip up on our nose, that's all. Well, couldn't we dig the wheels out, make some kind of runway for her? Just the four of us? Well, it can't hurt to try. Anything's better than staying here for the rest of our lives. With all the people and friends we ever knew, not even born yet. Look, Lemmy, if we got this ship off the ground, what then? Well, we go into free orbit and wait for them other ships to do something about us. Uh, look, Lemmy, this ship isn't big enough to take off and reach free orbit. Not from the Earth, she's not. She needs a booster stage full of fuel, and we haven't got one. And no hope of ever getting one. Oh. Yeah, but with the power them ships have got, perhaps we don't even need to go that high. Maybe all we need to do is take off. They'll do the rest. Nah, it's not worth the risk. Well, let's at least take a vote on it. We took a vote on landing here. You don't want to? None of you? Oh, you, you can't want to stay here for the rest of your lives with, with mammoths and things trampling all over your backyard. Look, look, Lemmy, the only thing we can depend on this ship for now is to get from one part of this globe to another, like it was a, an aeroplane. She'll never travel through space again. Well, then why can't we do just that? Go to England, at least, or London, maybe. Almost certainly the whole of Britain, at least as far down as the Thames, is ice-covered, frozen solid. Oh, that noise, it stopped. They must have gone while we were talking. There's no sign of them. Oh, I didn't think I'd ever be sorry to see him go. Well, maybe I'd better start cooking the fish. It is my turn, isn't it? Yes, Lemmy. And cheer up. This may not be as bad as it looks. I hope it's not as bad as you look, or as bad as any of us look. I'll just resign myself to the fact that I've got to learn to be a caveman and like it. <laughs> things considered, I don't think this need be such a bad life. You think so, Lenny? Well, it could be one long holiday. We're not responsible to anybody but ourselves. We might even start off a, an entirely new kind of civilization. We might. But there'll be nobody to carry it on. Eh? Oh. No, there won't, will there? Let's get some sleep, shall we? It's your turn for first watch, isn't it, Mitch? Yep. Lemmy follows me. Don't. Yeah? 
About what Jet just said. Well? If I hung this over my bunk, would it matter? What is it? It's a photograph of Becky. <laughs> well, why should it matter? Do you know, Doc, I, I never did tell her where I was going, but <laughs> she soon found out once we landed. My picture was in all the papers. Me, Lemmy Barnett, one of the first men on the moon. Yeah, now look at the mess we're in. There's her picture, and as far as I know, she ain't even born yet. No. Then how can I have her picture, then? Doc, do you think that she is alive? I mean, at the same time as we are. You know, everything going on at once, like the pages in a book. I don't quite see what you mean. Well, suppose you've got a book, and you're just sitting down to read it. Yeah. And you begin in chapter one, and start plowing your way through, don't you? Uh-huh. Well, you can't reach chapter seven until you've read the first six chapters. But that doesn't mean chapter seven doesn't exist. You just not, haven't reached it yet. Sure. Well, couldn't time be like that? The normal thing is to start at the beginning and go on. But I suppose it is possible to skip a few pages or even turn back a few. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. Well, maybe that's what's happened to us. Somebody's taken us right out of the page where we belong and planted us on an earlier one. But the other pages are still there. Like Henry VIII is marrying his sixth wife <laughs> on the proper page. And Becky is there. And so are we, taking off for the moon, or just preparing to. It all depends on what page you are and what part of it you happen to have reached. And we must be careful if we ever get back to our correct page, as you call it, that we don't run into ourselves. Yeah, eh? I think we'd better get some sleep, Lemmy. We've got enough problems without worrying about the true nature of time. Yes, Doc. Wait, listen. What's that? If you say it's mice, Lemmy, I'll sock you one. This is no time for joking. Is the main door open, Lemmy? Yes, Jack. Then close it, quick. Main door, contact. <laughs> ah, shutting it seems to have frightened them away. We'll wait. Keep your ears open and, and listen. How long is it since that knocking stopped? Must be an hour at least. Do you think they've gone away? Well, if not, they seem to have lost interest in us. Well, I think there's nothing out there. But I won't be happy until I know for certain. No, neither shall I. Let me open up the main door. Uh, now, wait a minute, Jet. There's no need for us actually to step outside. We can see all we need from the door itself. And there's nothing out there? Not that we could see from where we were, only some very strange tracks. Heavy enough for a, a tank to have left. Well, this proves it's not the pass we're in. Well, why not? Well, how could it be? If we'd landed on Earth thousands of years back in time, would we see any tanks? Not to mention spaceships flying around all over the place? Well, it's not likely, is it? We must be in the future. That tank was probably driven by one of our descendants. I must say the future has been in my mind all along. Those crops out there, healthy and flourishing, with no one to attend them. The ships appearing. And now this. If we were in the past, these things couldn't be. Why not? Our ship's here, isn't it? Oh, yes, but that's... Uh, it... Oh, now I'm getting all confused. Look, if you're absolutely sure there's nothing out there, let's go to bed. We'll have plenty of time to chew over all this in the morning. Yeah, it's a good idea. Whose watch is it? I was to follow Lemmy. Yeah, how about the door? Don't we close it again? I don't think there's any need, Lemmy. The um, hatch will be sufficient. We must conserve the power. Right. Uh, what's the matter? Shh, shh, shh. Eh? Mitch and Doc are asleep. I, I don't want to wake them. I need to sleep, too. Lemmy, I want you to help me. What at? I want to go outside. Out? What for? You got the wanderlust or something? No, I just want to take a closer look at those tracks and look all around the ship. Well, why can't you wait till morning? By then, that thing might be back again, and we won't be able to get out. Ah, now I know why you didn't want me to shut the main door. Open it up again would wake up Mitch and Doc. You should be a detective. Well, what do you want me to do? Oh, nothing much. I want you to stay at the door when I go out. And then? That's all. Keep a sharp lookout while I'm looking round. If you see anything, you can warn me. Give me a chance to get back into the ship. You sure you know what you're doing? No, but I know what I want to do. And I know you're cracked as... I'll get a flashlight. Open the hatch by hand and don't make any noise. Yes. All right, Lemmy. Take the flashlight, will you? Hey, about time you got back, you had me worried. Oh, never mind that. Now, close the hatch quietly, and then go back to bed. There's no need for the soft-footed stuff. Oh. We're not asleep. Hello, Mitch. 
How, how long have you been awake? Long enough. Doc, too? Yes, Jeff. Look, what's going on? Where have you been, both of you? If you must know, Lemmy's been as far as the door, and I've been outside. Outside? But look, it was agreed that nobody would go out until morning. No harm's been done. Yeah, but it could have been. Oh, don't see how. Well, supposing neither of you'd come back. There's Doc and me fast asleep with the main door and hatch wide open. Nothing has happened to either of us. And you weren't asleep anyway. I was standing by to shut the door if necessary. Mitch is right, just the same, Jet. If we make a plan, we should stick to it. You should have stayed on watch. Well, anyway, now you have been. What more do you know? Well, that machine definitely came from the forest. The tracks circle the ship a couple of times and then lead back to the forest again. Is that all you discovered? Mm, Not quite. What else, then? This. What is it? Have a look at it. You tell me. (laughs) A piece of stone. Is that all it means to you? What else? Doesn't its shape tell you anything? Feel the weight and balance of it in your hand. Well? Hmm. If it wasn't that it's so unlikely, I'd say it was some kind of weapon. Eh? Isn't this a handle? And and look at the edge, sharp like a razor. And the point at the end. It's some kind of dagger. Or a knife. Let me see it. Look at the polish on it. Somebody made that thing and dropped it near the ship sometime after we came in last night. How'd you know? Because that's where I found it, near the fire. Right in the very place where I was sitting. If it had been there then, I'd have noticed it, wouldn't I? Uh, It's some kind of knife, all right. Let me have another look. Well? Yeah. I've never seen one like this before. Except in history books. How do you mean, Doc? For thousands of years, men made just this kind of weapon. Certainly in Europe and the Mediterranean regions, even the ancient Egyptians used them. Or knives like this, until they discovered the use of metal. You mean this is a relic from the Stone Age? Yeah, that's just what I mean. But it's in such darn good condition. Precisely, Mitch. But that would suggest that out there, outside the ship... There are men or or some kind of animals who who use stone knives, who belong to a stone age. Why not? We might have landed anywhere in time. Maybe we're in two ages at once, forward and back. But look, that presupposes two entirely different civilizations existing together. One extremely advanced with with machines and spaceships, and the other as primitive as prehistory itself. Well, I don't know what to make of it. I only know that knife was outside. Well, we may get to the bottom of it someday. Meanwhile, it must be nearly dawn. If we're to keep alive, we've got lots of things to do. Yeah. Uh, Lemmy, you better get started. Right. Boil up some water. I'll see to cooking the fish. Okay, Jet. Maybe we can get round to making some stone weapons ourselves and kill us some meat for a change. How'd you like your coffee, Doc? Just as it is, Lemmy, thanks. Sorry there's no sugar in it. That's okay. And I'm sorry there's no milk. <laughs> Don't let it worry you. And I'm even sorrier there's no coffee in it. Water never did anybody any harm. Hurry up and get it done, Doc. We'll be going outside in just a minute. You're not going into the forest, are you? No, not yet, Lemmy. We'll go along the river bank. What happens if you run into trouble? How do we know? We'll take the personal radios with us and keep in constant contact with you. I only hope the batteries stand up to it. There can't be much juice left in them now. We'll take two radios, but only use one and keep the other in reserve. And what if that machine comes back? We can't stay locked up in here forever. We, we've we got to know what lies beyond the horizon. Night men or no, machines or no, spaceships or no. Ah, oh, I think you'll have to stay here a bit longer. What do you mean? Well, listen, can't you hear it? Eh? They're here again. Probably got the ape men with them this time. Quiet, listen. Ah, that's it, all right. The same old noise. Let's get over to the cabin, see if we can see them. Well, that's put paid to a nice quiet morning's fishing. It's getting louder. Very loud. They must be directly over it. Mitch, open up the cabin for heaven's sake. I'm trying to, Jed. It doesn't work. Lemmy, the televiewer. Yeah. See if that does. Televiewer, on. Yes. Yes, it's working. But there's no picture. It's gone haywire. Give it a chance to warm up. It's true. They must be right outside. For heaven's sake, what's happening? What are they doing to us? Oh... Oh, that's better. I thought the old ship was going to shake herself to pieces. Uh, Televiewer still seems to be working. But that noise has stopped. It's clearing. And the picture's getting sharper. Is there anything out there? Can you see anything, Doc? Uh, no. No, I can't. Rotate the camera. Go on, Lemmy. Yes, Jet. Always supposing she will. Ah, yes, she does. Even after that shaking up. Now, Doc, let's look. Let's all look. Hey, hold it. Stop. What is it, Mitch? There. Another of those donut-shaped ships we saw on the moon. Like the one I went into. Keep her rotating. Let me see if we can see any more. Yes, Jet. Rotate in. No, that, that's all there seemed to be. Just one of them. One ain't enough yet? Well, turn the camera on it. Let's take a look at it. Right. Oh, there she is. 
We all know what happened before. Yes, and it's not happening again. I'm not going out there and getting into that ship. The last time I did it, you all accused me of saying things I'd never even dreamed of. And then the thing was about to take off with me in it. Hey, well, wait a minute. What? Look at the dome of that ship. It's opening, just as it did before. What in heaven's name are they up to now? And now that ladder's coming out. Yeah, just like it is an invitation for us to go in there. If it is, we're not accepting. Maybe this time... I've heard anything at all. Yeah, who knows what'll happen this time. At least it's worth a try. Yes, here you are, Jet. Here's the omits. Do we put them on now? Uh, yes, put them on and turn them on, all of you. And then listen, see huh? if you hear anything. Um, hey, Jet, I can hear something. Yes. Well, is that all we get? That's nothing new. Hello, Luna. Blimey. That is... Quiet, Lemmy. But it was a voice. A human voice. And it came over the radio. It came from there. There's somebody or something in that ship. <laughs> You've been listening to Episode 8 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Also taking part was David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. After taking off from the moon, Jet Morgan and the crew of rocket ship Luna landed back on the Earth some thousands of years before or after they left it. All efforts to determine at what period of time they'd landed were useless, for besides sighting other spaceships, which hovered overhead as though observing them, and seeing a strange machine which came out of the forest one night and returned before dawn, Jet had found a stone knife near their campfire. The evidence seemed to suggest that they had landed at a period of time when there existed on Earth not only a super-civilization, but also a very primitive one. And then, early one morning, the strange music which had been heard so often before was heard again. Jet turned on the televiewer to find that outside the ship, another spaceship had landed, identical with the one that Mitch had seen and entered on the moon. Jet decided to try and contact it by radio. Hey, out, Jet. Here's the old Mitch. Do we put them on now? Yes, put them on and turn them on, all of you. And then listen, see if you hear anything. Yeah, mine's on. Yes, so's mine. Chet, I can hear something. Yes. And it's getting louder. Oh, well, is that all we get? That's nothing new. Hello, Luna. Blimey. That is... Quiet, Lemmy. A human voice. It came over the radio. It came from there. There's somebody... Or something in that ship. And whatever it is, it speaks English. Wouldn't it be rather awkward if I didn't? Oh, yes, I suppose it would. Who are you? What do you want? We only want to help you. How? It is not safe for you to remain where you are. Well, it's a pity you didn't think of that before you planted us down here. Quiet, Lemmy. We don't know who you are or, or what you want of us. All we ask of you is to leave your own ship and enter out. Enter yours? No harm will come to you. You needn't be afraid. We're not afraid, just cautious. You speak for yourself, mate. We can help you if you want us to, but you must do as I say. Are you anything to do with that ship we saw on the moon? Yes, we are. Then who are you? Leave your own ship and come in here. You come in here. Why don't you show yourself? 
We cannot show ourselves. Why not? Hey, are you invisible? Hey, are you? No, but I am not in this ship. What? What are we going to do about this? Stay where we are, of course. It'd be balmy to go out there. Well, not necessarily. What? Well, no harm came to you, Mitch, in that ship on the moon. Well, I wasn't conscious of anything strange going on, but, but if all of us go into that ship, who knows what might happen? I think we should find out more about this before we even set foot outside. I quite agree, a lot more. I'll talk to him. Hello, whoever you are. I can hear you. Then you must know how we feel. I know exactly how you feel. We know how we felt when we first saw you. But we have no intention of harming you. Can you prove that? Have we harmed you up to now? Oh, no. Apart from knocking us right out of our own time into heaven knows where, you haven't harmed us at all. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Then go ahead. Well, in the first place, have you anything to do with our being here now? Possibly. That's a great help. And how about that perishing music we keep hearing? Is that anything to do with you? Music? Yes, music. What is music? You do you don't know what music is? No. Wow. Music is it's a kind of noise. It, it sort of it goes up and down. And uh, when you hear it, well, it makes you feel good. It, except your music, that makes you feel dreadful. A noise, you say? Yes, a peculiar kind of noise. Like this? Yes, that's it. That's it, exactly. That noise has been dogging us ever since we left Earth. And whenever we hear it, something always happens to us. What is it? What did you do? All I did was turn on the power. The power that drives your ship? The power that drives everything. But what kind of power is it? What other power is there? Look, look, how, how do you generate it? What do you mean? Where do you get this power from? It exists everywhere. It covers the whole universe. All you have to do is use it. Like the heat from the sun. It's there. Already. For anybody to use. Good grief. If, if only I had that secret. If only man had that secret. What couldn't he do? Man. What is man? What? Aren't you a man? I don't think so. Aren't you like us? Don't you look like us? No. We are very unlike you. Well, what are you like? You'll find out. If you come into this ship... Oh, no, not yet. We need to know a few things more first. Go ahead. It was you on the moon, wasn't it? Well, one of our ships. Weren't you in it? No. Then where were you? Exactly where I am now. You mean those ships on the moon were some kind of reconnaissance craft? You might call them that. And did you send them specially to look for us? No, we didn't. We were very surprised to find you there. Not half so surprised as we were to find you... Then where are you from? From the other side of the universe. That's what Mitch told us, remember? Leave your own ship and come into ours. Look, will you give us a few minutes to talk this thing over? Certainly. Can we call you back? There is really no need. I can't go away. Then you don't mind if we switch off our radios. We have to conserve power. When you call, I will ask. Switch off your sets, all of you. Yeah, all right. uh, that's mine. Well... What do you make of that? We must go out there, do as he says. Now, wait a minute, Mitch. But why? He says we'll come to no harm, and none of us ever has, yet. Yeah, but it don't mean to say we won't, does it? Just think what we could learn from those, uh, whatever they are. Why, even to have the secret of the motive power of their ships would be worth the risk. I think we should go, do everything he says. Well, what do you think, Doc? Well, in many ways, I agree with Mitch. But if they can help us, as they say they can, why can't they do it here and now? Why do we have to go into their ship? And... If we do, where will they take us? That's what worries me. Well, it's something we could ask about. Well, go on, then. See what he says. I will, in good time. Let's see if we've anything else to ask first. I don't care what you ask. I want to go. If you three haven't the heart for it, then you can remain behind. If anybody goes, we all go. This is one time I think we should all stick together. But who knows what might happen to this ship if we go off and leave it? If anything catastrophic is going to happen, do you think one or two people remaining here will prevent it? No, I don't suppose so. Blimey, get to hear you talk. You think you were as keen to go as Mitch? Well, perhaps I am. I want to get to the bottom of this. Find out who controls that ship, where he comes from, where he is now. And if he is anything to do with our being in this awful mess. And if he is? Then we have a good chance of persuading him to get us out of it again. Now nah, you're talking sense. Well, we might at that, I suppose. Well, we'll put it to the vote. Do we go or not? Yeah, we go. Doc? 
If you and Mitch agree, then I'll string along. Oh, there's no need to ask me. You've got your majority, ain't you? Right, then. Switch on that radio, Lemmy. Yes, Chet. Radio on. Hello? Hello? Yes? If we enter that thing, what will happen to us? It will take off. With you in it. Where to? Not very far. Well, why do we have to go there in your ship? It would take you a long time to walk. But why can't you come to us? Why do we have to come to you? It is safer. You are in great danger where you are. We want to protect you from it. What kind of danger? Look, why bother with all this? If we're going, let's go. Quiet, Mitch. We'll go when I'm good and ready. But this is just a waste of time. I said be quiet. Oh, all right. You have your natter, but do hurry up. Tell me one thing more. Yes? This danger you talk of, is it a threat to us personally or to our ship? I don't think your ship is likely to come to any harm. But you probably will. And very soon. Now, come on, Jet. He couldn't say much more, could he? It's better all around that we should go. And if it isn't? If you don't like where we shall take you, you can always return. All right. Give us a few minutes to get ready and, and we'll come. And bring your radios with you. What for? So that we can talk to each other. They are our only means of communication at the moment. Very well. We'll bring them. I'll call you again when we're outside. There's no point in just standing here looking at it. Let's go in. Lemmy, what are you doing? Oh, just making sure this thing's solid. That the old thing isn't just a dream. It's solid, all right. And there's the door open and the ladder extended. Oh, we'd better not all go in at once. I'll go first. Now, keep your radios on, and if it's okay, I'll tell you. All right. All right. All right. Take your time, Jet. Have a good look round before you actually go in. Radio on. Now climbing ladder. You can hear every sound. It's like the old ship. It's a great transmitter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Jet. What can you see? Nothing. Nothing? Well, no more than Mitch did. Seems to be the same kind of ship exactly. With the octagonal panels round the wall? Yes. And the row of buttons above each one. Uh, certainly seems nothing to worry about here. I'm going inside. Now. Well, I'm in. Inside the cabin or whatever it is. And you don't feel peculiar or, or anything? No, quite normal. I think you might as well come up, all of you. Okay, here we come. Well, what do you think? Nothing here that tells us anything. What can all those panels mean? Why are they all different colors? And what are all them but that thing? Did any of you notice any crack in the floor to show there was a panel just there? Not me, Jet. Well, if they all fit as well as that one, we're not likely to. Yeah, for all we know, the floor is full of sliding panels, all circular like that one. Well, if it is, none of them seems to be opening. Here, yeah. do you think old, um, whatever he is, he's down there? Well, he said he wasn't in this ship, didn't he? Yeah, maybe he ain't, but a couple of his mates might be. Why do you stand there? Why don't you go down? Into that hole? Unless you do, the ship won't take off. Well, why can't it take off with us up here? It can, if you wish. But you'll find it most uncomfortable. Oh. Do you prefer to stay where you are? I prefer to get out altogether. That can be arranged. If you really want to. Yes, I do. And the quicker the better. Does that go for all of you? No, wait a minute. Yes? Would you let us out again if we asked you? Of course. We don't wish you to do anything against your will. You entered this ship quite voluntarily. You can leave it again whenever you like. Then we'll stay. There, now, wait. I said it, we'll it. stay. Yes, Jet. What do you want us to do now? Go down into the lower cabin, and the hatch will close. And then? The ship will take off and bring you here. Where you are? Yes. All right, gentlemen. I'll lead the way. Yeah, but it's so dark down there. It... Hey! Hey, look! A light came on, and there's a ladder leading down. Well, go on, Jet. I don't think there's anything to be scared of. Not in here, anyway. You want to bet? All right. Here I go. After you, Mitch. It's okay, Doc. Hey, Lemmy, come on. Yeah, I'm coming. Uh, this ain't a thing I want to rush into. Go on, Lemmy. Nothing will harm you. Oh, Lemmy now, is it? 
Well, I'm going, ain't I? Then why do you hesitate? Your friends are already down. Come on, Lemmy, what are you doing? I'm coming. Go on, then. Here. How do you know what I'm doing? Can you see me? Of course. But how? You say you're not even here. How do you look around your ship without going outside? Well, through the tele... Oh, all right. You win. Jet, here I'll come. Well, come on, then. What's this, the bargain basement? Here. That panel's closing again. He said it would. Wow. This is really something, isn't it? Where does the light come from? Eh? Well, where does it? There, there are no lamps of any kind that I can see. It's like the walls are glowing, a sort of super-diffused lighting. It's those octagonal panels again. It seems to come from there. And and what's this? Some kind of control table, I'd say. What else can it be? You think that all those buttons in the upper cabin would be controls too, then? Well, why not? Well, I'd say they were more of a decoration. Now, look, the way this ship's designed, I doubt if there's a single thing in it that doesn't serve a practical purpose. This is a control panel of some kind, I'd swear it. But why have a control panel in a ship that's remote controlled? Maybe it isn't all the time. Our own ship was remote controlled for the takeoff from Earth, but we've handled it ourselves ever since. But if this ship is ever manually operated, wouldn't there be seats or something for the crew to sit on? Yeah, you would have thought so. Well, this cabin's virtually empty. No provision for the comfort of a crew anywhere. All seats and such like could be folded back into the walls and, and released only when needed. Maybe the buttons on this panel operate some of those very things. No, no Mitch, don't touch them. <laughs> you don't think I'm crazy, do you? Yeah, now, if this is a remote-controlled ship... Well? Would them others be crew carriers? Which others? Well, the ones that came and gave us the once over yesterday, the, the bell-shaped ones. Well, they might at that, Lemmy. They were certainly different from this, and much bigger, too. Hey, well, what's this? What? Uh, this thing. A sphere, about a foot in diameter. And what's it made of? Some kind of glass or highly polished plastic or something. I wonder what's inside it. And what it's for. Funny place for it to be, too. Right in the center of the cabin. Why a sphere? Well, I don't think that's very surprising, really. Well, how do you mean? Well, the whole ship seems to be built to a spherical or circular pattern. The thing itself is round, like a donut. The roof is a dome. The hatch is circular. And but for the flat floor, this cabin is spherical. And even the control panel, if it is a control panel, is disc-shaped. Everything is curved. How about those octagonal panels in the walls, Jeff? Yeah, they intrigue me more than anything. I bet the whole secret of how this ship works and the power it uses lies behind there. Oh, the whole ship is certainly of a most unusual design. So simple. I'll bet it works in the same way, if we only knew how. Well, why don't we try to find out? We've got the chance. Let's take a good look round, examine everything in sight, see if we can find the slightest clue as to how this thing might function. Yeah, right. Yeah, good right. idea. take long, did it? How could it? There's hardly anything to see. It's the same wherever you look. Well, it makes it difficult to keep any sense of direction, doesn't it? One walk round this cabin and you don't know whether you're coming or going. Yeah, like when you wake suddenly in the night and look for the window, only to find it in the wrong wall. Yeah, except that here, yeah, there aren't any windows. Well, there aren't any in our ship, either. But at least we got an air conditioner. Well, there must be something of the sort here. Then where is it? Well, there must be some kind of air supply, Lemmy, else how could we breathe? That's what's worrying me. I think we're just using the air that came in when the door opened. But as soon as that's gone, we've had it good and proper. No, no, that can't be. The air seems quite fresh. It certainly hasn't got any hotter. At least I haven't noticed it. Me neither. But there must be some kind of supply coming from somewhere. Well, if there is, it'd be a kind that the fellows who built this ship could breathe, wouldn't it? Of course, Lemmy. And how do we know that that, uh, whatever it is, won't poison us? No, I don't think they can be all that different from us, Lemmy. Or how could they exist on the Earth at all? Look. We haven't seen anybody yet. All we've done is hear a voice. He may not even be on the Earth. Might be on Mars or Venus or somewhere. Well, I doubt if he's that far away. Yes, but Lemmy has a point there. They may be very different from us, exist in quite a different way. Well, he said he was unlike us, didn't he? Well, it is possible, of course. I think it's more than just possible. Look at this place. But for that oversized football and a control panel, this cabin is completely empty. No seats, no couches, no food, no water, no nothing. Here. Perhaps they don't exist physically at all. Then how come they need physical ships? 
Why build them in the first place? Oh, just because they build them don't mean they've got a fly in them. Any more than a meteorologist flies in a weather balloon. But supposing they do fly in them, that they have some kind of physical shape, they may be much tougher than us. Perhaps high acceleration doesn't affect them at all. Maybe that's why they can fly so fast, maneuver so easily. If they start throwing this thing around the way they do their other ships, they'll probably kill us all. Yeah, but do they realize that? Do they know exactly how much the human body can stand? Look, Jet, I think we'd better try and contact them. Make sure they do realize just what kind of creatures we are. Yeah, tell them, uh, take it easy. Tell them we're weak, very weak. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Try him again, Jet. Hello? Hello, crew of Luna calling, can you hear me? Hello? The radio seems to be dead, I can't hear a thing. Well, I can. Eh? Yes, I can, that music. Not quite the same as before, but I can hear it. Yes, so can I. There's some kind of pressure building up. Can't you feel it? Yeah. Yeah. We must be taking off. We are taking off. This ship's on the move in a vertical climb. Hello. Hello. Blimey, we'd be squashed flat. I know it. Hello. Hello. Pressure's getting stronger. Look, we better lie down, all of us. What, on the floor? Yeah, where else? With no shock absorbers to protect us or anything? Lie down, Louis. All of you, lie flat. Oh, dear. Pressure seems to be less now. Yes. We must have stopped climbing. Yeah, but we haven't stopped moving. We've just straightened out, that's all. And I feel fine. Oh, we panicked over nothing. Well, do we get up now or just lie here? Get up, all of you. Uh, uh, if only we could see where we were going. Oh, it's uncanny. Hurtling through the air like this and we don't even know which way up we are. I'll call him again. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? No go? <sighs> Not a peep. You'd better all listen. Maybe my battery's given out or something. Well, in that case, there's no point in you calling him, because he won't be hearing you anyway. Look, I'll try. Maybe I'll have better luck. Hello? Hello? Come in, please. Hello? Hello? No, uh, not a sound. How about you, Lemmy? No, my set's as dead as a door now. Yeah, so's mine. It can't just be the batteries then, can it? They wouldn't all run down at the same time. Well, something's put them out of action. It must be because we're in this cabin. Why? Well, they were working all right before we came down here, weren't they? Yeah, but I don't think that can be the reason. Why not? Well, this has happened to us before. On the moon and out in space. The electrical equipment, the radio especially, is packed in time and again. And always when we've heard that music. Here. Yeah. Didn't that Mr. Mystery say that music happens when he turns on the power that drives his ship? Yes, of course. Whatever force that is, it must set up a powerful magnetic field. One strong enough to neutralize all the equipment in our ship, the radio in particular. You mean that whenever the radio cut, it was because one of those ships was around, flying near us? Well, it's as likely an explanation as any. And the more ships there are, and the closer they come, the, the stronger the effect. Yes, that would account for the fact that nothing worked before taking off from the moon. Ships like this must have been all around us. What else could it have been? I bet the minute that music stops, the radios will work again. I don't know about that, but something's happening here. Hey. This darn fishbowl, it's, it's beginning to glow. And what's the... Hey, there's something appearing on it. Yeah, it, it's a model. A model? What do you mean? It's like those things you see in glass cases in the geological museum. A relief map. Yeah, that's it. A relief map such as I've never seen before, with every tiny detail. But what's it a map of? Country not unlike that we just left. There's the river. Yes. And the cultivated fields along its banks. And the forest, at least a, a part of it. Here. Yeah. Here, yeah, do, do I look all right? Why shouldn't you? I don't look dizzy or anything. <laughs> Not in the sense you mean. Why? Well, if it, if it wasn't that I know it's impossible, I, I'll say that map, or uh, model, or whatever it is, is moving. What? Eh? Yes, it is. At first I thought it must be my imagination. Look. You see that clump of trees? Uh -huh. Well, they weren't there a moment ago. Well, where did they come from? And where'd they go to? The trees on this side are disappearing. Yes. It's like they're going right through the glass, but nothing comes out. Good heavens, I know what that is. A three-dimensional televiewer. Eh? That's not a map at all. 
It's a reproduction of the country we're flying over. But, That's why it's moving. But it looks so solid, Jeff. Oh, it gives that illusion, certainly. But if we broke open the case, I doubt very much if there'd be anything to touch. Wow. What would the TV boys back home give for this? Yeah, but why have it in a glass bowl? One on a screen. Does it matter? This method is probably the best there is for a three-dimensional televiewer. Maybe this is how all three-dimensional receivers should be made. Maybe every telecinema should be constructed this way. What, you mean have the audience sit round the screen instead of in front of it? Well, why not? Could you have anything better than this? It's as though there were an observing hatch in the floor. It's so real. Well, I don't know what kind of people they are that built this ship, but they're way ahead of our time, streets ahead. Blimey, you're right, too. You couldn't be right. What do you mean? Well, look, see? Just coming into view. Streets, a, a city or town or something, down there by the river. Oh, yeah. Right. Is that where the voice is? Is that where we're going? How high do you think we are, Jet? Always supposing that this picture is a true representation of what lies below us. Well, I don't know how much this gadget reduces things, but I'd say about five miles. And it must be a fairly big town. There's still a lot of it coming into the picture. And the houses seem to be built on a spherical principle, too. Yeah, there must be Eskimos. Either that or they're not houses at all. What else could they be? Spaceships, just like those bell-shaped ones that flew over us. Could be. It's not easy to tell from this height. And we're almost directly overhead now. It looks as though we're going to pass them by. Perhaps we're not stopping here at all. Hey, hey, look, down there, see? To one side of the town or whatever it is. More spheres, but much smaller. Yeah, from up here, they look just like toadstools. They must be the ships. That must be a landing or a parking field. Oh, the larger spheres must be houses. Or larger ships. Oh, they could be at that. Well, whatever they are, it doesn't look as though we're going to land there. We're leaving them behind rapidly. Well, then where are we going? Well, how should I know? I'm not the guide on this trip, Lemmy. Well, we might keep going for days, weeks maybe. What do we do? A food and drink? Oh, if we'd had any sense, we'd have brought some with us. How were we to know we'd need it? That voice, whatever he was, he said he wasn't taking us very far. And in any case, he was taking us away from a danger of some kind. If that's true, is it likely that he'd keep us penned up in here long enough for us to starve to death? Well, there's nothing we can do about it now. We can't even call him up, not with the radios out of action. Then what do we do? Wait and hope. At least with this televiewer contraption, we've got something to look at. We can see the kind of country we're traveling over. That's better than traveling in the dark. Falling, we're going down. Well, do they have to be in such a hurry about it? A sudden drop turned my stomach right over. If we continue to fall at this rate, we'll hit the ground with a heck of a crash. And they've got no respect for their own property. No, hold on. What, too? The walls are as smooth as glass. The base of the televiewer. Put your arms round it and bend your knees. Oh, don't have to. There can't be more than a few thousand feet to go. Oh, oh, blimey. They slowed up kind of sudden, didn't they? Oh, I'll have no stomach left at all in a minute. Well, we're going to make a gentle landing anyway. We've made it. We're down. This must be where we change. Change is right. But for what? You have been listening to Episode 9 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer is Doc, and David Williams is Mitch. And with Derek Guyler. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna.
Chet Morgan and his crew left rocket ship Luna and at the invitation of a mysterious voice that spoke to them over their radios, entered the donut-shaped spaceship that had landed near them. Once the strange craft had been boarded and Jet and his companions were settled in its inner cabin, the ship took off. Then contact with the voice was lost, due to the magnetic field which surrounded the ship, neutralizing the spacemen's personal radios. But even though they had lost contact with the voice, they were, with the aid of a three-dimensional televiewer, able to see where they were going and the country they were passing over. Then, almost without warning, the ship began to drop towards the ground. Oh, oh, blimey! They slowed down kind of sudden, didn't they? I'll have no stomach left at all in a minute. Well, we're going to make a gentle landing anyway. Made it. We're down. This must be where we change. Change is right. But for what? We've got to get out first. Or should I say, get let out? Well, I wonder where we are. Well, if we called up that Mr. Mystery, he might tell us. Now that music stopped, the radio should be working. Oh, why don't I keep my big mouth shut? It's the hatch. It's opening. Then come on, what are we waiting for? Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. Don't be in such a hurry. Hey? You can't get out until the outer cabin has been opened, too. Oh. We were trying to call you. I'm sorry. Your radios don't function while the power of our ship is in operation. We found that out for ourselves. Where are we? And what do you want us to do now? First, have a little patience. Now he's lecturing us, like we were kids. In a few moments, the main door of the ship will open and you will be able to go outside. And then? Before you go, I'd like you to look at the televiewer. But it's not working anymore. It switched itself off when we landed. It's warming up. There's a new picture appearing. Hey, what's that? Good heavens. What is it, Doc? Oh, don't you recognize it? I once drew a picture of that. Hey? Yes, on the moon. Don't you remember? It was in the crater. Filled it completely. I saw it on our own televiewer. Yes, that's it. Exactly the same as Doc described. Then what's it doing here on the Earth? Thousands of years before its time. Or after. Well, what's it doing here anyway? So you did see it on the moon. How do you mean? We thought you might have done. You mean you wanted Doc to see it? We didn't mind who saw it, so long as somebody did. Well, you weren't disappointed. And it frightened the living daylights out of us. It's because although Doc saw it on the televiewer, neither Jet nor I saw it outside. Of course not. It wasn't there. What? You merely saw a picture of it. Then it wasn't on the moon at all? No, not on the moon. Well, where was it? Where it is now. Not far from the very spot where you're standing. But what, what's the idea? Why show us pictures of those things anyhow? We were trying to contact you. Show you the things that are common to us. We were trying to make you understand what kind of beings we are. Trying to give you a glimpse of the objects that are common to our lives and existence. Oh, what's common about that thing? Couldn't you have contacted us in some other way? We tried many ways. First, we sent one of our reconnaissance craft to escort you and try to contact you by radio just as I am doing now. Well, there wasn't much point in that. Whenever your ships came anywhere near us, all our electrical equipment packed in. That we discovered, eventually. What other ways did you try? For a while, we concentrated only on you. Oh? Well, how? Once we got you away from your ship and your companions, we tried to transport you to where we were. But we failed. You eluded us. Transport me? In what way? In the way we always transport ourselves in space. Through time. You didn't exactly fail. I did move in time. I'll say he did. He disappeared for an hour or more. Period. Time for me went backwards. I returned to my childhood. I know. At least we know you went somewhere. But not in the direction we intended to take you. You just disappeared. Blimey, you want to be more careful in future then, mate. How did you do it? Do what? Disappear like that. It was very clever. But I didn't do it. Not consciously. You didn't? No. Then you're not so clever as we thought. Anything that happened to me, well, to any of us up there on the moon, was your doing. It must have been. We were giving the credit to you. That's why we've been so interested in you. We thought you had secrets we might learn and use to our advantage. We've been thinking exactly the same thing about you. But you do have things we wish to know about. Your ships and the power that drives them. Your apparent ability to travel through time... Those things are mere theories where we come from in the 20th century. You cannot travel through time? No. Well, not wittingly. We haven't the least idea how we got where we are now. All we do know is that your ships and you had something to do with it. 
Then how do you travel from one part of the universe to another? We don't. We never have. The furthest we ever got was from the Earth to the Moon, and we got back again, but with disastrous results. We don't belong here. This is not our world. It's not ours, either. Then what are you doing here? Thousands of years ago, we began to colonize the Earth. Colonize it? Yes, but we don't belong here. We don't belong anywhere. How do you mean? Our own planet is dead. Gone. Which planet? The one which gave us birth. Where we developed and progressed. But now we can never return to it. Why not? I told you. It is gone. Dead. Then what killed it? Its sun blew up. Hey? Once it was a star like your sun, with planets, life-giving planets, revolving around it. And then it began to expand, became a giant red star of such colossal size that it extended far beyond the orbits of the planets that revolved around it and consumed them. Our home was roasted out of existence. Well, how did you get away? Long before our world began to be threatened by our own sun, we had learned how to travel through space, but only to planets within our own system. When the danger of destruction grew nearer, we were compelled to find a means of escaping from our own planetary system altogether. It was then that we learned to travel through time. But why didn't you travel backwards, back to the time before your sun began to expand? We did. Didn't that solve your problem? How would you like to live yesterday all over again? Do exactly the same things in exactly the same way and be denied the knowledge and experience that the future alone has to offer. Yes. Yes, it could get very dull. We soon learned that the only way was forward, not back. So forward we went, across the universe, looking for a new planet, a home, a place to live, a pleasant, hospitable place, with a young sun and all the elements necessary to life. And you found it? Yes. Here. The Earth. When we arrived here, life was in its early stages, but it had been firmly established. This was the most beautiful, the most hospitable planet we had ever discovered. Warm. Friendly. So you settled here? Yes. And how'd you like it? At first, very much. But now the time has come for us to leave. To wander through the universe hoping to find another planet like Earth. But one that doesn't contain the threat of total destruction, as this does. What, you mean our sun's expanding? It's going to blow up? No. The thing that exists on the Earth now that is about to drive us away. But you will find out soon. Now the door will open and you may come out. Hey, no, no, wait a minute. Jet, Jet, can't he give us some idea of what he looks like first? Yes, Jet, it might be just as well. You never know. Call him. Ask him to show himself on the televiewer at least. It's too late. The door's opening. Answering. Well, why not? There's no music on. He should hear us. Hello, can you hear me? Maybe he doesn't intend to answer. He's probably afraid the sight of him will horrify us so much we won't want to go out. We want to go back. Well, he said we could if we wanted to. We don't have to do anything we're not happy about. But he can't want us to go back, or why should he bring us here in the first place? Yeah, that's what's bothering me. For all we know, the minute we step outside, we'll be pounced on and, and locked up in a cage. Why in a cage? Well, because we're different from him. We interest him. Yeah, I expect these local zoo could make a lot of money with us shut up in it, like a lot of apes. Can't you see them gathering round us and poking us with sticks? Lemmy, we don't even know if they realise what a zoo is, least of all money. Well, all right. As scientific specimens, then. What would our scientists do if they found some kind of animal they'd never seen before, hey? Completely different. They wouldn't give it a banana and send it home, would they? They'd have it all nicely locked up in no time. And it wouldn't matter what the animal felt about it. Yeah, there's something in that, too. Well, we could at least go as far as the door, then see if we fancy going any further. And if we don't, how are we going to take off again and get back to where we came from? Yeah, Doc's right. Whatever we do, we're at the mercy of the voice and his kind. We can't sit here forever, so we might as well go out. All right. We'll go as far as the main door for a start. Right, up you go, Jet. 
Come on, then, Lemmy. Don't hang behind. Oh, I'm coming. No need to get at me. Uh, let's see what we can see from the main door. Land sakes, what's that? It must be a city of some kind. The city of domes. Every one of them exactly like the dome I saw on the moon. Exactly. How can they tell one from the other? They must be houses of some kind. Yes. And it's as if the main part of them is built underground. And only the roofs, the domes, are above. Maybe they live underground, like rabbits. Can you see? Conceal all the joints. I'd swear there was no break anywhere in this wall. Right, let's move on to the next dome. See if that's any different. No, just the same. How many is that we've looked at? Oh, a dozen at least. There are hundreds more, literally hundreds. Curious how everything is curved. Not a straight line to be seen anywhere. Well, let's keep looking. Oh, blimey, what's that? Over there. See it? An animal. It must be old man mystery. Stand still. Don't move. Oh, I don't think it can be him, Lemmy. It's, it's a cat-like creature, but large, very large. Well, let's hope he's had his dinner. Stand still, Lemmy. Don't move. He seems very curious about us. He's not coming any closer. He's just staring at us. Yeah, probably wondering which one of us looks the fattest. Oh, blimey. He's going. Uh, he's going away. And good riddance. Uh, don't move yet. Let him get completely out of sight. Oh, look, what a time to choose to stop and have a scratch. Now shut up, Lemmy. He's off again. Now he's gone. Around one of the domes. Oh, boy. If he'd chosen to attack us, we wouldn't have stood a chance. It would have been easy meat for him. What kind of animal was it? Macarodont and I. Eh? Hey? Uh, Macarodont and I. Oh, that's what I thought it must be. A tiger, saber-toothed. Didn't you see the tusks jutting down from his upper jaw? Oh, is that what they were? Well, that about establishes what period of time we're in. That thing couldn't be in the future. It also establishes that we're not safe out here. That we've got to get back to the ship and quick. Yes, I suppose we'd better. It'll be getting dark soon. And who knows what we might meet. Come on, then. Let's go. Which way are you going? Well, this is the way, isn't it? No, Jeff. This way. Now, wait a minute. Which was the last building we looked at? Well, the one directly behind us. No. That one there, over on the left. Wait a minute. I'm not sure. It could be any of them. There's no way of distinguishing one from another. I swear it's this way. And I'll know you're wrong. It's this way. Now, hold on a minute. we better face it. None of us knows which is the right way. With all these buildings identically shaped, all at equal distances from each other, it's impossible to tell which way we came. And we shouldn't have come so far, not without taking our bearings first. The fact is, we're lost. We don't know which is the way back. I don't think we're getting anywhere near the outskirts of this place. If anything, we're going deeper into it. Well, there's no point in going on any further. We must stop and think this over. Well, how's that going to help? Look, when we came out of that ship, did any of you notice which way the sun lay? Not me. I was too concerned with what we'd find. I didn't even think of it. No, me neither. So we don't even know at which point of the compass the ship is standing in relation to this... this city. And we were fools not to notice. Wouldn't be of much use to us anyhow. The sun's about to set. Well, the stars would have guided us. We don't even know which way we want to go. Or well, maybe if we climbed to the top of one of these domes, we could get high enough to see the ship before it gets too dark. And what do we use for footholds? It'd be like trying to climb a wall of glass. No, <laughs> climbing's out of the question. Then what are we going to do? Stay out here all night with those muck, uh, 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 them tigers, and never knows what walking about and licking their chops? Unless we find a way out of this maze, that's just what we'll have to do. Hello? Hello, Luna. Listen, do you hear anything? What? Listen. Yeah, it's the voice. But where's it coming from? Seems to be coming from the ground. You mean he's under there? Hello, Luna. Hello. No, it's not. It's coming from Lemmy's helmet. Hey? Lift it to ear level. Listen to it. Yeah. Hello, Luna. Can you hear me? It is him. I must have left my radio switched on or knocked it on by accident. Put your helmets on, all of you. Switch on your radios. Hello, Luna. That's better. I wonder how long he's been calling us. Hello, we can hear you. Why didn't you answer me before? We didn't have our helmets on. Our radios are in them. I see. But we've called you before. You didn't answer us. No, we were too busy watching you. Watching us? Do what? Exploring our city. Then it is a city. Yes. Does that surprise you? Many forms of life all over the universe live in communities. Yeah, now then, what's the idea of watching us? Just curiosity and interest in you. See how you would react to what you saw. All we did was get lost. And meet a tiger... Do you know those things are hanging around? Of course. Lots of other animals, too. They often wander through our streets. What, you mean you let them? Why not? They do us no harm. 
And we certainly do them none. But one normally expects a wild animal to attack you. Attack? Yes, attack. Fly at you. Kill you, maybe. Unless you kill him first. The thought never occurred to me. Well, then, how do you protect yourself from such creatures? They never bother us, nor we them. Oh, I see. Here, Chet. They must look more horrible than we thought. Even a saber-toothed tiger scared to go near them. Quiet, Lemmy. Remember, he can hear every word you say. Have you seen enough of the outside of our city? More than enough. We want to get back to that ship where we feel safe. You are afraid? Well, wouldn't you be in our place? I don't think so. Animals are timid. But you have no reason to be. Because unlike the animals, you can reason. Oh, I don't see that that follows at all. It's just because I can reason that I know when to be scared. You must be more primitive, more backward than we thought. Yeah, now there's no need to go getting personal. You told us yourself we were in great danger. That's how you persuaded us to come here, to get out of it. To be in danger is not necessarily to be afraid. Well, no, I, I don't suppose it is. Look, whether we're scared or not, we have no desire to remain here all night. Can you guide us back to the ship? At least we can stay there until morning. If you really wish it, I was about to guide you somewhere else. Where? <clears throat> to me. Oh, is that far? No. Very close. What do you say, Mitch? Shall we go? That's why we left the ship in the first place, isn't it? We could go back there for the night, come out again in the morning. What, and spend the night on a cold metal floor without so much as a blanket between us? I take it you're for going on then, both of you. Yes, dear. I am. All right. What do we have to do? Where do we go? You see the dome in front of you? Yes. Walk round to the other side of it, the opposite side. Just that? Nothing else? No, nothing else. All right, gentlemen. Let's go. Oh, I suppose we know what we're doing. Where can we? we just got to trust to luck, that's all. Well, if you ask me, it's a long chance we're taking. Quiet, Lemmy. Do stop nattering. Well, it's all right for you. You don't know how I'm feeling. I said keep quiet. That's far enough. Just here? Doesn't look any different from the other side. No different at all. Just another dome. Hey, wait. Huh? Look, the wall's opening up. Good heavens. Stand back. Keep away. Lemmy, not that far away. Come back. Don't start to run or we'll only get lost again. It's a door, an octagonal door, just like those panels in the ship. And there's a light behind it, a very strong light. Well, it's wide open now. Yes. Why don't you come in? Well, uh... uh... Do you prefer to spend the night outside? Uh, no, we don't, thank you. We'll come in. Come on, I'll lead. Be careful, Jet. Take a good look round first. It seems safe enough, just a... Passageway leading downwards deep into the ground. Where to? Well, it ain't the Bakerloo line, that's certain. Yeah, it's well lit, too. At least this end is. Seems to be darker further on. Well, let's go. Let's get inside. Yes, Mitch. Uh, come on, Doc. Okay. And you, Lemmy. All right. Well, nothing's happened to us so far. Hey, listen. Well, what is it, Lemmy? Can't you hear? What? Nothing. Quiet, isn't it? Come on, let's get going. Wait a minute. Something's happening. There's that noise. What the... It's all right, Doc. It's the door. It's closing again. Oh, just as well. If that tiger saw it open, he might get ideas about coming in and spending the night with us. Let's keep going. How long is this tunnel, I wonder? What's at the end of it? We'll find out soon enough. Don't be in too much of a hurry. Say, you notice anything? What? The dark part of this passage seems to keep the same distance from us. We don't get any closer to it. Now you mention it, Mitch, we don't. How can you account for that? Did you notice anything else? What's that, Lenny? The part we've left behind us is all dark, too. There's no sign of the wall we came through. What is going on? Shall we turn back? I don't know. Yeah, let's turn back. I don't like this. It's uncanny. No, look, you wait here. I'll turn back. What, in, in, into the darkness? Doc, you keep me in sight, and Mitch, you watch the other way. See if anything peculiar happens in that direction. Right. Okay. Oh, here I go. Take your time, Jet. I will. You just keep your eye on me. Can you still see me? Yep. You don't sound too sure. Hey, I can see the door now. Can you see us? Yes, but there seems to be a patch of darkness between you and me. I thought there would be, eh? Well, don't you see, Lemmy? What? You mean it automatically lights up ahead of you and blacks out behind as you walk along? Yes. Jet, come on. It's all right. Let's keep going.
Oh, I don't think we're ever going to come to the end of this tunnel. Well, there must be an end to it somewhere. Well, it doesn't follow. If it's like everything else in this place, built on a circular pattern, all we'll do is end up where we started. <sighs> we can even see where we're going. With the light going out behind us and darkness always just ahead. It's, it's uncanny. I'm glad you admit it, at least. Hey, hey, wait. Stop a minute. What is it, Doc? See, directly ahead, a, a pinpoint of light. A bluish light. What? Where? I can... There. Oh, yes, I can. Well, what do you suppose that is? I wish I had the faintest idea. It looks just like an eye. Eh? Well, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, now you mention it, it does. It's as though it's watching us. Staring at us. Yeah, hey, uh, Doctor, it's a favor. You, you... Yeah. That couldn't be the voice, could it? How can an eye be a voice? I mean, his eye. Only one? Why not? If he's as different from us as he says he is, maybe he's only got one. Maybe that's all he is. Just an eye. How could an eye stay up in the air like that with no support? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We're in the tunnel, the air shaft or whatever it is. Well? We've been walking down it for a long time. Of course. Now we can see a light, a, a bluish kind of light, very small and straight ahead. Oh, wow. Good. Heavens, did you ever see it? It's all a dream. It must be. It's a nightmare, a beautiful nightmare. And it is daylight. How can it be daylight underground at night? And where's the sun? There's no sun, I grant you, but the sky's... Oh, it's not the sky. It's a roof. An enormous spherical roof. Well, this whole thing is artificial. But it looks so real. Like a genuine fertile plain viewed from the top of a high cliff. Look at those trees and, and, and things down there. They're trees like... A, well, like I never saw before. It's warm, like a pleasant spring day. It's like a huge garden. A colossal, beautiful garden. You know, it's a different country, a different world. An artificial world laid out under the largest dome I've ever seen. How does it keep up there with no pillars to support it? And there must be millions of tons of earth above it. The pressure must be fantastic. Oh, look at those lovely flowers. Here, Kew Gardens is just a window box compared to this. Well, whoever built this place must have a great love of beauty. Hello, Luna. Hey, Jet, he's calling. Hello? Hello, yes. Well... How do you like our home? Is this where you live? Is this your city? What is left of it? I'd hardly call this a ruin. No, not a ruin. But a city is not alive without inhabitants. And they are all gone, or nearly so. But why do you live underground? The climate of Earth is too violent for us to live on its surface. Ah, they can't be so tough as we thought. Well, you can't stay up there. To one side of you is a long flight of steps. Well, that's the longest flight of stairs I've ever seen. Fall down that lot and you get a nasty bump. I'll be at the bottom, waiting for you. Oh, blimey. Oh, come on. No point in hanging about here. Right ho. Well, we've touched bottom. What now? I suppose we better follow this path. It's the only one. There's one thing I'm grateful for. And what's that, Lemmy? Well, it ain't likely to be any saber-toothed tigers down here. Hey, look. Hey? What, Doc? Another sphere. Oh, a complete one this time. Not just a dome. Hello? Yes? You're getting very close to me. Now. Oh. In a few moments, we shall meet. Are you in that diving bell or whatever it is? Yes, I am. Do you want us to come in there or, or will you come out? The door will open, but you needn't enter. You may like just to look in first. Very well. Here, yeah, I don't like this. Let's go back. No, let me stay where you are. Door's opening, all right. Can you see anybody? Anything in there? No, it's rather dark. It... Yes, I can. There, see? Oh, no! God oh, bless! Oh, God! Me. Oh, no! No, he can't be! Ah! Let me get out of here! Let me! Come back! Come back! <laughs> You have been listening to episode 10 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch, and with Derek Guiler. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton.
Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan and the crew of rocket ship Luna, stranded on the Earth thousands of years before the time they left it, were persuaded by a voice that spoke to them over their personal radios to enter one of the circular spacecraft that they'd seen many times since they'd set out for the moon. They were taken to a city, a city of domes, and then again at the invitation of the strange voice, they entered a door in one of the domes, a door which opened up into a tunnel leading deep into the Earth. Finally, they came upon a great open space full of strange plants and lit by artificial daylight. Once again, the voice was heard, and Jet and his crew were invited to descend the long flight of steps from which they viewed the immense underground world and meet the voice in person. Well, we've touched bottom. What now? I suppose we'd better follow this path. It's the only one. Well, there's one thing I'm grateful for. What's that, Lenny? It ain't likely there'd be any saber-toothed tigers down here. Hey, look, directly ahead. Oh, no! Another but... sphere. Oh, a complete oh. one this time, not just a dome. Hello? Yeah, yes? You're getting very close to me now. Oh. In a few moments, we shall meet. Are you in that diving bell or whatever it is? Yes, I am. Do you want us to come in there or, or will you come out? The door will open, but you needn't enter. You may just like to look in first. Very well. Yeah, I don't like this. Let's go back. No, let me stay where you are. Well, it's open. Can you see anybody, anything in there? Yeah, it, it's rather dark. It, uh, yes, I can. There, see? What? Oh, no! Oh, oh, man, oh, me. oh, no! No, no, he can't be! Uh, oh, let me get out of here! Let me, uh, let me oh, come oh, back to you here. No, Jim, I can't. Don't stay here, mate. Come on, before something terrible will happen to all of us. Doc, Mitch, wait here. Where no. are you going? To bring Lemmy back. Right. Oh, the door is shut again. Must have seen how the sight of him affected us. Yeah, it was kind of a shock. Quite unlike anything I expected. Me too, Doc. Even though I caught no more than a glimpse of him. It was like a... Well, I... A an armadillo? Yes. Yes, I suppose you could describe it as that. An armadillo that stood up in its hind legs. And it had a blue and red face like, like those monkeys. What are they called, Doc? Oh, mandrills, you mean? Yeah. It was the bright colors that gave me the biggest shock. I expected somebody rather like ourselves. Flesh-colored, at least. Yeah, so did I. It was such a surprise, I... Well, here comes Jet, coming back with Lemmy. Oh, Lemmy seems to have had quite a fright. What happened? Did the door shut again? Yeah, almost immediately. Oh. It was as though he didn't want to shock us, like he wished to hide himself from us as quickly as possible. Oh, Jet, let's get away from here. No, Lemmy, we mustn't let him see we're afraid. Well, I'm not afraid, not anymore. But I just can't stand anything so ugly, that's all. The sight of you had much the same effect on us when we first saw you. Eh? But we got used to it. And now we accept you. What do you mean? We scared you? Not scared us. Shocked us. But we couldn't be that ugly. Look, you must excuse us. It was so unlike anything we'd expected. We understand. You need worry about it no more. We brought you here for your own safety. We would not like your stay to be unpleasant. That's very considerate of you. I will not show myself to you again, unless you wish it. If you can get used to us, who are so different from you, well, we can do the same. It is harder for you. We have had many opportunities of observing you, of getting used to you. But now I expect you'd like to refresh yourselves and rest. Yes, please, we'd like to very much. It has all been arranged. If you follow the path, you will come to another sphere, just like this one. The door will be open. Go inside. There will be food and beds for you. When you have rested, I shall contact you again. Thank you. Yes, mate, thanks a lot. And uh, I'm sorry I've kicked up all that fuss. Well, they've really done us proud, haven't they? You think this food's any good to eat? <laughs> Only one way to find out. Well, mm. what's it like, Doc? Mm, rather, rather sweet. But okay. Rather like honey but with the texture of bread. Yeah, I suppose these things are for us to sleep on. What else could they be? Well, I mean, whoever heard of a circular bed with, with a dip in the middle? <laughs> to stop you falling out. And what do we do with bed covers? 
How do we keep warm? The temperature is uniform in here and outside, too. Quite warm enough for sleeping. Even when we undress? Perhaps they don't expect us to undress. The, the voice didn't seem to be wearing any clothes. Oh, what about all that shell stuff? That armor plate, it wasn't that clothes? I doubt it. I doubt very much if they wear clothes at all. Oh, Becky wouldn't like that. Like what? Oh, I'd like to think I've been associating with a lot of nudists. Yeah, well, I don't know about you, but I'm all for getting some sleep. <laughs> Bed clothes or no. How's it feel, Mitch? Hey, Mitch. Good night. He's asleep already. Eh? Well, isn't he? Yeah. I suppose it is just sleep. I suppose that couch couldn't be some kind of trap. How could it be? Oh, why not? You lie on it and whoops, you're off. Lost to the world. And then when all four of us are laid out, in come them gremlins or whatever they are and we've had it. Hey, Mitch. Mitch. Huh? What's the matter? Oh, you're all right. Yeah, why shouldn't I be? Well, we thought that... The... Yeah, he's asleep again. It's like them pigs make you sleep whether you want to or not. But he woke very easily. He woke as soon as I touched him. No, I don't think there's anything to worry about, Jeff. If anything bad was going to happen to us, it could have happened by now. No, it, it seems the whole makeup of these people is based on gentleness and kindness. How can we come to any harm? But how can anybody so ugly be so kind and considerate? Well, for the same reason that anything so beautiful as a, a, a cat can be so cruel. Yeah, that makes a kind of sense, Doc. Uh, sleeping makes sense. I'm going to be sensible like Mitch. Any objection to my taking this bed? No. Nope. Take whichever one you like, Jet. Oh, I shall sleep peacefully. I know that. The first time since we landed here. Maybe you'd better turn in as well, both of you. What, you mean nobody sits up and keeps watch? Oh, I'm sure there's no need, Lemmy. I feel as safe here as I would in my own bed. Oh. And you, you feel the same, Jet? Jet? <laughs> Obviously he does. Well, good night, Lemmy. What do you mean, good night? It's broad daylight out there. I expect it always is, <laughs> but it won't stop me from... Won't stop you from what, Doc? Doc, I'm talking to you. Oh, oh well, there's no point in me sitting up and talking to myself. Oh, oh feels good and all. Nice and warm. And... Oh, it's just like... Oh. Oh, oh. What's up, Lemmy? Can't you sleep? Oh, this bed's so darn uncomfortable. Ah, so is mine. Well, when I first got in, it was soft and warm, and now it feels like a plank, a bare plank with splinters in. Just how mine feels. Oh, well, I ain't standing here any longer. Oh, I can't stand it. Why do you think I'm up? What's that human mantle trying to do? Make a monkey out of us? Good morning. Oh, oh, uh, good morning. I trust you slept well. Well, I would have done it if the bed had stayed as comfortable as it was when I first got in it. But it did. Eh? You slept for hours, all of you. The beds don't get uncomfortable until you've had your full sleep. Well, I don't understand. Well, when you're tired, or even if you're not, and the time comes to sleep, the beds will induce it from the moment you lie on them. Oh, that's right. They did. I fell asleep almost at once. But when your sleeping period is over, the bed reverses the procedure and you get up and are glad to do so. What, you mean these beds are a sort of sleeping pill and alarm clock combined? What an ingenious idea. Well, I don't think so. Well, why not? Because there's nothing I like better than turning over and having another five minutes. Well, now that we are up, what happens next? A meal is set for you. Yes, yeah, so I see. When you have eaten, I want you to leave this sphere and go to another, a much larger one to which I shall direct you. And then? You will see, in good time, we would like to acquaint you with a few things about us and this planet. This must be the place, Jet. Yes, but how do we get in? He said it would be open for us. Yeah, you know what happened the last time a door opened? Oh, I don't want another shock like that. No, you said we wouldn't see him again. I don't think he'll go back on his word. Hold on to your hat. Something's happening. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. The door. Sliding back just like all the others. Stand still. Don't panic. Well, do we go in? Of course we do. Yeah, but Spouting is there. Well, I'm willing to risk it. He can't help how he looks. We'll have to get used to it. Just as he got used to us. Well, all right. In you go. I'm a long way behind you. Come on. I don't think this is going to hurt. Uh, well, what do you know? This must be the nerve center of this place. It's kind of control room. A huge control room. And it's chock full of those televiewer spheres. And, uh, and... Uh, and what, Doc? <laughs> How can I describe them? I don't even know what they're for. Now, don't anybody touch anything. Not a thing. Yeah, probably blow the old place sky high if we did. Sky high? <laughs> this far under the ground? Well, earth high, then. Well, there's the door closing. They've got a mania for shutting themselves in everywhere, haven't they? Not a sign of anybody. Not a soul. If the place looks clean, as polished as a new pin. Mm, if there was anybody here, they probably left before we came in. So we wouldn't see them. You know, just hiding themselves on our account. 
It's beginning to make me feel mean. Hello, Luna. Hello, yes? Do you see in front of you a televiewer globe? Yes, I see it. Walk as far as that, and then wait. Very well. He's going to show us something. But what brings us all this way to do it? I guess he knows his own business best, Lemmy. Yes, Doc. Well, we're here, in front of the televiewer. And it's warming up. Well, there's a picture appearing. A picture of the city. From the outside. It's much the same as we saw it from the air just before we first landed here. It must be daylight up on the surface, then. Yes, it is. The night has long since passed. Is that an actual view from outside, or is it a film or something? Film? What is film? Ah, that's something we know about that you ain't got, then. What I mean is, is that picture we see on the screen an actual transmission? Of course. One of our ships is hovering above the city. It transmits the picture, which is reproduced here. Oh, I see. Well, but why show it to us? We've already seen those domes from exactly that viewpoint. It is not just the city we wish you to see. Oh, what then? Hey, that picture's changing. That ship must be moving. Take a close look at the countryside over which it is passing. At the cultivated areas in particular. Uh, did you plant them? Yes, we did. There were fields of the same kind near where our ship landed. Did you plant those too? Yes. But we never once saw anybody tend to them. Oh, they don't need tending. We plant them and they grow and ripen. When they are ready for harvest, we gather them in. If they're still there. How do you mean, if they're still there? Watch the televiewer and you will see. I? Truth, yes, I do. See that? What, Mitch? Smoke. Clouds of it. It's the crops that are on fire. Well, that's a silly thing to do. Plant them and then burn them. Do you think we did it? Well, who else? The creatures of the forest. Who are they? They are the cause of our leaving this planet. What, just because they burn your crops? Surely you can prevent that. How? Well, by getting your own back and burning theirs. They'll soon get tired of a game that two can play at. They do not grow crops themselves. There are none for us to burn. Oh, well, that rules out that little lark then, doesn't it? But look, who, who are these forest creatures? Why should they go around burning your crops like this? They are destructive by nature. They destroy anything they do not understand. They even destroy the animals. Kill. Not only for food, but for the sheer joy of killing. They even kill each other. Don't you kill for food, then? Why should we? There is plenty to be had without killing others for it. What, you mean you're all vegetarians? There is no need to kill to live. But life is like that. One animal kills another so that it may survive. And that, in its turn, is killed by another. So we found when we first arrived on Earth, it was something new to us. No creature ever killed another on our planet. Well, it must have been very crowded, grossly overpopulated. No, it wasn't. There was just enough life for the planet to support. No more, no less. What, not even the wild animals killed each other? There were no wild animals. I mean, you must have found a big change when you landed here, then. These forest creatures were burning your crops. How long have they been carrying on like this? For many hundreds of years. When we first arrived here, thousands of years ago, there were only a few of them, but they have steadily multiplied and now have emerged as creatures with intelligence. They live in communities and have learned to make fire. They seem to live only to destroy us and all that belongs to or is associated with us. And in between times, they destroy each other. Well, they sound a very friendly lot, I must say. Well, if they are out to destroy you, why don't you do the same to them? Kill them, do you mean? Yes. With the means you have, it shouldn't be difficult. We can do many things. But we cannot harm any living creature. What, uh, nobody? Nobody. Well, that's nice to know. So rather than fight back, you're willing to leave this city and, and all that it contains? The way of life on Earth is not our way. We have no choice but to find a new place to live. And where are you off to? To another planet within this solar system. Not so hospitable as Earth, but it will do. Which planet? It occupies a position between the Earth and the Sun. It is the Earth's neighbor. You must mean Venus. How can you live there? If the Earth's climate is too violent for you, the heat on Venus would be unbearable. The dense atmosphere affords us some protection. We provide the rest ourselves. You would. I expect you could live in it. Let me... Already another city just like this is being built beneath the surface. Meanwhile, our reconnaissance ships are searching the universe for another more suitable planet. When they find it, we shall go there. And what if they don't? Then we shall remain on Venus until the forest creatures have gone. This uncontrollable desire they have for destroying things can only result in their self-annihilation. But suppose it doesn't. Suppose they cease to destroy things and each other. That is most unlikely. 
But if it should happen, we could live on Earth with them in peace. But even if their nature does change, it'll take years, maybe thousands of years. We can wait. Our ships will always be watching the Earth, and we will return when the time is right. Do these creatures, as you call them, ever come out of the forest? Last night they came out and set fire to our crops. Well, let's hope we don't meet up with them then. That's why we brought you here, so that you shouldn't. They had already begun to get curious about you. Oh? What do these creatures look like? Like you and me, they walk on two legs. But they are covered in hair and walk with a stoop. Not upright as you do. Apes? Why apes? Well, gorillas then. What else could walk on two legs and be covered in hair? Can they talk? Have they any intelligence or, or even a language? They mutter to each other, but do not even seem to grasp the fact that we have tried to communicate with them. They must be apes. Hey, did you ever hear of an ape that could use fire? Not in our day, but who knows what they could do this far back in time. I'd like to have a look at them sometime, see what kind of creatures they are. Mm, me too. But what of this danger you told us of? They are it. The forest creatures, you mean? Yes. Then we've got nothing to be scared of, as long as we stay here. But you can't. Well, why not? I told you. The last of us are about to leave. We can no longer protect you when we are gone. Ah, oh, but we could stay here, couldn't we? There'd be no point. You would drown. Eh? Drown? Well, how? When we first arrived on Earth, the great ice cap reached to about where this city is situated. Well, what's that got to do with our being drowned? Quietly, me. Give him a chance to explain. Well, but slowly, the ice has been receding. As it does so, it melts, and great quantities of water are released to fill up the seas and low-lying land. The land above this city is very low-lying. It cannot be long before the Western Sea breaks through and floods a vast area, including this. The Western Sea? Yes, the, the Atlantic. Oh, yes. Don't you remember? I figured out we were right smack in the middle of the Mediterranean, yes. and I was right. Already two great lakes stand where a few thousand years ago two of our cities stood. They are now submerged. But if you know about this, well, why not move to some high land that won't be flooded and build a city there? That we might have done, but for the forest creatures. Ah, oh, they're the real fly in the ointment, then. So long as they remain on Earth, we cannot. But you did say you could help us, protect us from all this. We can. How? You can come with us. What? To Venus? There you will at least be safe. Oh, now, wait a minute. What makes you think we can even live on Venus? Yeah, we haven't got up plate armor for a skin like you, you know. Then you prefer to stay here? Uh, no, no, we don't. Then what do you want? To get back to Earth. But you are on Earth. In our own time, I mean. In the 20th century where we came from and where we belong. And how do you propose to do that? Well, that's what we thought you could tell us. You got us here in the first place. Well, your ships did. It was an accident. But if you got us here, how you did it, I don't know. Couldn't you reverse the process and get us back again? We could try, but there would be considerable risk. What kind of risk? We would have to return you to the moon first. And then, of course, we may not get you back there at the same time as you left it. Aye? We may be a few thousand years out, either way. Oh, no. It would be safer if you come with us in one of our ships. That would be simple. Would getting us back to the moon be out of the question? No, not really. Provided you go in your own ship. And we can't. Well, why not? We can't take off. We haven't the power. We, we need a booster stage to get away from the Earth's gravitational pull, and we haven't got one. A booster? Yes. Yes, there's not sufficient power in the motor to get us off the Earth. The moon, yes, but not the Earth. And we need oxygen. We have hardly enough to last five days. Sufficient to get us from Earth to the moon, but not for the round trip. And we need grub. We've got to eat. And if we had all those things, the ship couldn't take off. We need a launching ramp. Or a long runway, at least. You had better come to Venus. With us. I don't want to go to Venus. I want to go home. We cannot guarantee to get you anywhere else. Uh, would you take us back to the moon if you could? Certainly, if you wish it. But it will be risky. We might prefer to take the chance. Can you give us time to think about it? Of course. I will direct you back to your sphere. Meanwhile, I will investigate the possibility of preparing your ship for takeoff. Perhaps if you come to any conclusion before I contact you... You will call me. Yes, we will. And thank you.
It's all agreed, then. We take the chance. Yeah, Not yet. Yet. Sure, but look, suppose we do get to the moon and we land in a new period of time, different from this and the one we left. Well? Well, the time travelers will still be around, won't they? So we could go to Venus then, I suppose, if we wanted to. I think we'd have to. We couldn't live on the moon, that's for sure. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. Oh, I suppose we'll have enough fuel to get off again and back to Earth. Well, that remains to be seen. Depends on how much we use up taking off from here. Well, I suppose we'd better call up his nibs and tell him what we've decided. Yes, Jed, I think we had. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We've made up our minds about what we want to do. Very well. If you care to go up to the surface again, one of our ships will be waiting to take you back. But we haven't told you what our decision is yet. There is no need. It was a foregone conclusion. Oh. Well, how do we get up to the surface? Leave your radios on. I will direct you. How about the ship that is to take us back? Where will we find that? I will lead you there. Well, I'm sorry to leave that underground city, but I won't be sorry to see Luna again. Shouldn't be long now before we sight her. Those forest creatures have certainly been busy all along here. Look at all that smoke. Yeah. You don't think they'd be messing around with our ship, do you? Well, they'd have a job. It wouldn't burn anyway. But they could have gone into it. The main door was open. Ah, but the hatch wasn't. They could have got no further than the airlock. Well, if they are anywhere near it, we should see them. It's getting very close to where she is now. Or was. All right, don't be so darn pessimistic, Lemmy. Ah, there she is. See her? Just coming into view. And no fields burning anywhere near her. Oh, she looks... Good heavens! What is it? What's up? What? Am, am I dreaming or something? Look at the ship. Oh, she, she's standing up on her tail. But when we left her, she, she had her undercarriage down and she was lying in the horizontal position. And the shock absorbs her out as though she'd just landed here tail first. But who stood her up like that? How did they do it? Oh! Here, yeah, take it easy, mate. Oh, we're going down. Hold on to your hat. Oh, blimey, fancy going all the way to Venus in one of these. I'll be dead before I got halfway. They certainly don't waste any time, do they? At least I might give us some kind of warning first. Yeah, never mind about that. Let's get out here and see who's been messing about with Luna. Well, how can we? The doors are still shut. Oh, no, they're not. Up you go, Mitch. And you, Doc. You bet. Absolutely fantastic. She's all set, ready for takeoff. And everything seems to be in perfect order. Everything we ever took out has been replaced. Yeah, but does it work? Well, that's easy enough to find out, Lemmy. Yes, it is. We'll carry out normal pre-takeoff tests. Check every installation. Now, don't miss a thing. Okay, okay. Jack. Well, that's the tele viewer. Test satisfactory. Well, that's it, then. Everything works. Switch her off, Lemmy. Right. Well, what do you make of that? Well, there's only two people could have done this. That uh, Mr. Mystery or them forest creatures. And it just couldn't be them apes. But even Mr. Mystery, as you call him, couldn't have done all this alone. He never said he was alone. No, oh, half the time he speaks of himself in the plural. Well, he or, or they must have done it while we were down in that underground city. But why? Why didn't they wait until we got here? We could have helped them, told them what to do. We didn't need to. They've done it anyway. They must have dozens of men on this job. <laughs> men? What am I saying? I've got no idea how they did it without us. But I think I know why. Well, why, Doc? Because they didn't want us to see them. Eh? They knew we couldn't get the ship ready for takeoff without their help. So they came on ahead and did it before we got here. You mean they did it alone just so that we wouldn't have to look at them? What other reason can there be? Oh, it, it makes you feel so mean, doesn't it? We can't stand the sight of them, and yet they do all this for us. Well, they are an amazing people, and no mistake. Well, after this, I wouldn't care if I saw a hundred of them. And if I did, I, I'd shake hands with the lot. If they've got hands... Hey, see if you can contact them, Jet. We must thank them. Yes, go ahead. That's the least we can do. All right, gentlemen. Takeoff time is less than 30 minutes away. There they go again. They must be blowing that city of theirs to pieces. But if the sea is going to submerge it anyway, why should they bother? Well, search me. Oh, I suppose they will come for us. Why shouldn't they? Oh, I don't know. Now, you all know the procedure. We take off at noon. By then, the time traveler's ships will be hovering above us. Uh -huh. uh, once we've left the ground and have broken through the atmosphere, we leave everything to them. What? All right. Close the hatch and exhaust the airlock. Hatch closing. 
Airlock, exhaust. Lemmy, switch on the televiewer. Televiewer, on. Rotator, Lemmy. Let's have one last look round. And then start scanning the sky for those ships. All right, rotate it. This is one place I won't be sorry to see the back of. <sighs> Thank goodness we don't have to fish in that river anymore. Hey, hey, look. What is it, Lemmy? Smoke. It wasn't any that close when we were outside just now, was there? Is it the crops or the smoke from the city being blown up? No, it's too near for that. Then them apes or whatever they are, they, they must be pretty close. They're closer than they've ever been before. Keep her turning, Lemmy. See if we can see any more. Right, Jet. Hey, wait, Lemmy, hold it. Blimey, who are they? It ain't his nips, is it? With, with all his chinas. No. No, these are quite different. And who the blazes are they? There's dozens of them. Hundreds of them. And all heading towards the ship. It must be the forest creatures. The apes. Yeah. What do we do now? Apes. They're not apes. They look like apes to me. No, Lemmy. They're men. I? Primitive men. Prehistoric men. Our ancestors. Our own kind. You've been listening to episode 11 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs and Derek Geiler. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan and the crew of rocket ship Luna stranded on the Earth some 20,000 years before they left it. They made contact with the time travelers, creatures from another part of the universe who many thousands of years ago began to colonize the Earth. But the time travelers are being driven away from the planet by the forest dwellers who, over the centuries, have gradually developed into creatures with intelligence and an apparently insatiable desire to destroy. The time travelers promise to help Jet and his crew get back to the moon, and it's hoped the 20th century. So, final preparations for the takeoff were made. Rotate the camera, Lemmy. Let's have one last look round, and then start scanning the sky for those ships. Ship, right. Rotating. This is the one place I won't be sorry to see the back of. Ah, thank goodness we don't have to fish in that river anymore. Hey, look. What is it, Lemmy? Smoke. It wasn't any that close when we were outside just now, was there? Is it the crops or the smoke from the city being blown up? No, it's too near for that. Then them apes or whatever they are must be pretty close. Yeah, closer than they've ever been before. Keep her turning, Lemmy. See if we can see any more. Yes, sir. Hey, wait, Lemmy, hold it. Blimey, who are they? It ain't his nips, is it, with all his chinas? No. No, these are... Quite different. Then who the blazes are they? There's dozens of them, hundreds of them. And all heading towards the ship. They must be the forest creatures. The apes? Well, what do we do now? Apes. They're not apes. They look like apes to me. No, Lemmy. They're men. Eh? Prehistoric men. Primitive men. Our ancestors. Our own kind. Oh, blimey. About a hundred yards off. They must be quite perplexed about this ship. You mean the ship standing up on its tail? Yeah, well, puzzled anyway. Well, they're going to be even more puzzled when we take off and leave them standing. Hey, isn't it about time we did just that? Shouldn't the time traveler's ship be overhead by now? Yes, they should. Mitch, uh, let me keep your eye on your great-grandfathers. Doc and I'll scan the sky for the time travelers. They must be up there somewhere by now. Okay. Yeah, right. uh, switch on the forward televiewer, Doc. All right. On. Well? No sign of them. The sky's empty. Well, they must be completely out of range. Or not there at all. Well, we daren't take off until we know they are. They've got to be up there and waiting for us. Otherwise, all our hopes of getting off the Earth are gone for good. You keep looking, Doc. I'll try to raise them on the radio. Right. Hello? Hello, Luna calling. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Jet, come over here, quick. Well? Well, yourself. Take a look on the screen. They're setting fire to every field round the ship. It looks as though they intend to smoke us out. The fire from those fields couldn't reach us. Well, unless it sets fire to the wild grass... Could work its way over to the ship then. Wind's in the right direction. And what if it does, Mitch? Can it hurt us? Oh, I don't know. It can't hurt the ship itself, but it can't do us any good either. Any danger of the fuel exploding? Well, the 
the ship gets hot enough, yes. Well, can there be all that heat in a grass fire? Wouldn't reach up here, but the motor's exhaust nozzle is right close to the ground. Well, no fire is likely to reach us for some time, anyway. Yeah, and by then we'll be away. Gone. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. Hey? There's no sign of the ships. I can't raise them on the radio. And incidentally, Lemmy, the main transmitter was already on when I went to use it. Well, that's right. I was warming it up when you told me to switch on the televiewer. You should have switched it off then. Eh? We haven't any power to waste. Well, I would have done you it. Never then. mind it now, but be more careful in future. Yes, Jack. To get back to that fire out there. Well? Oh, I don't like it. If it does come close, I think we'll have to fight it. Keep it away from the tail of the ship. What, go outside, you mean? Well, we can't do it from in here, can we? No, it wouldn't be easy, would it? What time is it? Uh, 30 seconds past noon. Any sign of them, Doc? No, Jack. Sky is absolutely clear. I haven't come. Oh, fine lot they turned out to be time travelers, and they can't even keep an appointment. Well, they must have a very good reason for not showing up on time. Perhaps they'll be contacting us very soon, and everything will be all right. Let's hope so. What the dickens is that? Sounds like a shower of stones. Shower. It's the ape men. What? Well, we've been talking. They've crept up on us. They're attacking us. Yes, look at the televiewer. They're all around us, throwing their spears at us. Retract the camera, Lemmy, before it gets damaged. Right. Now we can't even see what they're doing. Well, we can hear them. They must be dim if they think they can damage our ship with those toothpicks. Yeah, maybe they think we're the time travellers. Possibly. They certainly can't have any idea that we are who we are. No, they couldn't, could they? But if they saw us, they'd know we weren't the time travellers. And perhaps they wouldn't be so unfriendly. Why don't you step outside and see? No, thanks. Nobody's going outside while they're out there. And what if they're out there for days? The time travellers don't turn up to take us off. Then we'll have to stay in here until they've gone. What about air? We can't afford to use up our oxygen supply. We, we need it for later. We'll open up the airlock and keep the main door open. What, and let them gorillas in? Well, it's too high for them to reach without a ladder. Well, they can get one, can't they? Oh, I doubt if they got around to making such things yet. Oh. We'll give the time travellers a few minutes more. Everything depends on them. That's putting it mildly. And if they still don't turn up... I hate to think... No, that was the last of them. They seem to have gone all right. For the time being, anyway. Yeah, but why go now? Because it'll soon be getting dark, that's why. They don't like the darkness. Oh, they're just like a lot of kids, aren't they? Throw their spears at our ship, snarl at it, and even kick it. As though they could do it any arm that way. Yeah, they are kids, Lenny. In them, you see the childhood of man. All our inherent fears and desires have come down from them. Fear of the dark, among other things. And I'm not surprised. Well, at least they've gone for the night. Yeah, in the meantime, that fire out there is creeping closer. Unless we take off within a couple of hours, it's going to get dangerously near. How can we stop it? Well, it's easy. We could burn a wide stretch of grass between the ship and the fire, stamping it out as we go. Then when the main fire reaches it, it'll just fizzle out. A bit of a tall order for just the four of us. We can manage it. I once helped prevent a bushfire burning a house down by the same method. We'll have to start soon before those flames get too close. All right. We'll take a blanket each and go down to the river and soak them. And then what? Jet. Jet. What, Lenny? Don't you hear anything? Eh? Yes, I hear it. The time travellers, they must be around. That's their music. Not very loud, though, is it? Let me switch on the radio, see if we can contact them. Yes, yes. Radio up. Hey, do you think they're overhead? That they've come to pick us up at last? We'll find out, Doc, if we can. I'll switch on the forward televiewer, see if I can see them. Blimey, they must be very close. Listen to that. If we can contact them, now's the time. Any sign of them, Mitch? No, Doc, not yet. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Luna. Oh, oh, he's there. Are we glad to hear from you? Glad? Yeah, fine pal you turned out to be. Starting off the minute them eight men appear. Where are you? Are you overhead? No, we have landed on the other side of the river. Mitch, take a look that way. See if you can see them. You're darn right I will. You told us to be ready for takeoff at noon. That's right. Well, we were, but you didn't come. Well, we thought perhaps you didn't need us anymore. Didn't need you? But you were going to help us get out into space and back to the moon, back to our own time. We were. Why did you change your mind? The forest creatures changed it for us. How could they make any difference? We thought you would want to stay with them. Do us a favor. You said they were your own kind, your ancestors. Oh, they are. At least we think they are. How did you hear us? Your radio was on. Of course it was. Lemmy left it on. All right, I didn't mean to. But what made you think we would want to stay with them? It is natural. They are your own kind. But thousands of years separate us. They've no idea who we are and couldn't care less, I'm sure. In fact, they probably think we are you or connected with you. Yeah, why else would they attack us? Those spears at our ship. Would you do that to your descendants? We wouldn't do that to anybody. If you were so sure we'd rather go with the forest dwellers, why did you come back? To find out why you didn't. Well, now you know. We don't want to be killed. That's why. Them gorillas out there might be our ancestors. 
But we prefer to string along with your lot any time. You mean you will come to Venus, after all? Uh, no, no. We'd like you to take us back to the moon, to our own time. So you do want to rejoin the forest creatures, their descendants, anyway? I don't see anything wrong with that. You may not, but we do. Eh? Why should we help the very people who are driving us away? It's not us that's driving you away. It's those out there in the forest. But you are their future, and you cannot have changed so much. Of course we have. We don't even look like them anymore. Well, you can see that for yourself. Looks have very little to do with it. I don't understand you. You have witnessed the basic force that drives the forest creatures. The uncontrollable desire to destroy things they do not understand. The incredible selfishness of their nature. Have you seen them when they are hungry? We've hardly seen them at all. When one of them has a piece of food, does he share it with his companion? No. He goes away and hides and gorges himself until he's sick, then buries any that's left over. And if one of his kind sees him with that food, he tries to get it away from him. Not part of it, all of it. And then they snarl and fight and draw each other's blood until one lies dead so that the other can keep more than he needs. Ah, we're more civilized than that, mate. Are you? It takes a long time for such things to be driven out of a being's nature. A long, long time. Probably longer than your kind have inhabited this planet. But in comparison with the age of the Earth, man has existed hardly any time at all. You are merely proving my argument. But even in that short time, man has learned a great deal. He, he's progressed. Towards what? Well, a more comfortable and fuller life. A greater respect for his fellow beings and his neighbor's property. You don't kill each other anymore? You no longer destroy the things that can give you life and comfort? Does the forest men burn our crops, which they could eat if they knew how? No longer burn vast areas of the forest merely to drive out game? No, we don't. We got past those things thousands of years ago. You are certain the instinct does not remain in some other form? Not that I can think of. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Jeff. You cannot even agree amongst yourselves. How do you mean, Doc? Well, think of the vast acres of forest land that have been destroyed. To drive out game? No, to grow crops. Not to eat, but for a good market. Year after year, until the ground is so exhausted that we end up with no forest, no game, no crops, just dust. Man has been foolish, I admit, but that's all being put right now. Land conservation schemes are high up on the list of important projects, or were when we left home. You have doubts? They could be abandoned? Well, yes, they could, I suppose, for something more important. Or what? Well, a war, maybe. War? Oh, blimey, you shouldn't have said that. Look, we're not perfect. I don't know how long your kind have been alive, probably many thousand times longer than man. You've had time to conquer all your primitive desires and suppress them. You have endless generations of experience behind you. Give us the time and we'll be like you. We'll stamp out the undesirable, primitive natures that underlie our characters. But you must give us the time. Such great changes cannot be accomplished overnight. I realize that. And meanwhile, are you to be allowed to continue to destroy your planet and each other? Seems it's inevitable, but it's all bitter experience from which we shall learn. And although you admit that you have not yet learned, you build ships and dare to try to conquer space before you have even conquered yourself. Perhaps to colonize the planets and destroy them, too. We can't help a little destruction of some sort. You can't plant a field without you clear the forest first. You can't drive a steam engine without you dig out the coal or pump out the oil from the bowels of the earth. Why do you have to dig coal and pump oil? For fuel, of course. You've got to have something to drive your machines. It's, it's, it's a wasteful method, I know, but it'll have to do until we find a better one. There is power all around. Force for all to use. There's no digging, no pumping, no waste. What power? The power by which we live. Enough energy reaches the earth from the sun in one day to drive all our ships and power plants for a hundred years. Well, we haven't learned to harness that power yet. We hardly know what it is. Then perhaps you will leave your exploration of space until you do. But that is just where you can help us. How? By telling us the secret of this power. How to find it. How to use it. Would you trust the secrets of your ship and all its equipment to the forest creatures? Now, nah, use your sense. What could they do with it? You could explain the workings to them. It would be like trying to explain the, the quantum theory to a child. Exactly. Well, at least you could make a start with simple things. We're not quite as primitive as those forest dwellers, even by comparison with you. There would be no point. 
A child cannot be taught to run before he can walk. And you have hardly emerged from the crawling stage. You don't think much of us one way and another, do you? We think as much of you as we do of any other living creature anywhere in the universe. We have no wish to harm you. That's what you say. Yet you go off and leave us here with them gorillas outside thirsting for our blood and the floods coming to drown us and us helpless to get back to our own time and people. We would not harm you. It would be the forest creatures, not us. But if you leave us here, it amounts to the same thing. Are we to be blamed when a tiger kills his prey? We're not a tiger's prey. We're prey to those ape men, or will be if we're left here. We have no control over the form and mode of life on Earth. But you would help perpetuate it. How? By doing nothing about it. We have tried. The animals have no interest in us, and the forest creatures detest us. We don't. You cannot bear even to look at us. Not at first, but we could now. Show yourself to us and see. Switch on your televiewer. It is on. Now, wait a minute, Chet. Is that necessary? Quiet, Lemmy. There he is. His head, anyway. Can you see me? Yes, we can. And you are not afraid? No. You speak for yourself. You are, but you control your feelings. We are not afraid. We've better sense now. Because you have met us? Partly. But what of the rest of you, who have not? We will tell them about you. Your beautiful underground city, your great scientific powers. For our own safety, it would be better to leave you here, to prevent your ever going out into space again. If you do not return to your own time and your contemporaries give you up as lost, it may deter others from venturing out into space. You don't know us as well as you think you do. Our deaths would make no difference. Others will follow. Is that why you turned us back in time? To prevent our getting to other planets, perhaps to Venus, where you're going and will be living in the 20th century? Yes. It's no good, mate. That kind of trip won't stop us. At least give us the chance to prove that our ultimate goal is a life such as you now lead. It's been the dream of man for centuries. It will be the dream of man, Jet, and centuries to come. Very well. Are you ready to leave? We can be, in a few minutes. We will take up a position way above you. Your ship must leave the ground and climb as high as possible out of the atmosphere. When you have reached your maximum speed, switch off your motor and leave everything to us. How high will you be? A thousand miles. Well, can't you come lower than that? We, we might not make that height. If we come any closer to you, the magnetic field set up by our ships will affect the working of your ship. Oh, I see. Very well. We'll try to reach a thousand. We'll be waiting for you. Do you want us to take off at any particular time? No. When you are ready, we shall be there. But what if anything goes wrong? Hello? Hello? It's no good, Jeff. He must have already taken off. He can't hear you. A few more things I wanted to ask him. Like what? Well, it makes no difference now. He's gone. All right. We'll make a final check of all equipment. Then get onto your couches and strap yourselves in. Yeah, right, okay. Right away, okay. Ready for takeoff. Automatic oxygen supply, okay. Ready for takeoff. Radio, televiewer, and radar. Test satisfactory, ready for takeoff. Well, that's it. Yeah, Good. Uh, let me know when your straps are set. All ready, Jet. Ready. Me too. Position control panels. Control panels. Contact. Let's hope they are up there and waiting for us. Yeah. What if they're not? Hey, hadn't we better be prepared for that, Jet? We just go straight up and they're not there. All we can do is come straight down again. And if we do, we'll make a hole big enough for the time travelers to get one of their cities in. Uh, I've already thought of that. As soon as we've left the ground, we'll tilt our nose to an angle of 45 degrees. That'll set us on an elliptical course. And if we do have to return, at least we'll enter the atmosphere something like nose first and have a reasonable chance of landing it again. Well, when do we cut the motor? As soon as our velocity is high enough to carry us a thousand miles. Mitch, have we enough fuel for that? Just about. There might even be a little to spare. Switch on the radar. Radar on. Let me televiewer. Stern view. Televiewer on. Doc, gyro. Gyro. Okay, Mitch. Okay, Jeff. Then stand by for takeoff. Fifteen seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire! <laughs> Height, 
12.1 miles, velocity 4350. fuel left, Mitch? Uh, very little. Enough for one biggish burst, and that's it. Enough to make a moon landing if we have to? <laughs> Not by a long sight. Oh, blimey. Let me switch on the forward televiewer. The time travelers must be ahead of us somewhere. Forward televiewer, off. Rotator, Lemmy. Rotate it. Any sign? Not yet. Switch on your personal screen. That's all, look. Yeah. Uh, that's well? I don't see them. Me neither. Well, they'd better get a move on it. They're coming. We're losing speed all the time. Yeah, we soon won't be going up anymore. We'll be going down. But there's no sign of them. They should be there. We shouldn't have altered course. They expected us to rise straight up. They can't be waiting in the right place. But with the equipment they have, Mitch, they must be able to plot our course easily. Yeah, just as well we did change direction, if you ask me. Looks like we'll have to attempt a landing again anyway. It never knows where we'll end up this time. Let me try the stern view. Hey? Yes. But don't yeah. argue. Switch it on. Stern view. On. It's us that's just taken off, not them. I don't think there they are, right behind us. Of course, that's where we always saw them before they lined up for what we thought was an attack. And they're flying in that circular formation again. Yeah. All right. Now we can relax and, and don't move. They're coming in closer. I can hear them now. Yeah, me too. Lie flat. Thank goodness we're strapped to our beds and not caught out on the floor like last time. Oh, this is where I wish I'd brought one of them time travelers' beds with me. What wouldn't I give to sleep through this part of the proceeding? They're coming closer. Getting very close now. Here comes the pressure. Can oh. you feel it? Yeah. Yeah, I can. It's going to work. I know it is. Oh, I hope you're right. Oh, we must be accelerating like mad. Oh, oh. All right, let me take your breath. Oh, God. Mitch. Mitch. Oh, I think he's still out, Jack. Yeah. Oh. You all right, Doc? Yeah, I think so. Do you think we did it? Yeah. Crashed the time barrier, I mean? Oh, we must have done. It was just like it was before, in every way. Oh, thank goodness for that. Hey, what are you doing? Putting my magnetized boots on. I want to get over to the main televiewer. If we have crashed the time barrier, we should now be out somewhere way out in space. Way, way out. And traveling at a tremendous speed back towards where we came from, down through the centuries, towards the moon and home. Switch off the rotator, Lemmy. They're nowhere to be seen. Right. Well, that's how it was before, wasn't it? We saw nothing but the stars. No sign of the Earth, the moon, or even the sun. Let alone those spaceships. Do I keep the televiewer on? A forward view only. Let's at least see where we're heading for. Right. Hey, Jet, Mitch is waking up. How are you feeling, Mitch? I'm dreadful. What's happened? Oh, we increased speed and lost consciousness. All of us. You're the last to wake up. Oh, how long have I been out? Oh, nearly 15 minutes. Truth. You know, I'm beginning to think I'm too old for this game. Where are we? Out in space. No telling where. Televiewer shows nothing but stars. Millions of them. And no sign of the time travelers either. We're completely alone. A tiny speck of dust lost in the universe. You think our friends will show up again? I don't know. Have you tried calling them? Yeah. Uh, well, all we can hope is that the solar system, our own solar system, will appear on the screen. Then we'll know we've made it. We'll travel back through time, you mean? Back or forward, or so far forward that we come up behind ourselves. Oh, don't get my, my head can't stand it. Hey, look, 
What if we don't hit the bullseye? What if we do return to the moon at a completely different time? Oh, turn it up, Doc. Well, it is possible, isn't it? They said they couldn't guarantee anything. Well, if we don't hit the right period, let's hope it's the future this time and not the past. Yeah, I've had my basin full of the past, thanks. Well, why the future, Jeff? Because then we'll see just what man did make of himself. Whether there are any men left at all. No. He may have annihilated himself, you mean. Anything may have happened. The time travelers might be colonizing the Earth all over again. And what if we go back even further into the past? Who knows? We may even land during the reptilian age and meet brontosauri as big as houses. What, no men? The reptilian age, then, it was a pre-man age. Pre-man, post-man, what difference does it make? We're in the soup whichever way we go. Uh, unless the time travelers have pulled it off and we do arrive back on the moon at exactly the time we left it. And supposing we do, how do we land? We haven't got enough fuel. Yeah, but if we get back to that time, before we took off from the moon, I mean, uh, things should be exactly as they were then. And there should be sufficient fuel in the tank. Because we wouldn't have used up any. Because we wouldn't have landed on the Earth yet. Yeah. Is that what will happen, I wonder? Can we regain the things we've lost during this journey back through time? And what has happened to us physically? Have we grown older? You mean, does it take time to travel through time? Yes. Or do we return to the exact age we were before we made the journey? Well, this beard I've got hasn't wasted any time growing, and I'll certainly feel a lot older. But if things do revert back to what they were, we shall have lost all memory of this, of everything. It'll be like it never happened at all. Doc, get your diary. What for? Uh, get it, quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the idea? Yeah. You'll see. Well, here it is. Now, look back to the time when we first began to hear that strange music. Yeah, well. I is it all there? Yes, it's there. And the time we spent on Earth by the river, the appearance of the time travelers, is that all there? Um, yes, yes, every word. Then start writing again. Record everything you can think of since you last made an entry. Everything. But why? Because if we do get back to the exact time before we journeyed through time, and we do forget all this because by going back we can have no recollection of what is to come, that diary will be our only proof that anything happened at all. But look, what if material things change too? Back to what they were? We can only wait and see until we sight the moon again. Only then will we know the truth. <laughs> You'll be listening to episode 12 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs and Derek Tyler. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Journey into Space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan and the crew of rocket ship Luna stranded on the Earth some 20,000 years before they left it. They made contact with the time travelers, creatures from another part of the universe who many thousands of years ago began to colonize the Earth. But the time travelers are being driven away from the planet by the forest dwellers who, over the centuries, have gradually developed into creatures with intelligence and an apparently insatiable desire to destroy the time travelers promised to help Jet and his crew get back to the moon, and it's hoped the 20th century. So, final preparations for the takeoff were made. Radio okay. Ready for takeoff. Automatic oxygen supply okay. Ready for takeoff. Radio, televiewer, and radar. Test satisfactory. Ready for takeoff. Well, that's it. Yeah, Good. That's Good. Ready. Let me know when your straps are set. All ready, Jet. Ready. Meet you. Position control panels. Control panels. Contact. Let's hope they are up there and waiting for us. Yeah. What if they're not? Hey, hadn't we better be prepared for that jet? If we just go straight up and they're not there, all we can do is come straight down again. And if we do, we'll make a hole big enough for the time travelers to get one of their cities in. Uh, I've already thought of that. As soon as we've left the ground, we'll tilt our nose to an angle of 45 degrees. 
That'll set us on an elliptical course. And if we do have to return, at least we'll enter the atmosphere something like nose first and have a reasonable chance of landing it again. When do we cut the motor? As soon as our velocity is high enough to carry us a thousand miles. Mitch, have we enough fuel for that? Just about. There might even be a little to spare. Switch on the radar. Radar on. Lemmy, televiewer, stern view. Televiewer on. Doc, gyro. Gyro. Okay, Mitch. Okay, Jeff. Then stand by for takeoff. Fifteen seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire! Fire! Height, 12.1 miles. Velocity, 4350. Height, 27.2 miles. Velocity, 6550. Velocity, 11,000 miles. Height, 76 miles. Stand by to alter course. Standing by. Okay, Lenny. Okay. Flywheel one, contact. Contact. One degree. Two. Three. Four. Forty three. Forty four. Forty five. Hold it, Doc. Steady as he goes. Cut the flywheel. Flywheel, cut. Stand by to cut motor. Standing by. Cut. She should coast the rest. Any fuel left, Mitch? Uh, very little. Enough for one biggish burst, and that's it. Enough to make a moon landing if we have to? No, <laughs> not by a long sight. Oh, blimey. Let me switch on the forward televiewer. The time travelers must be ahead of us somewhere. Forward televiewer, on. Rotator, Lemmy. Rotate it. Any sign? Not yet. Switch on your personal screens. That's all, look. Yeah. Huh? Right, too. Well? I don't see them. Me neither. Well, they'd better get a move on it. They're coming. We're losing speed all the time. Yeah, we soon won't be going up anymore. We'll be going down. But there's no sign of them. They should be there. We shouldn't have altered course. They expected us to rise straight up. They can't be waiting in the right place. But with the equipment they have, Mitch, they must be able to plot our course easily. Yeah, just as well we did change direction, if you ask me. Looks like we'll have to attempt a landing again anyway. They never knows where we'll end up this time. Let me try the stern view. Hey? Yes, but Don't yeah. argue. Switch it on. Stern view. On. It's us that's just taken off, not them. I don't... Hey, there they are. Right behind us. Of course. Gosh, that's where we always saw them before they lined up for what we thought was an attack. And they're flying in that circular formation again. Yeah. All right. Well, now we can relax and, and don't move. They're coming in closer. I can hear them now. Yeah, me too. Lie flat. Thank goodness we're strapped to our beds and not caught out on the floor like last time. Oh, this is where I wish I'd brought one of them time travelers' beds with me. What would not I give to sleep through this part of the proceeding? They're coming closer. Getting very close now. Here comes the pressure. Can oh. you feel it? Yeah. Yeah, I can. It's oh. going to work. I know it is. Oh, I hope you're right. Oh, we must be accelerating like mad. Oh, oh. All right, let me save your breath. Oh, God. Oh. I feel sick. Oh, feel sick. Take a deep breath and oh. try not to be. Oh. Mitch. Mitch. Oh, I think he's still out, Jet. Oh. You all right, Doc? Yeah, I think so. Do you think we did it? Oh. Crashed the time barrier, I mean? Oh, we must have done. It was just like it was before, in every way. Oh, thank goodness for that. Hey, what are you doing? Putting my magnetized boots on. I want to get over to the main televiewer. If we have crashed the time barrier, we should now be out somewhere way out in space. Way, way out. And traveling at a tremendous speed. Back towards where we came from. Down through the centuries. Towards the moon. And home.
Switch off the rotator, Lemmy. They're nowhere to be seen. Right. Well, that's how it was before, wasn't it? We saw nothing but the stars. No sign of the Earth, the moon, or even the sun. Let alone those spaceships. Do I keep the televiewer on? A forward view only. Let's at least see where we're heading for. Right. Hey, Jet, Mitch is waking up. How are you feeling, Mitch? Dreadful. What's happened? Oh, we increased speed and lost consciousness. All of us. You're the last to wake up. How long have I been out? Oh, nearly 15 minutes. Truth. I'm beginning to think I'm too old for this game. Where are we? Out in space. No telling where. The television shows nothing but stars. Millions of them. And no sign of the time travelers either. We're completely alone. A tiny speck of dust lost in the universe. Do you think our friends will show up again? I don't know. Have you tried calling them? Yep. Oh. Well, all we can hope is that the solar system, our own solar system, will appear on the screen. Then we'll know we've made it. We'll travel back through time, you mean? Back or forward, or so far forward that we come up behind ourselves. Oh, I don't yet. My, my head can't stand it. Hey, look, what if we don't hit the bullseye? What if we do return to the moon at a completely different time? Oh, turn it up, Doc. Well, it is possible, isn't it? They said they couldn't guarantee anything. Well, if we don't hit the right period, let's hope it's the future this time and not the past. Yeah, I've had my basin full of the past, thanks. Well, why the future, Jet? Because then we'll see just what man did make of himself. Whether there are any men left at all. Oh, he may have annihilated himself, you mean. Anything may have happened. The time travelers might be colonizing the Earth all over again. And what if we go back even further into the past? Who knows? We may even land during the reptilian age and meet brontosauri as big as houses. What, no men? The reptilian age, Lemmy, was a pre-man age. Pre-man, post-man, what difference does it make? We're in the soup whichever way we go. Uh, unless the time travelers have pulled it off and we do arrive back on the moon at exactly the time we left it. And yeah, supposing we do... How do we land? We haven't got enough fuel. Yeah, but if we get back to that time, before we took off from the moon, I mean, uh, things should be exactly as they were then. And there should be sufficient fuel in the tanks, because we wouldn't have used up any, because we wouldn't have landed on the Earth yet. Yeah. Is that what will happen, I wonder? Can we regain the things we've lost during this journey back through time? And what has happened to us physically? Have we grown older? You mean, does it take time to travel through time? Yes, or do we return to the exact age we were before we made the journey? Well, this beard I got hasn't wasted any time growing, and I'll certainly feel a lot older. But if things do revert back to what they were, we shall have lost all memory of this, of everything. It'll be like it never happened at all. Doc, get your diary. What for? Uh, get it, quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the idea, Jeff? You'll see. Well, here it is. Now, look back to the time when we first began to hear that strange music. Uh, yeah, well? Is it all there? Yes, it's here. And the time we spent on Earth, by the river, the appearance of the time travelers, is that all there? Uh, yes, every word. Then start writing again. Record everything you can think of since your last made an entry. Everything. But why? Because if we do get back to the exact time before we journeyed through time, and we do forget all this, because by going back we can have no recollection of what is to come... That diary will be our only proof that anything happened at all. What if material things change, too? Back to what they were. Well, we can only wait and see until we sight the moon again. Only then will we know the truth. The truth about traveling through time, yes, Jet, but not the whole truth. How do you mean, Doc? Well, what do we know of the time travelers themselves, for example? Virtually nothing. Well, it still beats me how they managed to repair the ship and get it ready for takeoff without even consulting us. I can't begin to make out how they do half the things they do. I expect the forest creatures would think much the same about us, if they could think. Ah, but that's different. Them forest creatures were men like ourselves, but the time travellers didn't seem to be. They, they look more like animals. Biologically speaking, man is an animal too. It's the size of his brain that makes him superior. Well, them time travellers didn't seem to have extra big heads that I noticed. Well, the way you ran when you saw one, I, I wonder you had time to notice he had a head at all. Nah, there's no need to get personal about it. Come to think of it, their heads were rather large... They probably do have fairly big brains. What, you mean every clever man is a bigot? <laughs> Not necessarily, Lemmy. Quality is just as important as quantity. A race of men or animals with large brains that are also of high quality could do remarkable things. Well, now let's face it. They were a large type of animal and much bigger than us. Twelve feet high at least. Twelve feet? Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, Mitch, I must say. Well, how tall would you say they were then? Well, nine feet, certainly no more. Ah, uh, twelve feet. Do you agree they were that tall, Doc? Oh, I wouldn't have said they were more than seven feet at the most. Now, what kind of brains have we got? We can't even size them up? Well, we couldn't run them over with a tape measure, could we? 
The shock and surprise of seeing them seems to have upset our judgment. But if we can all differ so much about their size, how clear are we about what they look like? Well, in spite of what Dr. Mitch said about his nibs having a monkey face, <laughs> he didn't look like a monkey to me when he showed himself on the screen. What did he look like to you, then? Well, he had a face more like one of them fruit-eating bats that you get in India. I don't think you'd have said that if you'd have stayed long enough to see him. Why not? Well, because on the screen he appeared in black and white. When we saw him in that sphere, we saw him in full color. And his face was bright blue and purply red, just like a mandrel. Well, he looked like a bat to me. And what about this armadillo business? Well, it was his skin that reminded me of an armadillo. It was more like a bony armor. Just his skin? He wasn't shaped like one? How could he be? He stood up on two legs and had long arms. But he looked more like an animal than a man. Yes. Uh, that's the trouble with us human beings. We think any other form of civilization anywhere in the universe must be produced by creatures like ourselves. We won't grant it could be different. Well, how different could it be? Well, very different. Man's pattern of civilization could be only one of many variants. Well, I don't see how. Well, just consider man's history. First, he's little more than an animal, like those forest creatures. But even so, I wouldn't mind betting that if you could look thoroughly into their way of life, it would consist principally of two things. What? Well, a, a practical approach to the necessities of living, like the manufacture of tools and weapons. Isn't the other? The desire to express themselves in some way. An artistic streak. Artistic? What, them gorillas? I bet that even now, back there on the earth some 20,000 years ago, there's at least one man in every family who spends a good deal of his time carving or, or drawing the world he sees about him. Or if he doesn't do that, he's busy wasting his time banging a hollow log with a couple of bones for drumsticks. And he's probably better at that than he is at planning his tomorrow. You mean that man is essentially an artistic creature? He always has been. He'll paint, draw, sing and dance because he can't help it. He'll build a house or make a spear because he has to, or die. Oh, I can't accept that yet. Can't you, Mitch? Look, how long has man been a scientific creature? Five hundred years at the most. 500 years out of something like 120,000. But no matter how far back you go, you'll always find some kind of artistic trend. But look, what about the ancient civilizations? They couldn't have grown without some kind of scientific application. A very sketchy, elementary kind, I grant you. But the same people who built the pyramids of Egypt made a far better job of making gold ornaments and carving statues. Hundreds of years before they even attempted to build a pyramid. But, Jet, man's scientific trend is always evident right throughout his history. Yes, but lagging way behind his artistic trend. Oh, well, I don't see the point of all this. What are you getting at? Just this. Supposing man, instead of developing his artistic trend first, had developed his scientific one. Yeah. Supposing all the scientific knowledge man has now had been known to the Greeks or the ancient Egyptians, and that over the centuries since, his store of knowledge had grown proportionately. Well... Well, where would he be today? I hate to think. Well, where would he be? Probably where the time travelers are now, or a long way towards it. Eh? You mean that's how the time travelers have got where they are? By developing along purely scientific lines? Why not? You mean they have no arts, uh, literature, sculpture, music? He'd never heard of music. He didn't even know what it was. Yeah, but that underground city, it was beautiful. What was beautiful about it? Well, the, the flowers, for one thing. That was nature, not the time travellers. They're not responsible for flowers. What, you mean they could have them flowers all grow in there and not appreciate them? All the wonderful bright colours? Who knows if they can even see colour? They may live in a completely grey world, like a dog. All right, all right. But how about the way the city was laid out? Those spheres and the domes above the ground, perfectly symmetrical and beautiful because of it. Yes, to our eyes. But they could mean no more to the time travellers than... Well, uh, a technical efficiency. There is beauty of a kind in a triangle, in a, in a circle, in an ellipse, but none of these things expresses anything. They don't arise from an emotion any more than a mathematical equation does. A plus B equals C. It's an expression of a truth, that's all. Well, then, what about their kindness, their generosity, their willingness to help us? A tree bears its fruit. You eat it and are grateful. If you were a savage, you might thank the tree and give it something in return. But it doesn't mean the tree is kind or generous. It does it because it can't help it. Yeah, I wonder how long the time travellers have been in existence. Yeah, and how long they live. They took for thousands of years, although it was a week. It's probable that a time traveller of 70 is no more than a babe. <sighs> how could they live that long, devoting their time to nothing but science? What do they do for fun, for relaxation? If they have any form of amusement, I saw no sign of it. Maybe we're their idea of fun. <laughs> Maybe they get their relaxation by knocking people like us from one century to another and back again. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't think that would amuse them. I doubt if they've any sense of humour at all. Humour, you call it. I believe they're a practical people. 
I'm sure they wouldn't devote one second of their time to anything that didn't bring about some material benefit or progress. All work and no play. Their work is play. Their play work. Like an ant, dead busy all the time because he can't help it. Well, if what you say is true, Jet, we must appear very backward, primitive people to the time travellers. Oh, I'm sure we do. And yet they were willing to take us with them to Venus. Yeah, I think it was more in self-defence than from any kindness towards us. By venturing out into space, by conquering the moon, man may threaten the voice and his kind again. But he's not on the moon. He said he was going to Venus. If man can get to the moon, he'll get to Venus. Still, I wonder what it would have been like if we had gone with them. Oh, dull. Very dull, I should think. Their world would be orderly, clean, efficient, with no worries, no empty stomachs, no heartache, no emotions. Only a pure scientific efficiency until the end of your days. No, no. Not the life for an inquisitive do-or-die being like man. Well, I wonder if we shall see the time travellers again. When do you mean? Now or in the future? Oh, I mean now, before we reach the moon. Well, I hope so. Otherwise, how shall we know what to do when we get there? Uh, one thing's certain. We can't land. We haven't the fuel. Well, what do we do then? Fly straight past and say hello and so long to the man in the moon as we go by? If we pass close enough and at the right speed, it will be impossible to go past it. The moon's gravitation will pull us into an orbit round it. And what happens then? Unless we do something about it, we keep going round it. Forever. Hey, But don't you think the voice will even call us up uh, to see if we're all right? I doubt it. You know, I could kick myself when I think of all the things I could have asked him and didn't. Well, the most important thing of all we did ask... You know, what was that? To get back to our own time. Yes, but asking for it doesn't mean we've got it. We're still out in space. That There's no sign of the sun or the earth, let alone the moon. And we can still remember where we've been and what's happened to us. Oh, I'm not so sure it did happen. The old thing's already beginning to seem like a dream to me, and a bad dream at that. Yes, Lemmy, we'll probably all wake up soon and find out it was. Yes, that's what I'm scared of. That's why you must get to work on that diary, Doc. Write down everything you can remember before you lose it. Yes, yeah, sure. Meanwhile, Mitch and I will keep Televiewer watch. If the time travellers have done right by us, it shouldn't be long before we sight the solar system on the screen. And we'll have worries enough to keep us occupied then, believe me. <laughs> be it, Mitch? The sun? Our own sun? What else could it be? It's been getting bigger all the time. Yeah, but not big enough for us to see its planets yet, if it has any. Well, the rate we're travelling, it won't be long before we do see them. Supposing we don't slow up. Supposing we do go shooting right past. Well, supposing we haven't arrived back at the right time. Uh, what are you two trying to do? Cheer me up or something? If that is our sun, the earth will be revolving around it. And it'll have cities on it. Towns, ships, houses, men. Not prehistoric men, but men of our own time. Men and women who look like us and, and think like us. Yeah, and down in Australia, there's a radio operator waiting for me to call him up and tell him that Luna has left the moon and is on her way back to Earth. We've already done that. The last message we sent was to tell them we were going to circle the moon. You don't think they could hear us from here, do you? I doubt it, Lemmy. Even if they could, it would take some minutes before you got a reply. Well, I can wait. But suppose I do get them, what do I tell them? That we're outside the solar system altogether? Mm, now, that would be something. Yeah, give them a bit of a shock, wouldn't it? <laughs> give me a bit of a shock if we got a reply. Well, shall I try it, Jeff? Yes, if you like, but huh? I don't think there's the slightest chance of their hearing us from this distance. It'd prove a thing or two if they did. What, in particular? Hello? Well, Hello. that we must have already yes, travelled through know, time, and the memory of what we've been through one. is going to stay with us. Hello. Hello. Come in, please. I'll give them 15 minutes to reply, and if they haven't by then, well... Oh, now, listen... They're here again. It's his nibs. Either him or his ships. Watch the teleview, Mitch. See if we can locate them. Yeah, right. Hello, Luna. No, wait. Where did that come from? From the radio. Let's get over there, quick. Hello? Hello? Luna calling? I know. Where have you been? Eh? We've been waiting for you. It took you a long time to get here. A long time, he says. It must be all of 40 minutes. Where are you? A long way from you. You should have opened up your radio before. I've been trying to call you. Oh. Tell me, have... I don't think you need worry about anything. You mean we've made it? I think so. But we haven't finished with you yet. How do you mean, haven't finished with us? You want to land on the moon, don't you? No, no, we don't. Look, we haven't got enough fuel. We used it nearly all up taking off from the Earth. 
then I will have to arrange things a little differently. Well, how? You had better all get on your couches and strap yourselves in. What are you going to do? Help you get back to your own time. What, you mean we're not there yet? If you were, you wouldn't be out here in space, would you? No, I don't suppose we would. Do as he says. Get on your bunks. Right, okay. Hey, Doc. Yeah? Did you hear that? Uh, most of it. I've been trying to take it down. Well, you better stop now. Things are about to happen. Right. And let me know when you're all strapped in. I'm fixed. Yeah, me too. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. We'll be all set in just a few moments. Very well. This is the last time you will hear from me. Why? Where are you going? To Venus. To my new home. Oh, well, we'll look you up in about ten years from now, then. That we shall see. I hope our meeting has been of benefit to you. It has, very much. Remember, our ships will always be watching you. Eh? Are you all strapped in now? Yes. Say, say, wait a minute before you go. Look, there's something I want to ask. Hello? Hello? Blimey, what's going on? What's happening? Lie flat, everybody. Oh, lie flat. Don't move. Oh, truth. Oh, hang on. Oh. Hold tight. <laughs> Well, don't look any different from the other side, does it? Craters, mountains, plains, just the same. I didn't expect it to be all that different. Hey, Jet! Jet, come over here, look at this! What? Look, directly below us now. It's the biggest crater I've ever seen. About twice the size of Copernicus. Yes, I can see it. But it's crammed full of little craters. Tiny ones in regular lines. Yes. There's a tendency for craters on the Earth side to form lines of a sort. Here, Jet, you know something? I... No, Lemmy, what? I've got that weird feeling that I've done all this before. Strange you should say that, Lemmy. So have I. A very strong feeling. Yeah, well, I haven't. No man on Earth, alive or dead, has ever seen the other side of the moon. You couldn't possibly have done it before. Keep working that camera, Doc. Get as many pictures as you can. You bet. They're going to get the surprise of their lives back home when we tell them about this. Well, nearly completed the circuit now. Soon our nose will be pointing to Earth again. You better stand by to cut in the motor. Right, yeah, right. By. And let me know when you're all set. Okay, Jet. Okay. Okay. Cut the stern teleview, Lemmy. Switch right. on forward view. Teleview up. Forward view. On. There she is. The Earth. Directly ahead. You said that, Mitch, as though you hadn't seen it in years. I feel like I haven't. But you saw it not 50 minutes ago, just before we took off from the moon. Position, Lemmy? Coming at the center. Five degrees. Doc. Stabilizer. Stabilizer. Four degrees. Mitch, motor. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, what's the matter? It's the fuel. That there's hardly any left. What? But you said there was plenty. Oodles of it, you said. Well, there's not now. Look, something's wrong. We, we've lost it somewhere. Three degrees. We must have used up much more than you thought. We couldn't have done. Not on a moon takeoff. We shouldn't have used half of it. Two degrees. Have we got enough to set us on course for Earth? Yeah, just about. No more. Well, stand by to switch in motor. Standing by. One degree. Contact! Speed, 3,300, 350, 360, 300, course correct. Cut the stabilizer, Doc. Stabilizer cut. Well, that's that. On course, correct velocity, and we're heading for home. Call up base and let me know when you get them. Right. You better check the fuel gauges, Mitch. Make sure the fault isn't with them. You're too right, I will. Not an hour ago, when we took off from the moon, they registered half full. 
Now they're all but empty. Well, you better check them carefully. We may need a burst or two from the motor when we land on Earth. Yeah, right. Hello, Luna calling. Calling Wonga Walla, Australia. Come in, please. Hello, Luna. Wonga Walla, Australia calling. I've got him, Jet. Oh, thanks, Lemmy. Hello, Earth. Jet Morgan calling. Hearing you loud and clear. We've completed our circuit round the moon. Have taken numerous photographs and are now heading back to Earth. Velocity is 5,500, and you can expect us to be within landing distance in four and a half days from now. Thank you, Luna. What did the other side of the moon look like? Much the same as this side. Except there's a crater there, a large crater, much bigger than anything you can see on this side. It's colossal. That all? No green-eyed monsters or anything? <laughs> no, no green-eyed monsters. Uh, look, we may have to make our routine check now. And we'll all be pretty busy for a bit. We'll call you again in two hours. Right. And while you're coasting back to Earth, you'd better get all the sleep you can. What for? You're certainly going to get a big reception when you get here. I think...